Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill, 1909. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To see more titles or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Middledorf. O oh, dust, have faith according to the term of this life's lease. Ere the corrupting worm have power to destroy the dust thou art, Ere the dark rust of death can clog the engine of thy heart, Great is thine honor, though thou walk in night, For fringes of thy darkness feel the light Which was ordained to be when God the just, From shadow shaping thee, put trust in dust. Poem by Lawrence Hausman Chapter 1 the dangers of curiosity. O oh, loveless, hateless, past the sense of kindly eyed benevolence, to what tune danceth this immense? Hardy, the dynasts. I choose for the first act of my comedy the spectacle of a complete freedom, cruelly mated with an unquenchable curiosity. Such a liberty, clearly impossible to those who are fettered by the illusions of sense, is no natural prerogative even of the intangible and spiritual populations, constrained by the unceasing pull and push of that love which moves the worlds. These are drawn forward to the joys of a selfless adoration, or downward to the weary miseries of individual self-fulfillment those eternally opposing attitudes which an old-fashioned and clear-sighted theology has crudely classified as heaven and hell. This is the story of a being, a thing, a spirit, if you will, who loved nothing and therefore was free. It wished to serve neither its own interests nor those of the supernal light, and had no aim, only an aching inquisitiveness now the itch to know, coupled with the inability to care, produces there as here that restless and unsociable disposition which we classify as the result of an imperfect and egotistical education. There as here, it of course frustrates itself, since those who do not love can never understand. Hence this thing which was free was also ignorant and very wretched. The essence of its wretchedness was that because it, its ignorance and curiosity, had never been born, they could never die. They existed in the unchanging idea, without hope of release. Fortunately, it did not know this, for a spirit is as unable to conceive ending as man to conceive endlessness. This something, then, was alive and utterly alone, with a loneliness that is only possible to the disinterested and discarnate. There was nothing for it to do, since it could neither create, combine, nor destroy. It could think, but possessed no medium of self-expression, no apparatus by which it could be linked up with other lives, for it did not love, and being immaterial, lacked the senses, those oblique and clumsy substitutes for love, by which men reach out toward each other's souls. It came storming through eternity, through the crystalline spaces of that which is spaceless, and down the immeasurable periods of that which transcends time. It was isolated, energetic, and desirous of adventure, hungry, restless, and alert, a very vagrant of the invisible, Avid of all knowledge, it perceived with a certain enjoyment the general movement and direction of things. The mighty figures of that dance of angels at which philosophy has tried to peep. But in the midst of the great pageant which the uncreated has dreamed for his own delight, it suffered a crescent and incessant irritation because of its own lack of understanding. The figures of the dance might be comprehensible, but the steps defied analysis. This uninstructed and therefore sceptical observer was angrily aware of certain complicated knots, turbulent manifestations of being, which rudely disturbed the symmetry of the whole. These he could not explain to himself, for they were ugly, disorderly, irrelevant, because 
they were inexplicable because he held them to be infringements of the plan they attracted whilst they disgusted him he wondered and watched forgot himself in the occupation a dangerous business for egotists of every grade hence there was born a moment in which he saw the many worlds and planes of being which from the standpoint of eternity are perceived under an aspect of great and serene simplicity interpenetrating one another and the world of matter turbulent and many-tinted crossing them all deep in this world of matter he identified that lawless and inconsistent element which had disturbed his first placid classification of things it was the faint distressful cry of life which came in a wailing cadence from that writhing tossing corner of the dream and broke the profound silence of reality within this disagreeable and meaningless maze of noise chaos corruption he presently perceived the earth as a peculiarly hideous and unresting tangle an irreducible blot upon that perfect process of evolving will whose shadow is the universe he saw it teeming with horrible little organisms which devoured one another in their ceaseless effort to preserve a visible and independent life but in spite of all their care and cruelty broke down after a few moments of meaningless activity and were dissolved into the dust from which they had come the sight was at once fascinating and revolting he wondered incessantly and with a growing irritation why being should manifest itself like that hence the image of the earth expanded until it filled his horizon in a fashion that he knew to be absurd his consciousness was concentrated upon it and the great and free vision slipped away from him as happens to us when we turn from the largeness of landscape to contemplate the inexplicable civilization of the hive thus this stupendous victim of petty curiosity growthless sexless eternal brooded over that absurd paradox of creation a temporal world founded upon the considerations supported by the illusions of matter growth and sex he heard the thud and surge of life which echoed through it and gazing into its heart saw the countless souls that clustered upon its surface each locked inexorably within the transparent walls of the flesh these he could understand for they too were spirits sexless and solitary things being as yet impervious to the false suggestions of appearance he was peculiarly susceptible to the currents which swayed them circulating in and about the visible world the subtle movements of expansion and contraction the loves and hates of the entangled souls he felt the curious withdrawal like the ebbing of a strong tide with which many drew back from life refused it as if dreading the impact of their waves of being against its shattering cliffs he felt the deadening stagnation of those others unconscious of life who drifted through it inert here and there he felt the pull of a vortex of power amongst these negative forces the eager vitality of those true lovers of life who accepted it rejoiced in it making a whirlpool in the spiritual sea crossing all these there was still another influence by which he was bewildered and abashed out of the turmoil dragged or distilled from it as it seemed by the very conflict of the idea with the horrible enigma of material things there was poured forth a strange ecstasy a vivid and penetrating love which pierced its way to the very heart of that divine reality whose calm as he had ignorantly thought was disturbed by the fretfulness of the world which lay upon its breast this love passed easily by the status of those spiritual orders to which he belonged and merged itself in that end of being for which all creation hungers eternally that such splendor and such fragrance should come from this loathsome and complicated dance of beauty and ugliness growth and decay was an exasperating paradox an indication of essential lawlessness which he watched with disapproval yet with a growing fascination he could not understand it 
could not leave it alone. It excited him, as life excites the virgin who watches it with amazement and distrust. But presently the nemesis of the specialist overtook him. The transparent cell walls thickened beneath his curious gaze and hid the dwellers within. The illusion of solidarity surged mist-like across the landscape, dimming his sight. He had drawn too near and could no longer see the life in its depths. That life was surely there, and the adorable idea behind it, but looking sedulously at the disconcerting appearance, its ineptitude, its cruelty, its unrest, he lost that consciousness of the idea which is the prerogative of the spiritual life. He was caught in the chains of his own inquisitiveness, and, weighted by those chains, sank from plane to plane of perception, ever narrowing the field of vision as he fell. The desire to know, that mortal enemy of the power to be, had forced him to accept the illusions that he despised. He was slowly and inevitably pressed into their deeps, concentrated in spite of himself on one point in the turmoil where, as it seemed, a tiny and individual fight was going on. There was a little furry thing that lived and an agonized spirit which looked out at him through two green windows, solitary in the midst of all the other life, and greatly frightened. Something in the furry bag which held the spirit hurt dreadfully. He wondered what it could be and why the prisoner within should mind so much. Whilst he was still absorbed in his own curiosity and the strangeness of this experience, there was a struggle and a tremor that passed over the bag of fur, and then a faint cry. The light left the green windows, a small matter in itself, but bringing to this immortal watcher the appalling knowledge of things that could come to an end. What a loathsome dream I am looking at, he said, and very naturally he determined forthwith to cease this foolish looking at a nasty and unprofitable world. He turned toward the great spaces, the empty and majestic real, but the reel had withdrawn beyond his range. Then horror fell on him, and with it an utter helplessness, for he perceived that he could not leave off looking at the dream, because he was no longer looking, he was there. A cry came from him, a very bitter cry of wrath and fear. Ah, oh, what has happened? I am caught! I cannot get away! He had seen death and suddenly felt on him the weight of the strange and dreadful fetters of mortality. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of The Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill How Something Came From Somewhere This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf Une pratique même superstitieuse, même insensée, est efficace parce que c'est une réalisation de la volonté. Eliphas Levi, Rituel de la Haute Magique Any practice, even if it is superstitious, even if it makes no sense, can be effective just because it is an expression of the will. Within the bookshop, a dusty darkness was made noticeable by the existence of one low-lying patch of light. At 10 p.m. business hours were long over, and the place revenged itself upon intrusion by the uncanny air of peopled solitude, the suggestion that all trespassers will be prosecuted, with circumstances of occult terror, which lurks in empty houses, deep forests, and solitary shrines. Commerce was cast out, and seven other devils took her place. A woman stood within the patch of light, and also within a small circle which she had traced with charcoal upon the imperfectly scrubbed floor. She seemed a healthy and a solid woman, body and brain well balanced, soul asleep. She was studying a stained and coarsely printed duodecimo which lay upon the desk beside her. It was a rare old English translation of the Grand Grimoire, which, having recently been rebacked with new brown Morocco, 
by strenuous and unsympathetic hands, was now kept open with difficulty by a heavy stamp moistener and two bulldog letter clips. The light was produced by two candles of that brownish-yellow wax which Catholics always burn about the beers of their dead. Since the agents of death and birth are always one, it is hardly strange that these should be the lights assigned by antique tradition to help the incoming of another life. The candles stood upon the floor. With the spot on which the woman was, they marked the point of a triangle which had been carefully drawn within the charcoal ring. Hence they at once proclaimed themselves as instruments of ceremony, not of illumination. Belonging rather to the saucer full of incense, the little pan of charcoal that stood on the gas stove, than to the daily apparatus of ledger, order book, and publisher's catalogues which crowded the neighboring desk. A small mirror hung high up between the bookshelves. It was tilted forward, giving an excellent view of the floor. The flames of the candle were reflected in it, two shining points exhibiting with a horrible thoroughness the vast and lonely dusk in which they shone. Thus seen, winking and glittering out of the grayness, they seemed intimately, unpleasantly alive. And Constance Tyrell, in spite of a sound classical education and much inherited and carefully fostered common sense, felt them to be watchful personalities, companions full of eerie suggestion, poisoning her essential solitude by their hint of terrible companionship. She began instinctively to calculate the shortest possible time in which her present business could be accomplished. Then, detecting in this operation the first symptom of oncoming panic, she deliberately looked away from the mirror and again forced her attention to the grimoire and to the grotesque and varied objects which were ranged upon her desk ready for use. There was a piece of cardboard on which the pentagram, the tetragrammaton, and the caduceus had been traced by colored inks according to the recipe of Eliphas Lévy. Symbols in outline are seldom impressive, and I am afraid that this talisman had failed to affect her imagination as it should. She hung it upon her breast with a piece of string, and, noting the effect, wondered whether this were or were not the ancestor of her scapular. There was also a forked hazel twig, its tips covered with little thimbles of steel, the magician's wand. She took it in her hand, and, staying always within the circle, reached out for the pan of charcoal and placed it on the ground before her. The childishness of these proceedings would have amused her had it not been for the intense silence, the loneliness of the bookshop, its dim uncertain corners, and the horrible impression of looking out into infinite and cruel darkness, only possible to those who stand in a restricted patch of light which she received when she raised her eyes from the ground. This darkness was made the more hateful by its very incompleteness by the radiant mirror which swam out from it, if reflecting the two candle flames like the glowing eyes of some vigilant animal eternally imprisoned in its depths. Now and then she heard footsteps in the street, the rattle and the hoot of a motor, the barking of dogs. These noises reminded her that she was shut in with another world, another century, where she could claim no aid but that afforded by her own curiosity and courage. She took a little incense from her saucer and threw it on the charcoal. The perfumed smoke ascended in a thick white cloud, veiling the disconcerting mirror in the surrounding bookshelves, inappropriately filled with county histories, educational works, and cheap reprints. It placed itself between Constance and these objects of her daily toil, shut her more closely within her undertaking. She was in the midst of it now. This visible sign of transcendental ambitions assured her of that. Its scent in her nostrils assured her, too, of the solemnities of the undertaking. It lapped her into the atmosphere of ceremony, opened vistas of dream. She turned with a new confidence to the grimoire, and began to read aloud the ritual of conjuration. It was her first attempt to force the lock of that door, which has no key. Ego constantia conjuro te per deum vivum, per deum virum 
per Deum Sanctum et Regnignatum. She said it bravely, yet in the very act of reading her judgment sat aloof. It refused to capitulate before the fragrance, the darkness, the amazing phrases. It reminded her that the thing was silly, whilst her imagination murmured that the words were, at any rate, stupendous. She read them, this long, elaborate spell, in the high-pitched, shaky, and shame-stricken voice of one who rehearses some pretentious piece of rhetoric alone and dreads the mortification of being overheard. Also, to speak clearly, seemed almost an acknowledgment that there was, after all, something present to which she could speak. It was an act which peopled the dusky corners of the shop with terrible presences. She shivered a little, and forgot to attribute her discomfort to self-suggestion or overstimulated nerves. She kept her eye fixed upon the grimoire, lest they should meet in the mirror the reflection of some life other than her own. With each fresh phrase of the strange chant, the majestic appeal to the invisible peoples, intangible powers, the suspicion that this life awaited the opening of her eyes, increased. Te ex orciso et nunc et sine mora apareas mihi juxta circulum pulcra et honesta anime et corporis forma. She paused. She wondered whether she really desired this terrific result, conceived its possibility. The smoke had cleared a little, and she could detect the opposite side of the shop and the glint of some unpleasant scarlet bindings, standard English novels and half rowan with decked edge. Everything was very quiet. Her nervousness had passed away. Nothing happened. Constance discovered herself to be disappointed. She believed nothing, and was therefore the more ready to believe anything, having all the transcendental curiosity of the true materialist. Her present undertaking was either perilous or absurd. She was not disposed to take either of these risks for nothing. Her fighting instincts were aroused. If success were possible, she would not forego it. Hence the last clause of the incantation came from her lips with an imperious ring which was appropriate enough to that superb procession of divine names by which the student of magic really compels himself to exultation whilst he purports to be compelling the spirits of the air. Per nomina maxima dei deorum dominus dominatium Adonai tetragrammaton Jehova O Teos Atanatos, Iskiros Hagios Pentagrammaton Shade, O Teos Atanatos, Tectogrammaton Adonai, Iskiros Atanatos Shadai, Kados Eloi Hagios, O Teos Atanatos, Adonai, Adonai, Adonai. The final phrases echoed through the empty shop in a wild and appealing cry which she hardly recognized as her own, thus recited fresh from the book by one who knew nothing of its cipher, the necessity of discovering the truly secret words beneath their concealing signs. It would have sounded absurd enough in the ears of a professional occultist, but on this woman's lips it was at once a prayer and a command. She perceived for the first time why it was that these eccentric substantives were known as words of power. Their curious rhythms rose, as it were, to waves, inexorable waves of sound, which battered the cliff of uncreated things. As she ceased, she realized that she was intensely fatigued, the overpowering fatigue of a person who has worked beyond her strength and feels every limb to be invaded by the languors of her brain. It seemed to her, too, that the shop had become very cold. Evidently a gusty wind had arisen outside and found its way under the ill-fitting door, for the two candle flames flickered suddenly, as if blown sharply toward her, then righted themselves and burned steadily again. Nothing happened. At the end of the evocation, said the grimoire, if the spirit which is conjured by the magus still fails to appear, the operator will place the steel tips of his wand 
upon the burning brazier and make the last and most violent assault upon the unseen world, the mighty and primitive spell called the clavicle of Solomon. And be ye not afraid, adds the rubric, though ye shall hear the loud cries and groans of the spirits who are now being forced to appear within the circle of the earth. Constance had read these directions and this warning with some amusement during her furtive studies of the occult. Upon a sunny afternoon in early spring, in the interval of serving a lady addicted to the literature of the higher health and a curate who wished to read Pierre Louis for reasons unconnected with French prose, she had found its careful encouragements quaint and delightful. Now, oddly enough, she turned at once, though with a certain tremulousness, to look for the page upon which the strange syllables of the clavicle were drawn within their encompassing sign. She did it naturally and inevitably, as if it were now impossible to abandon this adventure whilst any path remained untried. But as she searched by the feeble light of her candles, the tightly bound leaves of the little book escaped from fingers which were no longer very steady in their grasp. It shut itself with a snap, and she caught sight between two fly-leaves of a tiny slip of paper so thin that a breath was needed to disengage it from the page on which it lay. There were on it a few lines of faded writing and many curious signs. In her rather hasty collation of the grimoire, she had not seen this paper. Now, because she was eager and somewhat disheartened by her non-success, wide-eyed toward all chances of adventure, she took it from its place, held it to the light, and deciphered with difficulty the opening words. Lo, my beloved son and very dear disciple, I bequeath to thee this grimoire, the companion of my labors, wherein are faithfully set forth the true rituals of magic, together with all things needful for the prosecution of that most divine experiment on which thou art set, to wit, the word, the sign, and the way. Guard well that secret knowledge, remembering the four oaths of thy initiation. To dare, to will, to learn, and to conceal. But as to this book, have no fear lest the profane and those unlearned in philosophy discover aught therein, since, even as the ark within the temple, all truth here dwells behind a veil, which veil the priests of the hidden wisdom alone may pass. Here follow the three lines of cabalistic figures which Constance could not read. At the side there was a gloss in tiny writing, Nota. Take heed that thou dost not forget to sing rightly, and according to the manner of the adepts, these most powerful and all-holy names of God, and the great key of Solomon, our master, for it is very certain that upon the due observance of this matter the whole virtue of thine evocation doth depend. She replaced the paper in the grimoire, feeling herself to be little enlightened, for she had no knowledge of that right singing of the adepts, which it held essential to the work. However, she turned to the clavicle and laid the metal tips of her wand upon the brazier carefully and efficiently, as if she were busied over some intricate operation of cookery. As accurate in her ritual actions as any priest before the altar of his god, she glanced at the mirror and saw reflected in it her own face. The candles lit it from below, casting peculiar shadows upon the eye sockets and chin. It seemed a stranger's face, white, peering, curious, and amazed. The contours which gave it its workaday expression of responsibility and common sense had disappeared. She began to read, and now to her amazement a third and almost horrible change came over her voice. It was no longer the shame-faced muttering thing of a person who suspects her own absurdity, had no more the sharp pitch of overstrung but undefeated nerves. Constance now was impelled to chant in a loud tone and with a grave intense and crescent determination the strange old Hebrew spell. The words drew from her, she knew not for what reason, a long and rhythmic cry, a wailing music with curious ululative prolongations of the vowel sounds. It came from some obscure corner of her spirit which thus found for the first time a language suited to its needs. 
she has ceased to be self-conscious and was far away from the bookshop her whole will pressing against the barriers of an experience which as she had gradually and automatically come to believe was close to her hand and as the walls of jericho fell before the persistent trumpets so under the assault of her cry this barrier seemed to tremble therefore appear lest i continue to torment thee with the words of power of that great solomon thy master the stream of strange and twisted syllables the unearthly wailing song the rhythms which made no appeal to the ear of sense rose and lifted her with them then gathered the whole strength of her spirit for the supreme statement of exalted and illuminated will messias soter emmanuel sabaot adonai teodoro et invorco her eyes were upon the mirror as she ended and still it reflected her own strained face but no other there was no other hand laid on her shoulder no veiled form but there was surely something in the mirror which she had not seen before she saw a tiny disturbance on the ground close beyond the edge of the charcoal ring as if the draught that blew beneath the door had disturbed a little pile of dust it rose in the air a little way and hung there like a cloud the thing was natural enough for there is always plenty of dust in a bookshop nevertheless a small movement in the dusk had jogged constance's weary nerves she watched it fascinated longing all the while to look away and as she watched a fresh wave of overmastering fatigue came over her and with it of course a sudden gust of fear she knew that in the impossible event of a spiritual manifestation she had but to conquer her will to lay her hand upon the pentagram and command the presence to obey not to intimidate its conjurer but it takes great confidence in the unseen to attribute to supernatural causes a phenomenon which may well have been produced by a draughty door she stared and struggled with a rising pulse and feelings of great discomfort in her throat meanwhile the little column of dust rose with a curious spiral motion as if it were impelled from within it hung in the air a gray faint cobwebby thing and then she heard the crying of a sad and frightened voice which said ah what has happened i am caught i cannot get away and again an inarticulate cry that came in a rising cadence of anguish and dread she exclaimed my god what is it what what have i done the sound of her own voice harsh and uncertain convinced her that the other voice had not been heard by the outward ear she turned from the mirror and looked with horror at the floor the column of dust had disappeared the candles burned clearly in the dusk then she remembered that she was quite alone that there was nothing more to do nothing that she could do it was late and she longed to be away she went to the back of the shop and switched on the electric light it seemed an almost impious proceeding after all that had passed but the nice commonplace click and the immediate radiance comforted her she extinguished her ceremonial candles packed away wand pentagram and incense in her little leather bag and carefully rubbed the circle from the floor the physical exercise restored her to a sense of her own largeness healthiness solidity she forgot the imaginary voice and remembered the real world she left the bookshop locking the door behind her she held the keys for mr lambton was of a slothful disposition and left his manager as many responsibilities as he could she was glad to be out in the air again and looked forward to a brisk walk through lighted streets at this moment the mud and motor omnibuses the drizzling rain that fell were familiar and delightful things freckles on the beloved face of life there was a dead kitten in the gutter a little bag of fur she stepped back when she saw it and crossed the road lower down she was not a squeamish woman but this was hardly the moment for dead things it was evidently true as eliphas levy had said and modern occultists agreed that magical operations did have some curious effects upon the mind she could not recover her normal poise 
things wore an unusual air, and she was an alien amongst them. She decided that she would go to bed early. She was not in the mood for sitting alone that night. She had yet to realize that she would never be alone any more. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter 3 Furnished Lodgings. Now I know that the walls of sense that seemed so impenetrable, that seemed to loom up above the heavens, and to be founded below the depths, and to shut us in for evermore or no such everlasting impassable barriers as we fancied, but thinnest and most airy veils that melt away before the seeker, and dissolve as the early mist of the morning about the brooks. Arthur Machen, The House of Souls In common with the many persons who have some imagination but small taste for metaphysics, Constance had conceived of the invisible world as situated somehow in the air, crisply defined within its own frontiers, and amenable to the usual classifications of geography. Its inhabitants were as safely bestowed as the inhabitants of the zoo. They were behind strong bars of natural phenomena, and could not get out. The spirit world of the old and the astral plane of the new occultists each suggested to her separate cages into which the curious might sometimes look. This woman had the mania of adventure and few opportunities of gratifying her taste. For years she had moved within the dull boundaries of a wage earner's existence, which she abhorred but could not overpass. Once she had explored the deeps of life, now heights and deeps alike seemed shut from her. She longed for a new landscape, experience, danger. Hence her sudden excursion into life's uncharted outskirts, those building estates which the spirit of man has not yet decided to develop. Though she was, in her own opinion, wholly free from superstition, she had thought it possible that by deliberate recourse to the self-hypnotizing ceremonial of the old magicians, she might at any rate peep into the strange wild district beyond the barriers of sense. For much that is obviously absurd when ascribed to the agency of unforeseen forces becomes acceptable to the educated mind if interpreted in terms of psychology, explaining the human soul with that precision which is so sadly lacking in the Pentateuch this science had taught Constance that the release of her subliminal powers was all that was necessary if she wished to perceive the unknown but strictly natural world beyond the threshold as an interesting extension of the known. If you see in your incantation a method of shifting the field of consciousness and call your magic wand an autoscope, these things no longer seem silly, but take their place as part of the cosmic plan. A careful study of the work of Professor James had further convinced her that some forms of credulity are still compatible with self-respect. But the result of her temporary will to believe, and of the experiment which it had prompted, was, as she now felt, profoundly unsatisfactory. She was left in complete doubt as to whether or no the invocation had worked, and the sceptical state, so convenient when its object is the dogma of a too strenuous religion, is very uncomfortable when applied to an individual ghost. If her conjuration had indeed released supernatural powers, if it were true that something had happened, the inner eye had been opened upon a hidden plane of being, then she had seen what? An unmeaning and horrible interference with that solid earth and those respectable laws of nature which she preferred to take for granted? A column of dust, that mounted and hung in the air, as if endowed with some incomprehensible life. The thought of it, of the intimate and unnatural thing, was more dreadful than any phantom could have been. It seemed to make all things unsafe. She decided that it could not, must not, be true. Science came to the assistance of its child, 
and helped her to put a proper interpretation on an adventure which refused to square itself with any known theory of the unseen but ranged itself easily amongst the accredited varieties of optical and auditory hallucination to look at it in any other way would have been too horrible to connect the strange and tormented voice which as she assured herself she had not really heard with that vision of the writhing twisting misty yet living thing which rose one knew not how and vanished one knew not where this was to knock the bottom out of all her past experience to acquiesce in the unreality of all real things even of life constance adored life she had clutched it and been stung by it but in spite of this rebuff she remained its lover adoring the wonders which she never tasted passionately credulous of charms which she was not permitted to enjoy the world which she lived unconscious of life as children sit upon the knee of their mother and play indifferently with little toys never pausing to look into her face this normal practical earning and spending world had always seemed strange to her its scales of values unreal and remote she had silently refused to acknowledge that scale of values the importance of demeanour and propriety of buying and selling of food furniture games change of air and of all the little sterile daily acts watching other women in their attitude towards life she was reminded of persons who suddenly confronted by a goddess confine their attention to the fact that she twiddles her thumbs but in spite of brave theories of curiosity boredom and eternal readiness for the adventures which so seldom came she was invaded now by a longing for ordinary trivial homely things the instinctive human fear of the unseen had been awakened by the evening's performance as she walked she looked for a dog who might be persuaded to lick her hand she would have liked to gossip with her landlady or struggle for bargains at a sale a beggar accosted her and she who had so few pennies to spare took out her purse she made a remark about the weather eagerly thirsting for the little contact with humanity which would obliterate the memory of that other contact with something perhaps which was not human at all but the beggar was taciturn he took the money and went away constance's eyes followed him with regret the mood of adventure was over and the reactive had come in the midst of her solitary and uncongenial life which a cultivated scepticism did little to cheer she had wished so much to open a new door to satisfy latent but passionate curiosities add new territory to her domain now that wish had departed leaving behind it the insecure sensation of one who has peeped for a moment through a forbidden door in the ramparts and obtained from this glimpse a permanent memory of great precipices all about her dwelling-place of the black gulf and soundless moat below she dreaded the four walls of her room shutting her in to a tete-a-tete with her own imagination presently she came to those four walls by way of a grained door and three flights of linoleum-covered stairs she fumbled for matches and lighted her duplex lamp it smelt as usual in a refreshingly real way the dingy mantel border maroon cloth with a faded embroidery of old gold chrysanthemums further reassured her but she avoided the mirror and would have liked to cover it up had it not been that she was afraid of despising herself her own contempt was the only humiliation that she could not bear vera's toys lay everywhere constance picked up a doll frock upon which the child had evidently wiped her mouth after eating bread and jam for tea actuality was there ready to encourage and support its worshipper she dropped the frock and went to the window looking out from her empty bright and hideous room which distressed her into the dim and attractive night the soft rain which was hardly more than a determined dampness had given a delicate sheen to the sloping roof next her own and she enjoyed it with that cultivated taste for appearance which is the prerogative of solitary lives her rooms for cheapness sake 
or high up, and the vista was all of slates, parapets, and chimney-pots, delightfully various, full of quaint and unreasonable irregularities, with that character of ruggedness which is peculiar to the tops of things. The moist roof comforted Constance. It gave to her suddenly an image of the whole safe and mighty city, enshrouded in a benevolent mist of rain, all the bright eyes of its million houses peering with the utmost assurance into the dusk, all the vivid streaks of trains and trams running in and under its roads without fear or hesitation. That solid, sharply lit, assertive city was full of living creatures, real ones, it was so compact, so assured, so full of itself, that there could be no room for the invisible populations to creep between its close networks of shops and souls. She heard the jingle of a hansom in the street behind her, the scrape and clatter of the hooves as it drew up, the iron cried, Real, 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 as it struck the ground. Constance knew the sound very well. Once night had fallen, Many hansoms came to the house in the street behind. Sometimes the noise, and all that was implied by it, saddened and disgusted her. Now it echoed the beloved music of the town, and brought her an inexplicable sense of companionship and consolation. For years of intensest loneliness had taught her to extract from human noises, human sights, something of the social warmth for which she longed. She suddenly found that it was quite easy to turn back into the glaring and solitary room. It, too, was part of the sheltering town, a cell, her cell, in the great hive, and therefore as friendly to her, as protective as the streets. There was nothing, nothing real, to differentiate this evening from other evenings. No reason why she should not make her cocoa as usual, read a while and go to bed. She went to the china cupboard and discovered with vexation that her favorite cup had been used for painting water and left unwashed. She turned and glanced round the room, searching for further disagreeable results of Vera's activity. Then she saw near the fireplace a little column of dust that rose and hung in the air. She stared at it with the dull and bewildered stare of a backward child who is given a difficult task. It was far beyond her power of assimilation, but she perceived it to be henceforward a part of her life, added to experience by her own act and desire. Her nature rose then, of its own accord, to meet it, as usually happens when the great things of life break abruptly upon the soul. She was not particularly astonished. She was hardly afraid. She began to walk up and down the room, trying to argue with herself recalling to her remembrance all that she had ever read upon self-suggestion and hallucination. These considerations, however, wore a hopelessly academic air and brought no conviction with them. At intervals her mind returned with a jerk to the actualities of the moment, and she glanced hastily and furtively at the corner of the room. Always the cloud of dust hung in the air. She knew it in her heart to be a sign of life, of something that would communicate with her if it could. She felt it there, as lonely and as curious as herself, but she was not softened by its need. She set her whole will as a barrier against its coming. She was determined to ward off this horrible companionship, which pressed toward her with a certain wistfulness, like some desperate and desolate creature exiled in a foreign town. She felt the assault of its desire, and resisted with all her strength. The room grew cold as she stood there with clenched hands and rigid knees. This time she recognized the symptom as one that was proper to her state. Then the little gray thing wavered and leaned toward her. It was like a sudden sally from an invested citadel. Constance wavered too, and knew the battle to be lost. She screamed! and was not even ashamed of herself. There was an answering scream from the next room. Vera cried out, Tanta, Tanta, w what's the matter? I want you. It's dark and I'm awake. She went to the child. 
herself the more terrified, the more childlife, she too was awake in the dark and accepted with gratitude the comforting presence of a fellow victim. There was a feeble gas jet in the passage, and by its light Vera's small dark face, convulsed with fear, was discernible as a shadowy patch amongst the tossed bedclothes. Constance gathered the little warm body to her own lap. It shook with the terror of an animal which scents panic in its neighborhood. She said with unusual tenderness, "'What's the matter, my little one?' For the spur of fear had touched her human instincts on the quick. Vera cried, "'Oh, I don't know, but it's dark, it's dreadful, and I heard a boogie scream in my alone.' "'There are no boogies, darling. You are dreaming.' As she said it, she wished that it were true. Vera curled herself tightly against the broad, firm shoulder. You hold me tight, and then they won't come, she said. Constance, sitting in the darkness on the uncomfortable bedroom chair, with the child's heavy body in her arms, the querulous little voice in her ears, saying, Hold me tight, you mustn't go, you shan't, wished that she might thus sit forever, with the protective influence of the flesh between her and the invading foe. It was a new sensation, for Vera was not an attractive child, and her many claims upon attention had never included a sentimental appeal. She seemed to present no promise of a future womanhood, but rather, in some elusive way, a condensed history of those animal natures through which her spirit had presumably climbed on its way toward life. The squat stature, the heavy limbs, the lowering brow, the wide and formless mouth were adapted to be the agents of instinct rather than of character, and instinct, elemental appetites, and uncontrolled passions had already sealed them. But at this moment Constance forgot those things. She looked at the clumsy little body with a new eagerness, a new possessive sense. She cuddled it against her bosom, concentrated on its helplessness, its happy ignorance, its warmth. By her own act, her own arrogant curiosity, strangeness and terror had been admitted to her universe. They must not be permitted to infect this scrap of life which was in her keeping. She perceived that she must endure them alone, must never entertain company in that dreadful room of windows which looked out upon the timeless, spaceless wilds. Everything, after all, had to be attempted and endured alone once childhood was past. The hive-like city of a myriad cells, which seemed so social and so warm, was really a city of myriad prisons. Each inhabitant, in some unendurable hour when the view from the windows was too clear, the solitude of the four walls too keen, would fling himself, as she had done, upon this door to find that an inexorable hand had turned the key. But in some of the cells, two were shut together, and they protected one another from the impact of solitude and fear, so that the prison straightway became a home. There was no one who would do this for her, no one in all the world to whom she could tell her adventure, to whom she could appeal for the sheltering love, the dear human presence, the foolish comforting platitudes of common sense. She had got to see it out, and when she had seen it out, no one would know, no one would blame her curiosity or admire her courage. This fact added to the old monotonous loneliness in which she had lived so long a new and bitter sense of isolation. Vera was quickly comforted. Soon she fell asleep. Constance put her into bed very gently left a lighted candle and a chocolate cream by her side, and returned to the sitting-room. As she entered, she glanced quickly toward the corner. But the column of dust was not there. She was reassured, and shut the door softly. Then she perceived that there was a figure sitting by the fireplace. It was perhaps less a figure than a form, an impressionist sketch of humanity, without detail and without sex. That unnerved her, and she shrank with beating heart against the closed door, hid her face with her hands, and stayed in that comforting and self-imposed darkness for a period which seemed to have no relation to ordinary intervals of time. 
At last she heard within her mind the sad and wailing voice which had first attacked her in the bookshop, but it had lost its original accent of fear and grief. It said, If they are all cowards, what am I to do, and how shall I ever understand? Because she could not endure the taunt of cowardice, even from a voice which she suspected was her own, she raised her head and looked again. Then she saw two brilliant, wild, and hungry eyes which gazed into hers from the recesses of some alien life that had caught them in its folds. She said, Ah, uh, what are you? What have I done? And again the silent voice replied, You know. She exclaimed, No, I, I do not understand. It seemed to her that it was a sad and lost thing which had answered her with difficulty and picking its way, as it were, amongst the strange periods of a foreign tongue, it said, Nor do I, but I think that you have got to see me as a shape, as something which has a limiting edge, because otherwise you will not let me enter your experience. You are dreaming so deeply that you cannot recognize spirit unless it enters into the unreasonable illusions of your dream so I must attack your consciousness on its ordinary, earthly plane, because I will get in, I will know, I have got to understand. She cried out suddenly, Oh, it, it isn't real, it can't be real. The voice said, No. A picture built of your dream stuff, that is all. But do not be deceived, all pictures represent realities. I am here within the appearance, as you are there within your clothes. What does the shape matter? It is only a little dust. But there was no one sitting by the fire, she exclaimed in her astonishment. I, I thought I saw... And there was again a voice that replied, And you think you know, and you think you feel. What strange and meaningless dreams... Then the last scrap of courage deserted her, and she seized the lamp and fled ingloriously from the room. But she turned at the door and looked swiftly and furtively at the corner of the fireplace from which she fled. It was a coward's glance and met a coward's retribution. There was a little eddy of dust that rose from the floor and hung suspended in the air. Constance undressed hastily and lay wakeful, with Vera held tightly in her arms. End of chapter 3« Les teignons, pour ainsi dire, de sa propre couleur. Et voici que votre point de vue sur l'ensemble des choses vous paraît maintenant avoir changé. » Bergson Little by little he had penetrated a greater number of the psychic elements, regarded them for thus to discern with his own coloration. It was here that your point of view on the entirety of such things seemed now to have changed. Bergson, the imminent gifts of conscience. This one rift in the solid stuff out of which she had built her universe, this hateful and inconsistent thing which her senses reported, left Constance poised solitary in the midst of terrific spaces, all that she called reality had been shattered, and only consciousness remained as a certain fact. She had seen, abruptly, the insecurity of those defenses which protect our illusions and ward off the horrors of truth. She had found a little hole in the wall of appearance, and peeping through had caught a glimpse of that seething pot of spiritual forces whence, now and then, a bubble rises to the surface of things. There were beings there, living and full of horror because devoid of shape. She had opened a door for them, and now they could press in on her, and she, loathing their companionship, could not resist. All her robust and eager enjoyment of life 
fled from her. It was not real any more, only that invisible and intangible eternity behind the shadow show was real, that and its detestable inhabitants. She had one consolation. She felt herself to be unique in so perceiving the true proportion of things. Many teachers she knew had referred to it, but she shared the conviction of all other tasters of supreme experience that no one had seen reality face to face before. It made this poor, visible life seem futile, its discipline absurd, yet she was immersed in that life, and it pressed in on her, forcing itself on her attention in a peculiarly exasperating way. There were mysteries all about her, strange companions, a knowledge of some actual and densely populated world here at hand, penetrating her own body, perhaps, as well as all objects of her thought. Yet Vera's bath must be faced every morning, and the shop that little universe where souls and bodies were but the material for a profitable distribution of the real things, cloth, leather, paper, and ink. This state of things constituted a paradox, which would have been amusing had it not been personal. As he went to business in the morning, automatically dodging the motor omnibuses, staring out of her dream in amazement at the people who surged up in her path, all hurrying, all unreal, she repeated to herself continually, I have got to go on, I have got to go on. She came to the bookshop at the moment in which the last of the shutters ran up with a bang, disclosing a window in which Constance was accustomed to take a certain professional pride. She gave it, as she entered, the scrutinizing glance which a good housewife bestows on the drawing-room curtains as she goes up her garden path. The window was wide and uncrowded, the loving amplitude of a museum, not the tightly packed practicalities of trade. It was never without its MS of the decretals, its Flemish herbals, open at a page at once decorative and decorous. Burton's Arabian Nights, placed discreetly in the background, a cover in tooled Levant from the Dove's bindery, or one or two of the rarer products of the Kelmscott press. Within, topography and scandalous chronicles jostled the ancients very comfortably upon the shelves. There were also a few high-class remainders and several piles of cheap reprints, for Lambton's was one of the many establishments which stand Janus-faced between culture and commerce. One quarter was devoted to current literature, reviewers' copies often uncut and always very cheap. Two tables stood in the wide space between the bookshelves. On one, Mr. John Lampton arranged a permanent exhibition of book lovers' trinkets. Limited editions, pocket classics, neatly boxed marvels of limp lambskin and rough calf, Thomas a Kempis in twenty different dresses, all worldly, The Wisdom of the East in American Spelling, or The Ballad of Reading Jail, clothed with a chaste absurdity in white. The other table, which was smaller, held large, unreadable color books, a few works on Italian painters, and new copies of such novels as Constance felt that cultured and bookish people ought to read. She looked up as she entered at that tightly ribbed row of books on the shelves, little nests of words bewilderingly various. They were gay in the morning light and wide awake, she stared at them as one stares at abnormal shapes, seeing them no longer as concrete things, but as odd agglomerations of line and surface. Little nests of words, ideas, those evanescent, wandering things, caught and tucked up in paper as unruly children are tucked up in bed. To open a book and let the soul of it gush out like perfume, invading, overwhelming the mind, this was a daily miracle, and she the purveyor of such miracles. She had never thought of it before, but at this moment the mystery of it swept her, and with amazement that one should thus sell thoughts for money, since thoughts were real and money was not. How inconceivable an act to communicate the dream which came from the heart of Dante in three volumes limp green leather for six shillings net 
In the face of this and all other paradoxes of her concrete life, she was suddenly infected with an unworldly bewilderment. She looked out with astonished vision on an incredible earth. All things were made new, for it seemed that she had abruptly acquired the innocence of eye which we snatch so easily from our children to give back so tardily and incompletely to our artists, poets, and saints. She took off her hat, assumed her blue linen overall, and sat down at her desk. The mirror was opposite to her. She raised her eyes, saw it, and at once the scene of the past night was recreated for her, the dusk and solitude, all the ceremonial absurdities, the perfumed smoke which was ascended like a white pillar, that other pillar of grey and shivering dust which had arisen from the floor, the urgent and tormented voice that had addressed itself to no earthly ear, fire and all the eternities evoked in a bookshop, in that prison of a myriad cells, the tangible and intangible worlds were swept up together in one heap of confused experience like the surging clouds in a crystal gazer's bowl. But it was the invisible side that seemed homely and possible of comprehension, the visible that was alien and remote. When she questioned herself, she found nothing save the nervous upheaval caused by her late experience to account for this state of things. She was amazed by her own topsy-turvy condition, conscious of it and interested in it, but she seemed to have lost the useful art of taking things for granted. She stared at the strange new world of unmeaning color and shape, and wondered why it should exist at all. Then Mr. John Lambton came through the glass door from his private room, and at once Constance became the normal businesswoman, the useful manager, the prudent and cultivated bibliophile. Mr. John held a catalogue in his hand. He was going to ask her advice, a circumstance much dreaded by Miss Tyrell since it often compelled her to exhibit an intellectual superiority which prudence advised her to keep for the sole use of her customers. It's one thing to bandy Horace with old gentlemen, and another to improve inadvertently upon your employer's Latin pronunciation. Mr. Lambton had engaged Constance because an assistant who knew something about literature had become necessary to his peace of mind. He was one of those unfortunate persons whose short sight and aquiline nose suggest a culture which their conversation cannot endorse. In such a superior class of business as that of Lambton and Sons, this was particularly inconvenient, for Elseviers in the window are held to imply erudition behind the counter. There was scarcely a day in which some customer did not embark upon a conversation which Mr. John was obliged to terminate in a sudden and sometimes tactless way. The thing came to a head on the morning upon which a disgusted liturgiologist found Dugdale's monasticon and Heckel's monism, side by side on the shelf labeled R.C. Theology. Mr. John, stung by his client's contemptuous glance, alarmed by his immediate exit, felt that the services of a well-educated inferior had become no less necessary to commercial prosperity than to personal comfort and self-respect. Miss Tyrell then found herself obliged to maintain a carefully subsidiary position whilst keeping a vigilant eye upon her employer's bibliographical aberrations. She was rather glad to find that on this morning he wished to consult her about nothing more recondite than the Romance of Sir Gawain, the large paper edition of which had just gone into remainder. Mr. John thought that it could be sold very profitably at one and six, and he observed that it was fine, large book for the money, and if cased in velvet calf with ribbon ties would be singularly suitable for presentation. You had better send an order today, he said, or else one of the other big houses will go and buy the lot. When they come, get them bound up and put aside for the Christmas season. They'll fetch half a guinea then. But I think it's only a facsimile of the Burdett manuscript, answered Constance, not at all a book for general circulation. Middle English, very difficult to make out, and a good deal of curious matter in the notes. Mr. John replied, all the better. 
looks cultured, medieval, and so on. People don't want to read the books they give away. Constance wrote out the order in a spirit of disgusted obedience, and then remembered how little such things mattered to one who had attained to the superb generalizations which characterized her present view of life. This view had departed from her at Mr. John's entrance. Now it began to encroach by slow steps upon her orderly and busy mind. She was enfranchised from that carefulness about many bibliographical things which usually obsessed her from nine to seven. But she had only cast off one set of chains to assume another. It was gradually borne in on her that her senses were no longer quite her own. There was a thing which used them, and she participated in that use, but could not control it. She leaned, as it were, over the shoulder of a new inhabitant and peeped out of the window with him. So peeping, she recognized a fellow victim of that impassioned curiosity, that cold lust of knowledge which had urged her to all the adventure of life. It seemed as though she, out of the whole phenomenal world, had attracted her antitype in the world of reality. When she turned inward and asked the persistent presence, why are you here? He, using perforce the language with which his hostess provided him, could only answer, I want to know. All through life that had been her own need. She respected it. Presently a customer, who had been prowling happily in the recesses of the shop, approached with a copy of Balzac's Comte de Rolatique. He had unearthed it from the dark corners where those books which are catalogued curious were usually kept and was turning it over with interest. Seeing a young woman behind the desk, he hesitated, but reflected that shop girls share with nurses a certain immunity from the ordinary decencies of life, and came boldly on. This, he said, seems a very quaint, uncommon sort of book, most amusing, too, but it's, well, distinctly, don't you know? He thought for a moment, came to the conclusion that his French was bound to be better than hers, and added firmly, Lubrique. Constance, hardly readjusted to West London ideals, answered him calmly and vaguely. He writes entirely from the medieval standpoint, puts everything down, of course, just as it really happens without leaving out the usual things, but there's nothing uncommon in it, really. Nothing but life. The costume is different, and the people are quite candid, that's all. Modern married life in the suburbs is just as, she was determined to give him his word again, just as lubrique. The customer looked at her with surprise and with a noticeable joyous anticipation, but her smooth black hair and solid figure did not suggest pleasantries. She added immediately, that copy is twelve and six. It's in very good state and has all the doré illustrations. I can give you another, with the margins rather cut down, for seven shillings, if you like, but it isn't such good value for the money. The customer thanked her and said he would think it over. He left the book lying on the desk, and Constance carefully reinterred it in its dark corner, returned to her ledger, and glanced at the clock. It was half-past twelve, and a quarter to one was the hour of the midday friend. Every prosperous bookshop has its gang of prowlers, who pay their footing by a purchase once in a while, but have their real commercial value for the establishment in the fact that they stimulate the prowling instincts of other passers-by. These may be persons of a nicer conscience than your true adept of the business, and feel that each delicious loiter and surreptitious bout of reading must be paid for, if only from the penny-box. The conscientious prowler, however, tends with the passing months to join the more professional and less lucrative class. It was the distinction of the midday friend that he had moved in the opposite direction, in that slow, unnoticed way which is peculiar to great constitutional changes. His visits had ceased to be an accident and had become an institution. There had been first the involuntary glance at the wide and open entrance as he passed and then the momentary lingering to read a title or so, and then the day on which he had entered the shop in chase of a color book whose vivid charms had forced its into remainder a little before the usual time. He had turned it over, looking with admiration at the blue trees and orange castles, 
and the purple-margined peasants silhouetted against greenish skies. Then he had put it down with a sigh. I'm afraid I must not take it, he said. The truth is, my wife doesn't like these books, and it vexes her to see them lie about. You see, she has made our house very artistic, whitewash and all that. This statement at once aroused sentiments of interest and pity in Constance, delightful and stimulating emotions which her customers seldom provoked. She conceived of this blunt, square, bullet-headed man, wholesomely animal, poised uncomfortably upon sparse and tasteful furniture, his very weight and virility an offence, his broad-toed boots always in the way, the constant society of a wife who condemned all that one thought ingenious and beautiful seemed a more lonely business than her own solitary lodgings, where there was, at any rate, no one to set up irksome and exclusive canons of taste. On his next visit she learned that his name was Andrew, a circumstance mentioned in connection with Scotland, the national thistle and the animals which feed thereon. This form of humour seemed a relief to him. She divined that it was not permitted at home. She had laughed with such evident good humour and enjoyment that he could hardly fail to index her as the sort of woman who understands and appreciates a man. He bought a book. On the next day he returned and bought another, with a pathetic air of trying to make his visits worth her while. In a week they seemed intimate friends. Upon this morning Constance looked forward almost hungrily to Andrew's visit, she turned toward the idea of his solid and unimaginative personality with that instinct for a counter-irritant which causes us to seek out our least appropriate acquaintances in seasons of grief. He did not want to be spiritual. He did not want to think. She saw at this moment much to commend in such a point of view. She loved her body, honored it deliberately as the medium of all great experience. The midday friend took the body seriously, was interested in the clothes which it wore, the games that were good for it, the things that one gave it to eat. His own body was excellently groomed, warm, efficient, and compact. He would have been shocked and puzzled by the suggestion that it really had something in common with a column of dust. For outside the pages of the burial service such metaphors were clearly morbid and absurd. He came. His, "'Morning, Miss Tyrell. Hope you're well. Beastly weather we're having.' At once satisfied her craving for honest ordinariness, but, to her surprise, he did not fidget in the usual way, flick the pages of the second-hand novels, or otherwise try to find a reason for his presence. He walked without hesitation towards the bookshelves, and she found herself following him in the subdued but attentive attitude of the expert saleswoman, for once, it appeared, there was a definite object in his visit. "'It's my wife's birthday,' he said. "'Forgot all about it till I'd left the house this morning. Rather awkward. I must take something home. She's a curious woman, you know, childish in a way as many are, although clever, doesn't like these little things passed by. Seems to me I may as well give her a book as anything else. She reads a good deal. The right sort of thing, of course.' It occurred to me that you'd be able to find me something she would like. It had better be thoroughly up-to-date or else quite old-fashioned. Anything in between is no good. Constance successively suggested Neolithic pantheism, Southern Siberia, the home of the soul, and the duty of duties, development of self. But he thought that she was sure to have read all of those. He wandered from table to table, picking up books with an uncertain hand. She liked the air of manly helplessness with which he confronted an intellectual choice. Clearly it was important that he should avoid any mistake. "'Women are queer,' he said. "'One doesn't understand them. Not that one wants to, for that matter, but it's more comfortable not to do the wrong thing if one can help it. If they really are women, just that, you can't do the wrong thing, can you?' "'That's it,' said Andrew eagerly. "'That's what one wants him to be, of course, "'but they never are nowadays, at least not in our set. "'Don't seem to understand what men want. "'Oh, very nice to us, do their duty and so on, of course. "'I'm not saying anything, but clever and always worrying about it "'as if 
brains in women were a sort of disease. I, I beg your pardon, beastly of me, I forgot. Really, you let me come chatting to you, and sometimes one's tongue runs on. Constance was aware of something which picked up these utterances, looked at them curiously, and laid them by with a helpless air of non-comprehension. But she resisted its companionship, expelled it, as it were, from the neighborhood of her mind, and concentrated her will upon Andrew and his interests. His robust humanity called out hers to meet it. He found her, on this morning, peculiarly sympathetic, and never suspected that her unusual proximity of spirit was due rather to the repulsive powers of another than to his own attractive force. He was greatly pleased by an expensive copy of Browning's Christmas Eve, printed in illegible Gothic type, with fantastic bloomers and bound in naked millboards held together by linen braid. The binding, he said, is just right for our drawing room. So bare and simple. Couldn't be better. But she wouldn't read it, and I doubt if she'd even let it lie about. You see, Browning, from what I hear, is just a bit gone by in our set, and our old-fashioned books are worse to them than last year's clothes. Quaint, isn't it, the way things come and go? When we were first married, you know, she got quite depressed because I couldn't stick him. And now he goes on the top shelf with Ruskin and George Eliot and Carlyle. He was standing by her desk, and having laid down the blatantly austere Christmas Eve, he picked up a shabby duodecimo and began to flick its leaves gently and indifferently as he talked. It was Grand Grimoire. Now here, he said presently, is a very rummy little thing. I wonder if that would do. I shall be late for lunch if I don't find something soon. What is it? Magic, eh? That's quite a notion. A bit out of the common, I suppose. She's not likely to have seen that one before. Hardly. They are getting very scarce. This is the first copy we have had for years. He gazed vaguely at the queer woodcuts and strange garbled recipes, as precise and unemotional as a cookery book. Queer notions those old chaps had. Look here. To evoke the spirit of an angel, the magic circle being drawn and the altar of incense prepared. God bless my soul, what next? For to catch your angel, eh? Oh, I'll take this. It will just suit Muriel. She's keen on spooks and things, and she hates the point of view of modern science. Not much modern science here. Constance answered, On the contrary, if you know how to read its formulae, this is modern science, and the things that modern science hasn't yet got to. Oh, come, said Andrew, humoring her. Modern science, you know, is practical, experimental, constructive, and so on. Well, so is this. It's just a series of scientific experiments, nothing else, and they are real enough and practical enough for those who know how to perform them. Goodness knows. Other people, of course, will find it about as enlightening as a collection of chemists' prescriptions, and about as dangerous, too, if they go meddling without authority. Yes, but vampires and spells and salamanders, you know, insisted Andrew. They're all here, taking themselves quite seriously. You're not going to tell me these are scientific facts, are you? We mayn't know much, but we are jolly well sure they don't exist. Well, you can't prove a negative. God bless my soul, what next? said Mr. Vince for the second time. Within his own mind, he added, she seemed such a sensible woman, too. He felt puzzled for a moment and slightly disheartened. It was the first time that they had disagreed. Then the word angel suddenly occurred to him and suggested that the queer little book might perhaps have something to do with religion though it seemed on the surface to have more in common with Maskeline and Cook. There were so many new religions now. No doubt Miss Tyrell affected one of them, a circumstance which would explain her peculiar attitude at once. She might even be a Romanist. They believed a lot of various curious things. He became shy and careful, for it was an axiom with him that one should never disturb a woman's religion. They required it, poor creatures. As for Constance, she asked herself with temper, 
what on earth can have made me play the fool and talk to him in that idiotic way for two pins i should have told him the whole affair of course he is disgusted now and thinks i am a superstitious rotter and very likely that is what i am her manner became constrained and businesslike confirming his suspicion that he had somehow shocked her by mistake he paid for the grimoire and retired in a mood of contrition constance wrapped it up in brown paper and tied thin green string about it with a certain relief she still had a vague idea that in the absence of all exciting suggestions it might be possible to banish the humiliating memory of her experiment and of the tiresome hallucinations which it had induced but the protective influence of humanity seemed to have departed with her friend and a puzzled voice which she was learning to recognize murmured in her ear it is all so very funny but what does it mean and once more she looked out on a world which had become strange to her inconceivable grotesque end of chapter four chapter five of the column of dust by evelyn underhill this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter 5. A Domestic Interior How much more dulcet the dulcis amarillidis ira when Amaryllis knows Sophocles and Hegel by heart. Coventry Patmore. Relegio Poete. Andrew Vince entered the drawing-room carefully. The floor was highly polished, and the one small rug which always skated before his advancing feet added to its deceptive qualities. There was a purple sofa near the window, a closed cupboard in one corner. Four large fat cushions were arranged upon the floor. The walls were white. There were no curtains and no pictures. Mrs. Vince, who would have resembled a Dominican nun dressed by liberty, had it not been for the mass of healthy-looking yellow hair which she wore with becoming austerity in a coronal plate, sat upon one of the cushions and spoke with her accustomed earnestness about nothing in particular. She had applied to the uses of society the journalist's trick of skimming things with an air of intensity, and many men called her a wonderful little woman. The blue butterfly, one of them had said of her, but this unusually irreverent epigram had been generally condemned, though constantly repeated in her set. A member of this set lounged before the fire and listened to her hostess's conversation. She, like Muriel, seemed at first sight too healthy to be eccentric, tall and pretty, with a mature and comfortable prettiness that suggested an easy disposition and an absence of tiresome ideals. If Muriel was the butterfly of her circle, Phoebe Foster was its bumblebee. She was prosperous and well-dressed, believing that luxurious surroundings and an ample diet constituted as fine a discipline for the modern soul as the tedious simplicities of the cloister or its agnostic equivalent, the workman's unit, adapted to the use of ladies living alone. Anyone, she said, could be spiritual with self-denial, boiled vegetables, and the lives of the saints, but it is much more difficult to feel that you are resting on eternity when there is a brocaded cushion in between. She was speaking of purity as Andrew entered, and one feels it to be characteristic of her point of view that she did not think it necessary to change the conversation. One is obliged, she was saying, to leave the static conception, the mere idle chastity, behind. Where otherwise would be woman's value to the race? The courtesan is a heretic. The nun is an atheist. Do you remember? Purity in wifehood, answered Mrs. Vince, with the gentle didacticism appropriate to her youth. Spiritual eugenics, that must of course be our ideal. To bear one or two children of beautiful character and shed an atmosphere of peace upon the home. Andrew, fresh from the tossing current of the streets, the eager war with other brains, which made up his daily work, felt that there was something chill and horrible in the peaceful gray light which came through the curtainless windows, 
the peaceful spaces of white walls and polished floor and the arrogant prattle of these women who sat safely ensconced as in a fortress protected from life and truth by the earnings of the men whom they despised it threw him back upon himself as the sudden entrance into a refrigerator forces the organism to draw heavily on its stock of latent heat domesticity for him had been drawn in outline with a pen of exaggerated refinement its convention was excellent its design was complete but it still awaited the warm tints which should give it the semblance of life however the place was his after all he spread his coat-tails sat down deliberately upon the purple sofa checked its recoil by planting his heels firmly on the floor and said where's the boy the ladies looked at one another and muriel rang the bell twice the child who came in response was fair and languid as if the forces which brought him to birth had wearied before the end of their task he ran to his mother and leaned against her with a petty gesture of abandonment his hair was a little too long his socks were a little too short his smile if a trifle superior was seraphic vince said to his son well felix what have you been doing to-day the boy answered bits of poetry and rhythmy things of course and his mother put her arm about him as if she felt competent at any rate to protect her child from the cruder follies of fatherhood and the degrading influence of an ordinary education one of his hands was within hers with the other he began to trace the course of the black embroidery which ran over her white dress his touch was dainty and bird-like he and his mother appeared to be wholly content they had forgotten vince's present phoebe foster said to him politely felix loses none of his prettiness he is quite a little angel still she spoke in a discreet and social murmur and neither the child nor his mother caught the words andrew replied perhaps but he's getting rather beyond the angelic stage now he's got to be a boy before long drat him that means coming to terms with old nick as well as with gabriel you know his intonation was quite clear and his intention no less so and he added he will be ready for the preparatory school in a year or two and then it's good-bye to poetry and long hair takes a man to make a man i sometimes think you ladies don't quite know what a male thing means we know some of us what it ought to become said phoebe gently it was noticeable that whilst andrew's entrance had only introduced constraint that of felix had brought with it a sense of active hostility already camps were formed the glove had been thrown down and a little encouragement would set the combatants to work miss foster rose and said good-bye she loved tranquillity and believed that she had a right to it andrew was now left with a forced option he could either change the conversation or continue it silence was impossible for he did not live in his wife's universe he therefore took the grand grimoire from his pocket and wished her rather tardily many happy returns of the departing day muriel accepted the little old book very graciously she had a keen sense of duty and except in moments of intellectual collision always treated her husband with kindness also in spite of herself she was pleased and excited by the unusual nature of his gift this is quite interesting she said only the other day someone was speaking to me about autosuggestion and will-power and the place which they occupied in medieval magic it's going to be an important subject from the point of view of historical psychology which is most interesting of course but i'm rather surprised that you felix still leaning against her knee anticipated her exclaiming fancy father finding such a queer little thing as that he would have pulled it away but his mother kept it within her own hands holding it open firmly and cruelly the gesture of a person who feels that her act of reading is far more important than any domestic sanctities which may happen to pertain to the thing read she pressed back the covers until the new morocco hinges gave the despairing squeak of a stout lady compelled to unsuitable athletics and said look felix this will interest you that's called a colophon and those are woodcuts are they not rough and funny 
that's the way that people first began to make the pictures for their books. Peace might have reigned in that room, for Muriel was always amiable when she was imparting information, but Felix, watching the turning of the small, torn, brownish pages, suddenly arrested the process and broke the spell by planting a beautifully clean little finger on the middle of a leaf. "'What's that?' he said. Muriel's serenity departed. Felix had asked a question which she could not answer, an objectionable and unheard-of situation for which Andrew and his extraordinary present must certainly be blamed. She was silent. Vince said cheerfully, "'What have you got hold of, old boy?' Felix began to read aloud carefully, syllable by syllable. Weichen stimulatmaton i esparez tetragrammaton or yoram irian estion existion erioma. It's a spell, darling, said his mother. Sounds like one of my rhythmy things, answered Felix, and Andrew laughed in a hearty and irritating way. Modern education, he said, does not seem to be so very modern after all. I was told today that this thing was full of modern science and the things that science has not yet got to, and it really begins to look rather like it. Who told you that? The woman from whom I bought it. But what does it mean? said Felix, anxiously. Andrew replied, if you want to know what it means... I fancy that you will have to ask Mummy to take you to see the lady who sold me this book. She knows all about everything. So does Mummy, answered Felix, and I don't like ladies. They talk so. Oh, Mummy, what does it mean? Muriel left the question on one side and spoke directly to her husband. Where did you pick it up? she said. Oh, at a second-hand bookshop that I pass on my way to the office. What made you get it? Was it in the window? No, I look in now and then, said Andrew grudgingly. He began to feel that he might as well have given her the shorter catechism at once. Muriel became almost interested. You look in, she exclaimed, at a bookshop? What an extraordinary idea. I like a novel to read with my lunch sometimes, explained Vince. Muriel replied indifferently. Oh, I see. I thought as they had things like this, it must be a good bookshop. All sorts, said Andrew, doggy books, travels, Kipling, Corelli, and so on, and rows of these old brown things at the back, all looking as if they'd been dug out of a mousy cupboard. And this woman? She sounds rather interesting. Does she keep it? No, she's the manager. Curious thing, she's quite a lady, educated, nice manners. I suppose the poor creature was left badly off and didn't find a husband. Ah, oh, bad luck but must be over thirty now. But she is a fine woman still. We've got quite chummy one way or another, and it makes a bit of a change for her, I dare say, to have a little chat now and then. Muriel sprang from the middle classes and had the eye for minute social detail and all that is implied by it, which is peculiar to that caste. She thought quickly and automatically. If this girl really finds it interesting to chat with a man like Andrew— she cannot be quite a lady. Felix had been amusing himself with the grimoire, and now offered another passage for interpretation. What is an undine? said he. Muriel answered, It is a very beautiful story, which you shall read when you have grown a bigger boy. No, it's not a story, it's a thing, and you say prayers to it, replied Felix. There's one in here. How funny! Raymond Percy says prayers, too, but I don't think they are about undines. Shall I say prayers when I'm a bigger boy? No, dear, it will not be necessary, said his mother. Your little soul has been nurtured from birth. It will, I hope, expand like a flower by its own innocent strength. Felix recognized the language and remembered his supper, a slice of bread and butter with brown sugar on it, which an old-fashioned and affectionate nurse administered at half-past six o'clock. "'Please, may I go back to the nursery?' he said. "'Good night, father. Do you know, mummy, Raymond has got a very lovely rocking horse now, and little runny train, as well as prayers.' "'Why on earth don't you let that child have some toys?' said Andrew when his son had gone away. 
There was almost a growl in his voice. Muriel answered him gravely and patiently. I have told you, Andrew, she said, that the child's training must be left wholly in my hands if I am to undertake it at all. At this point, a divided influence would be fatal. He has his poetry books and dancing and his singing games. The newest authorities are agreed that those are the proper agents for the development of the subconscious mind. They awake the sense of joy, which has no rational relation to tin soldiers and mechanical ships. Such toys only enchain the imagination and cause children to attach too much importance to material things. Poor little beasts! It's rather rough luck to be a modern child. Muriel suddenly smiled at him with an aggravating and invulnerable radiance that seemed to break from within. I won't argue with you, she said. We speak to one another from such different planes that it is useless, and controversy is almost negative in its effect upon the soul. I like the little book. It was dear of you to bring it. It's more interesting to me than you can understand. Tell me more about this woman. What's she like, and how much does she really know about psychic things? Oh, she's tall, dark, rather solid, answered Andrew. Looks as if she did Swedish gymnastics after her bath, that sort of type, don't you know. Very good teeth and nice complexion. He caught Muriel's expression and stopped. Don't you know anything about her that matters, said his wife patiently. Not much. I haven't a ghost of an idea who her people are or where she comes from. But she's all right, don't you know? One can see that in a second. She was rather queer this morning, a bit upset by the damp weather, perhaps. It must be chilly work in that shop at times, with the door wide open all day. I'd always looked upon her as a bright, business-like sort of woman, full of sense, no frills. But she said some extraordinarily silly things about this book. Muriel became interested, leaned forward a little, and said, Tell me. Well, she really seemed almost inclined to take it seriously. Absurd, of course. Can't think of what she was driving at. Said it was like a lot of chemists' prescriptions, useful to the professional who knew what to do with them, but dangerous to amateurs who didn't. How curious, exclaimed Muriel. She must have an interesting mind. Perhaps she's a practical occultist. One finds them in the most unexpected places, even in the stock exchange, I hear. Oh, she's not such a fool as that. His wife hardly heard him. There was a glow of excitement in her eyes. She had caught a glimpse of a transcendental novelty, and eager for the chase, entirely forgot to be grateful to the man who had put her on the scent. She said, almost peremptorily, What is the address of the shop? Vince gave it to her. He had no alternative. But it seemed a little hard that Muriel, who took so much, should now annex this slight yet singularly satisfactory friendship. No doubt she would subjugate Miss Tyrell. Few women could resist her, for they all, in Andrew's experience, wished to be clever, and Muriel invariably attributed this quality to those persons who shared her spiritual and educational views. Constance would be taken in hand, patronized, taught to sit in cushions on the floor. She would soon cease to laugh at his jokes. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by Josh Middledorf Chapter Six Three Sorts of Ignorance If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite, for man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. Blake the marriage of heaven and hell. Constance stood high upon a ladder, vainly trying to keep pace with the interminable dusting and tidying which mingles domesticity with literature in all well-ordered bookshops. The tightly packed shelves rose like a stratified cliff from floor to ceiling within a few inches of her eyes, and she was poised in the air amongst them like some climber hung upon the face of a precipice, intent on their service, as is the way with born librarians and bibliophiles. There was something intimate, personal, and homely in her relation with each volume. 
She loved them, and it pleased her to tend them. The monotony of her occupation induced, mechanically, a feeling of security and peace. It was like knitting, raised to the intellectual plane. Now and again, when a footstep caught her attention and suggested the possibility of an early customer, she turned for a moment and glanced downward. Then she obtained an excellent view of the establishment and also of the landscape which was framed by the open door. A little patch of pavement, some bits of dirty paper in the gutter, the skirts and trousers of pedestrians, the tail tips of many passing dogs. These, because they were living, moving things, exhilarated her. She longed to touch them and feel their delightful warmth. The exquisite children in white gaiters, their nurses, who hastened to Kensington Gardens with a novelette peeping under the perambulator rug, the active, prosperous girls taking their terriers for a morning walk. She was alone, and therefore wholly under the dominion of the Watcher, capital W. So constant was his presence, so rare were the moments in which she obtained possession of herself, that this state of things had begun to seem almost natural. She was getting accustomed to his point of view, to the curious mixture of ignorance and arrogance, the breadth and pettiness that he displayed. She regretted her experiment, for his companionship was not pleasant, and he gave as yet no illumination in return for his lodging. She, as she divined, must teach him the earth. He was busy with his lessons, probing, guessing, questioning all the while, but he had nothing to impart about the heavens in exchange, and this was disappointing. Seeking a greater freedom, she had been caught in a peculiarly exasperating slavery. But the thing was done. With the fatalism that was an aspect of her general acceptance of life, she acquiesced quietly enough in the queer rearrangement of things, and this so completely that her outward demeanor was unchanged by it. Mr. John had not even suspected her of neuralgia, much less of demoniac possession. The dust that she was had dignity. It was not easily thrown into turmoil by the breezes of the abyss. She took up her existence and dealt with it day by day, with her old solidity and calm. Nevertheless, she had had a hard week of it. There was her ordinary work to perform, and the spring publishing season was now upon them. There was Vera to attend at the opening and the close of every day. There were the innumerable small duties, the makings and mendings, letting out of tucks, inserting of clean collars, which wage-earning women can never delegate. These things had always filled the routine side of life to overflowing. Now there was added to them the entertainment of the sleepless watcher, whose passionate domination of her senses left her exhausted and bewildered every night. He had a ceaseless eagerness to see, hear, touch, and smell the odd and clumsy world into which he had pushed his way. So her ears, her eyes, and hands did the work of two, and whenever her will was dormant for a moment, his seized the helm and drove the tired body on to fresh experience and the tired mind to fresh interpretation. There were no more visual hallucinations, no apparent interferences with the laws of external life, only the constant presence of an alien point of view and of a self, a thing an actual, if intangible, personality that put the machinery of her brain to its own purpose. This personality infected her, gave her a new flavor, a new relation to the other constituents of life, as when an aromatic herb is introduced into the casserole, its real spirit enters into a permanent union with the chicken. Thus, very often, she hardly knew whether the thoughts that she had and the words that she said were symbols of the watcher's ideas or her own. Already she had almost forgotten what the dear and natural world had been used to look like before her powers of perception received this disagreeable twist. Now unnaturalness had become the standard of reality. There was only one escape from his overpowering companionship, 
only one door of return to her true self. When other people entered into communication with her, when life, real life, put in a peremptory claim, and she responded, there was civil war, her will to live struggling with his will to know. Then, if the external forces of life were strong enough, the human drove back the inhuman, and the social normal constants emerged with a great sense of relief. But even so, she was always acutely conscious of the besieger at her gates, waiting till the reinforcements should be withdrawn. Then he was back again, unfriendly, egotistical, rather contemptuous. Life, for him, was an odd and interesting exhibition, and she the showwoman. He had a right to her services. He had recovered from the first horror of his fall and was prepared to enjoy himself, but he could not understand existence, nor could she explain it, for she had never before noticed that it stood in need of explanation. Violently and passionately he demanded the grammar of life, and she, who had always spoken the language, of course, knew nothing of its rules. He found some difficulty in trimming perceptions which had been framed for eternity to the narrow outlook of a bookseller's manager in a West End street. Bit by bit he was learning the uses of her senses, eagerly practicing these new, delightful tricks of sight and hearing on every little object within range. But all manifestations of energy seemed to him to be much upon a level. They were but moments in the movements of the dream, and there was nothing in his idea of things which could help him to distinguish the trivial from the important incidents of life. Birth and death, trade and traffic, food and clothes, each raised in him astonished curiosity. Hence he assumed, absurdly, that all these new objects of his knowledge must equally and of necessity be worth the knowing, and concentrated eagerly upon the plots of novels, the flavor of food, the very names of the streets, trying to find out the meaning or, with a more annoying particularity, their use worse when she or those whom he viewed through her eyes acted he presumed a reason for the act she was helpless before the misconceptions of a creature who applied the stanzas of the infinite to civilized daily life he was amazed by all that he saw by that love of the aboriginal borough which constrains the londoner whenever possible to perform the secret operations of storage cookery and travel underground by the teeming streets in which our urban populations are everlastingly content to fidget he could not comprehend the incessant pouring to and fro of people by all these spacious highways and plated alleys seen from his universe they were like mercury scattered on a disk which runs without reason in a hundred little processions and solitary drops unites into a formless wriggling mass and breaks away again to an unending repetition of the process. Now, from the top of the ladder, as he caught glimpses of the eternal crawl of women past the shops, the eternal vacant hurry of the men, his questions began to besiege her, came between her and the orderly and satisfying work on which she longed to concentrate her weary mind. They are all alive, all conscious, I suppose, these little creatures that I see run by. At least they like to think that they are alive. But why should they be always on the move? What is the use of movement? Are they not able to be still? Their bodies first run one way and then they run the other. I see them do it with a strange determination, as if it mattered a great deal. But it makes no difference, really, does it? They cannot get away yet life means staying here does it not being glued to the ground and death means getting away however much they run about they cannot get out of the knot until they die is this restlessness the beginning of their dying the creeping of something that is already corrupt constance answered no it is proof of their vitality they cannot rest cannot be idle 
because they are alive and have so many things to do. She could think of no better explanation. He retorted at once, but there are no real things to do. Reality does not change. It is perfect and very quiet. I have always existed in it, and therefore I know. This activity is a loathsome illusion. It has no relation to the real. They think that it has. How can they think that? They know about death. They know that they are crumbling all the time. Well, they don't think about death. This is life, and they want to live it whilst they can. What a foolish and unreasonable wish! Surely one may live, taste life, be in it, even acquiesce in the decay without the eternal fretfulness of doing things. <sighs> I do not know, said Constance, but it seems to be implicit in the game. We are pushed, you know, for the most part. We don't do very much of it ourselves. Perhaps if you played the game you would understand. You see, when these people die, they will leave things behind them. Children, perhaps, whom they must get going in life. Humanity is a chain, not a lot of little spots. When people run to and fro, they are pulled by the other links. But the children will die in their turn. They will all die. Then they will exist in the real, forever and ever, without earning or eating, or any kind of fuss. So why undertake this weariness and struggle just to stay a few more hours within the dream? It is so ugly, miserable, and meaningless. Why do they not all try to die as soon as they can? Why do you not try to die? Now, at once, disentangle yourself from this dream. Constance replied to her own supplies, That is against the rules. She had not known it before. Now she was certain of it. It was as if he, coming behind, had pushed her on, beyond her normal standpoint as well as his own, till she saw involuntarily things which were yet below his horizon. That is incomprehensible, said the watcher. But if there were rules, the game must be real, and there must be a meaning in it. The game that I see with your eyes and your brain is lawless. It has no prize and no object. Nothing happens within it which is real. Glancing back on her own experience, Constance said, Real things do happen, even in this corner, but only to one's self. I think that you would hardly notice them. They look so little, so unimportant to outsiders, compared with the beginning and strange endings of the game. But they are hideous, these things, replied the watcher. They are like the bubbles of putrescence which happen and die, but cause nothing, leave no trace. They confuse the game, if there is one, hide the meaning. I suppose it is concealed somewhere beneath the froth of action. If it is there, I must find it. I will, and I shall. Then Constance suddenly realized that the thing which he was judging so harshly was not life, the great goddess, but her own life, the little circle of sensation in which she moved and he with her. Seen with the stranger's eye, it was indeed squalid, senseless. She thought with shame of her breakfast table, the dingy, threadbare cloth which had to last a week in spite of many brown and greasy stains, the smutty, chipped, and unpleasant appearance of the milk jug, the smears and the sloppiness. Vera's face when she had finished eating her egg. Then she thought of the dreary street and the bookshop and Miss Reekin, the next-door milliner, who often offered her a cup of tea. That was really all. Day by day she went around this little ring of experience with the docility and regularity of a circus horse. And she offered this to the watcher, who had been dragged out of infinity by his passionate curiosity his determination to know that mystery of life which she saw, even from the lodging-house window, as the lustrous and many-coloured garment of her God. This was the thing that, with all her opportunities, with the fierce flame of adventure burning in her heart, she offered to eternity as her rendering of existence. She was ashamed, feeling herself guilty of a lack of patriotism, 
in that she had shown this foreign guest no better thing. She said to him suddenly, Go, go, find all the wonders, look for the thread. Don't stay in this corner with me. But he answered almost in anger, I cannot go, for no one else will receive me, and without a habitation how am I to stay within this dream? Her eyes were opened for an instant then. The cliff of books fled far away, and she saw the tideless and everlasting sea of spiritual existence and life like a little iridescent ball of foam blown across the surface of the waves. She was an infinitesimal bubble in that insubstantial mass. In an instant it would be dissolved, reabsorbed in the ocean, all its cherished separateness forever gone. Meanwhile the watcher nested within her bubble and was blown with her over the deeps. She shared in this moment his contemptuous bewilderment confronted with the little colored evanescent world of sense, even admitted a hateful doubt when he murmured, I suppose you are alive, real, eternal, somewhere, inside, behind it all, only caught much tighter than I am, and able to believe in nothing but the dream. She thought, suppose that I were not real, suppose that I, too, were a dream. She turned from that vision in horror and fear. The collector, who had been making up the order list in the back office, here passed through the shop and said to her, Torrington's traveller is here, miss. The governor says, will you please see him as soon as you are disengaged? Send him in, said Constance, and she descended the ladder with a feeling of gratitude for unexpected rescue from a thickening web. Mr. John came with the traveller, a bearded, intelligent person gathering a small black bag who might have been mistaken for an unsuccessful doctor had he looked more convincingly antiseptic. I think, said Mr. John to his manager, that we can do with a dozen of their mixed poets in quarter vellum. They come three and nine apiece, if you take a quantity, interrupted the traveller. Marvellous value. Artistically tooled backs and assorted labels, the best thing our firm has done in presentation poets. You won't regret them. A splendid window line, and safe at five and six in this district. Mr. John threw down the catalogue upon Constance's desk. Just make a good selling selection, Miss Tyrell, he said. The action looked dignified, and he knew that it was judicious. Burns? Scott? Whittier? suggested the traveller, eagerly. She shook her head. No good to us. I'll take Keats, too, and Shelley, too. Milton, one. We don't do much in Milton's lately. Browning? Only the earlier works, of course. Oh, yes, I had better have three Robert and one Mrs. Four. More to make up the dozen. Put me in some Longfellows. We shall want them for the school prize season later on. You're a good buyer, miss, said the traveller, grudgingly. His voice was succeeded by a very sweet and gentle one, which murmured, See, Felix, this is how they order the books we buy to read. Is it not interesting? This must be the lady whom father knows, I think. How sad and how surprising to find that Longfellow still sells so well. Why? said Felix. Muriel answered. He had bourgeois ideals, darling. You will understand that when you are a bigger boy. Constance catching this reply at once divined a customer of the more fastidious sort, assumed that air of understanding which seemed so sympathetic and was really so businesslike, and said in a reassuring tone, He is not generally read, of course, but we have a large educational collection, and I am obliged to buy for that. Nothing, I think, said the lady firmly, exerts a worse influence on the developing emotions of children than the feebler poetry of the Victorian era. One should give them myth, the myth of all the religions, for religions were invented in the childhood of the world, were they not? Miss Tyrell, whom these statements had merely amazed, glanced at the new customer, and was at once wholly subjugated by her appearance, being one of those women for whom the crucial encounter and the overmastering appeal must always come from one of her own sex. As she put it to herself, Men were interesting animals, but women mattered most. This brilliant, young, 
absurd, self-conscious creature with her serene expression, embroidered dress, and artistically unusual hat, was like a pretty novelty suddenly exhibited in the shop window of life. She revived Constance's drooping belief in the resources of the establishment, so she at once became interested, wanted the delightful thing, and did not stop to ask the price. Muriel, who often found it prudent to adopt a deferential tone when speaking to those whom she believed to be her inferiors, now said to her, I really ought to apologize for coming in and troubling you like this, and just, I am afraid, at the busy time of the day, but you see, my husband mentioned you in connection with a very curious little book on magic that he bought here lately. He seemed to think that you would be kind enough to tell me something about it, and in fact it was he who advised me to come. She thought, as Andrew is such a good customer, she will have to be civil to me after that. As for Constance, she at once perceived that this must be the wife of the midday friend, and was amazed that a creature who was at once beautiful, intelligent, and ridiculous could fail to satisfy the demands of any reasonable man. She had pictured Mrs. Vince as austere, flat-waisted, even early Italian in type, but Andrew evidently possessed a fascinating toy, and would not be content because it refused to be turned into a companion. This was foolish of him. Where he would not play, Constance, whose toy cupboard life had not furnished very richly, was willing enough to enjoy the opportunity of a game. At this moment she felt the desperate need of something to fall in love with, something that would restore her lost confidence in the world of sense, and Muriel, being both silly and pretty, seemed specially adapted to this purpose. She said, I think the little book that you mean must be the grimoire that Mr. Vince bought here a few days ago. I'm afraid I cannot tell you very much about that. It was bought in with a number of other old books at a country sale, and has no history. It was Felix who replied, We don't want to know about history, thank you. Mummy knows about that. We really have come because she doesn't know about undines, and if they are real... You see, it's rather important, because, of course, if they are real, I shall have to know about them when I'm bigger, boy. Father said, you know about everything. My husband, said Mrs. Vince, is hardly what one would call a bookish man, though he tells me that he often comes here for novels and so forth. But I am interested in these subjects. They are most curious, as I dare say, and I find few things so satisfying to the intuitive senses as subliminal psychology. I fancied, from what he told me, that you were also a student of psychic things, and of their relation to the mystical and occult. Constance fell. She did not seriously suppose that Muriel's charming appearance indicated any understanding of transcendental matters. But she was in that mood which makes a shipwrecked man drink seawater, knowing that it will only induce a more maddening thirst, but unable to resist the momentary consolation. She therefore said, I told Mr. Vince when he bought the little book that it was not so absurd as it seemed. I am afraid that he thought me very silly and credulous, but evidently you are more inclined to agree with me. As she spoke, the troubled movements of the watcher reminded her that she was dealing disingenuously, even frivolously, with one of the sparsely distributed realities which had enabled him to forge a link between infinity and earth. "'You must not let my husband's remarks annoy you,' said Muriel. "'All men are materialists, and really I don't know that one wants them to be anything else. But I do so entirely agree with you. Few things are so absurd as they seem, I think, and even if they were, one should keep an open mind toward the unseen.' In the light of modern thought, we are learning to understand these subjects more and more. Constance replied, Modern thought makes no difference, you know, really. The thing is there, and always has been. At the most, we have only given it new names and invented a new explanation. How interesting of you to say so, exclaimed Muriel. I see that you are a medievalist, and you are really inclined to take magic seriously? You believe that the old occultists were justified in the claims that they made? That there is something in it beyond self-suggestion and hypnosis? 
I don't believe, said Constance, because I know. It's the people who don't know who have to try and believe. I should think that they would find it rather difficult. She stopped, but it was too late. Muriel, whom unorthodox dogmatism always delighted, invited her to tea with enthusiasm. The astonished voice of the watcher cried in its turn, Go, go! And Constance, amazed by the suddenness of the event, consented. As they left the shop, Felix said to his mother, Mummy, I think this is a new kind of lady. Muriel misunderstood him. Darling, she said, lots of ladies wear pinafores and do work. Different inside, I mean, said Felix firmly. Muriel, who shared the opinion of the best modern authorities on family life, that we can learn more from our children than they can learn from us, looked back at Miss Tyrell with renewed interest. She felt that her careful development of the boy's subconscious mind was already having its reward. She would be able to use him as a terrier in seeking out those abnormal persons whose presence in her drawing-room gave her so much delight. She caught Constance's eye as she turned. The watcher had come back to the window, and Muriel noticed with surprise their wild and strange expression of bewilderment, loneliness, and curiosity. Poor thing, she thought. I expect she has a very dull time of it. Commercial society must be most trying to such an intelligent woman as that. My visit has been quite an excitement. I'm glad that I asked her to call. End of chapter 6Chapter 7 of The Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter 7 The Street and the Drawing Room. The key of the great mysteries lies hidden in all things around us, but the perplexities of the convention hinder us from finding it. A. E. Waite, A Book of Mystery and Vision. Because she had made a little place for the watcher, had accepted his presence, even took a certain pride in her guardianship, Constance now found herself subjected to a steady invasion, as one after another the chambers of her mind opened their doors to him. His vision was merged with hers, in all save immediately human matters. Thus she was finally made aware of a new aspect of the universe, of an angle from which she might perceive the splendor, aliveness, and mysterious qualities of natural things, the inconceivable lunacy of most man-arranged things. This happened to her with a rush upon the Saturday afternoon on which she went to tea with Mrs. Vince. She had set out with eagerness, a little excited, as always when adventure or new experience was on hand, and therefore perhaps the more ready to open her eyes on strange truth. It was early in May, and there were moments of a shy and exquisite sunshine between the passing of the fluffy clouds. Constance, alighting from her omnibus, came down a steep and tree-planted street with her face to the south. She was in a superior residential neighborhood, and the houses upon either hand were built of red brick and had many large, clean windows, all opened at the top and furnished with casement curtains of soft silk. Expensive tulips of discordant tints grew in the little gardens. There were fantastic knockers on many of the doors. It was in this unexpected district that she saw the shining tree. It sprang upon her consciousness out of the patchy, sunny world of paving stones, window boxes, and pale blue sky, complete, alive, a radiant personality whose real roots she was sure penetrated far beyond the limitations of this material world. She gazed, astonished, into the heart of it, saw the travail and stress of the spirit of life crying out for expression, the mysterious sap rushing through its arteries, the ceaseless and ritual dance of every speck of substance which built it, that eternal setting to partners which constitutes the rhythm of the world. She perceived the long and eager fingers fringed with tentacles too delicate for sight, which clawed their way far into the earth, their fervid and restless search for food to nourish the arrogant and tufted tail which they sent into the upper air. 
It was as if, accustomed to glance carelessly at the face of an agreeable and conventionally clothed acquaintance, that acquaintance were now revealed to her in the awful dignity of the nude. As for the tufted tail, it was no elastic and ingenious arrangement of branch and twig, set with buds and young leaves, no convenient perching place for innumerable sparrows. It broke like an imprisoned angel through the concrete prosperities of the street. Its airy filaments enmeshed a light which she had never seen before. In that street it dwelt solitary, apart, yet very near. There was something between them, something in spite of her longing, which kept them separate. She wondered what it could be. She saw each leaf fierce and lucent as an emerald, radiant of green fire, blazing, passionate with energy, a verdant furnace wherein transcendent life was distilled, cast into the mould of material things. Either, as she supposed for a moment, it was not there at all, or else it had always awaited the perceiving intelligence, in virtue of some amazing significance that it had, a nook which it filled, a truth that it expressed within the universal dream. Its presence obliterated the clumsy shapes of the ordinary world and their foolish limitations. It gave her a vision of another universe, of the world through space of countless planets, all teeming, feathery, flowering to the angelic eye, with some such radiant inflorescence as this. She saw the cosmos as God's flower garden, in which he strode well content in the cool of the day, and man as the little scuttling insect, breeding and feeding amongst the leaves. She saw it thus for an instant, the shining, glassy, pulsating thing. Then, as it seemed, another veil was stripped from her eyes, and she saw it in its unimaginable reality, as it is seen by the spiritual sight, remote and more wonderfully luminous, the fit object for her adoration. The watcher's voice cried within her, Ah, beautiful, exquisite world! Here at last is the meaning, the real, the idea. Why did I not understand before? As for her, she had nothing to say, nothing to show. She was too astonished and too full of joy. He said again, Ah, what amazing happiness you have! you little creatures, all the shapes and colors and the sharp edges against the light and the lovely little differences of things. What a splendid dream! What a gloss upon eternity! How satisfying! But why do you always look at the other side? How greatly you are mistaken and how much joy you must miss because of being with unreal and ugly things. A woman passed dressed in Isabella-colored rags. Her coarse hair was gathered in an unseemly knot by the help of a bit of common string. Her dingy, mottled stockings lay in folds about the ankles. Her boots were unlaced. She carried a tiny baby at her breast and a few bunches of shabby violets in a basket. The baby was a condensed statement of human unpleasantness. The violets, in their present condition of purplish pulp, still conveyed, like kings in exile, a poignant suggestion of lost fragrance and shy grace. This smudged sketch of womanhood came between Constance and the tree, unconscious of the thing that was close to her and of the parted veil through which the other woman peeped. She was wrapped closely in her own cares and discomforts, a ragged vestal, virgin to all delights save one, so busy tending the difficult flame of life that she never had time to warm herself by its rays. The watcher withdrew from his lookout when she came within its field. One could feel the strong, contractive movement of loathing which her image had evoked. He said, Why do you let your earth breed such horrible things? Stamp them out! Feed the beautiful and starve the vile! Constance answered, I don't think one can, because it is all one. The watcher replied, No, no, how foolish, how blind you are. 
Here is the true and lovely dream close beside you. Look at it. Live in it. This is the true projection of the will. But the ugly side of vision is all false. Leave that alone. Let it die. The woman came nearer and said, Violets, lady, do buy some violets. I ain't taken nothing today. The hopeless effort of the myriad feeble poor, all the teeming alleys, the indistinguishable hordes, seemed to come as a wailing chorus to her words. Somewhere in Constance's mind an inhabitant arose who knew that music, who wrestled with the watcher for possession of her will, saying, Cling to the human, however loathsome. Do not refuse life in all her implications. But the shining tree was there, as it seemed, with the other message crying, Open your eyes to the light, to a world made luminous. Leave the shadows. Come, come. The watcher applauded those words. There she was, between two worlds of experience, between the two great expressions of the spirit of life, the shining tree in its transcendental splendor and security, and the shifting, agonized, and pullulating deeps. Beauty called her through the parted veil of perception, casting open door after door upon the countless aspects of creation. But pain, friendly, ugly, human pain, was at her elbow, whispering that this was a birthright which she would only renounce at her cost. The unsavory baby stirred under its shawl at this moment and thrust out a tightly clenched and grimy fist. Then Constance saw for an instant life, the ever-lovely, fertile, heedless, generous life, springing beneath the rags, fresh and exquisite as the nascent corn beneath the mold. Its champion within her acknowledged this presence recognizing it as identical with that vision by which it had always been guided and upheld, and unconscious of its maimed, degraded face, the child and his mother became a symbol, and love was in the air, very humble and glad, saying, Vita dolcedo et spes nostra salve. The woman had grown to the likeness of the shining tree. She too was radiant, eternal, and sublime. The spirit of life ran like a divine fire in her veins and was given to the infant at her breast. She had become a majestic link in the process of creation, an auxiliary of the angels. A fresh door was thrown open upon reality, whereby it was seen that even the prisoners in the dungeon still wore the insignia of kings. The tree was there, throwing, as it were, the shelter of a transcendental loveliness, and knowledge about the poor efforts of those entangled in the flesh. The woman and child, seen against it, were an image of all life. It seemed an anticlimax to give the woman sixpence to look with interest at the baby's moist and smutty face, but she did it in this act that deep-seated personality within her became dominant. The baffled and disgusted watcher loosed the reins, Acknowledging beauty, she had vindicated her humanity by paying her deepest reverence to life, a proceeding which can only seem insane to those spiritual natures which have not been passed through the furnace of love. She came to Mrs. Vince's drawing-room, hardly prepared by the curtain-raiser for a full appreciation of that comedy which was the main business of her afternoon. Andrew met her with surprise for his wife had forgotten to tell him of the invitation. He looked thicker than ever in his own home, and so out of place that Constance found it difficult to remember that he was her host. His civilities were automatic. He had said, Very good of you to come to us, before he realized that the goodness for once was actually on Muriel's side. She was going to be kind to Miss Tyrell. This, he felt, would be a delicate matter, but he was obliged to acknowledge her conduct as perfect. It must clearly be a point of honor with all three of them to forget the bookshop, and Vince saw it with a painful distinctness when his friend was announced. Therefore, the curious sincerity of Muriel's welcome amazed him. There were interesting people in the room, but she turned from them all to attend on her new guest, she said. 
I've been looking forward so much to this. In fact, we all have. I know you're wonderful. Oh, yes, I saw it the moment that I met you. My little boy felt it, too. And you know how sensitive children are. They are near the source and have not had time to forget. But you shan't be teased to tell people things, I promise. They are all longing to meet you, and if you would rather, they will have to be content with just that. She smiled at Constance with an air of secret intimacy, shutting her in the little circle of her own comprehension. The effect was dazzling, for Muriel was looking unusually pretty. Her hair was arranged with a laborious and becoming simplicity, her large eyes shone with spiritual enthusiasm. If gaiety could rightly be attributed to the really high-minded, she was almost gay upon this afternoon, and Andrew, watching her, was amazed that such exultation could be produced by lectures, exclusive ideals, and a vegetarian diet. The woolen underclothing which he knew that she affected would have kept any ordinary woman from attaining that air of esoteric smartness which constituted Muriel's peculiar charm. Constance drifted away, leaving her hostess at liberty. Miss Foster at once took her place and said softly, Who is the big dark-haired woman in impossible brown kid gloves? She is going to be interesting, answered Muriel. At least, I hope so. But they are very tiresome sometimes. Occult things, magic, and so on. Talk to her, there's a dear, and presently I'll get Mrs. Reed to draw her out. It is her first visit. I've just been putting her at her ease. Oddly enough, it was Andrew who discovered her, and as a matter of fact, she keeps a shop. Being in a shop nowadays is so very different, said Phoebe. Yes, but still even now a shop isn't quite. It is books, you see. Rather a new idea, isn't it? And rather a pity, I think. Of course, if it were hats or old furniture, anyone would receive her. I expect she is a lady. She certainly moves like one, said another guest, who had been listening to the conversation. Yes, I noticed that at once, replied Muriel. Then, recollecting herself, she added hastily, but at any rate she is a woman, which is, of course, a far greater thing. And rarer, observed Andrew, abruptly. All the ladies in his vicinity looked at him with as much surprise as if an infant in arms had made an intelligible remark. I will go and talk to her, said Phoebe, in whom Andrew aroused that instinctive dislike which all women feel for the husbands of their more cultivated friends. Also, she wished to help Muriel with her party, and was aware that if the new acquisition were first drawn out by the wrong person, her value as an asset would be sensibly diminished. She approached Constance, but too late. Miss Tyrell had already been captured. A comfortable lady in very worldly clothes sat by her on the sofa, and Phoebe, recognizing in Mrs. Weatherby that hateful form of stupidity which is apt to make one's own cleverness seem absurd, shortened sail and remained at a little distance in an attitude of watchful detachment. I don't think, said Mrs. Weatherby, without further preliminary, that I have seen you at one of Mrs. Vince's parties before. No, said Constance. You are wise to come. I always do. It amuses me. She doesn't want me, but there are some people, you know, that even these clever young women are obliged to ask. You see, I've known Andrew ever since he was in petticoats. Very unsuitable he looked then. Such a little man. Muriel dislikes me because I haven't got a soul. But as I live next door, she has never been able to drop me. Tiresome for her, isn't it? She chuckled stuffed a soft mauve pillow into the space between her shoulders and the sofa, and continued talking in that mood of unbridled confidence about other people's business which the company of an entire stranger will sometimes provoke. Muriel, she said, is a pretty girl, isn't she? Piquant, unusual, even artistic clothes never looked dowdy on her. One isn't surprised that Andrew fell in love, although the little wretch hadn't a penny. I admire Mrs. Vince immensely, replied Constance. 
too much like a Madonna in a drawing room to please me, said Mrs. Weatherby. Give her a halo, a blue tea gown, and a baby. But she never had another after Felix, lazy creature. As for poor Andrew, he is just in the position of a Saint Joseph in these nice little pictures you get at high church shops. I can't think how they do them. Only eighteen pence in real oak frames. Well, that's what he makes me think of standing up behind in a very uncomfortable position whilst muriel is admired a good honest fellow with sound business instincts and his living to get at his trade shut up with a painfully unique and exquisite wife every one else in their knees before her and he feeling that attitude rather fatiguing after a hard day's work how coarse and ugly all the ordinary little comfortable bad habits must appear in such company could you drink bottled stout with that sitting at the other end of the table would it be possible to snore in the presence of a really spiritual woman that is andrew's condition all over muriel enjoys her own virtues thoroughly but his don't agree with the furniture and so they have to be kept out of sight constance who was too much interested in Muriel's hair to care very much about her virtues, was bewildered by this brutal frankness, and had nothing to say. There was a short silence, and Miss Foster, seeing her opportunity, pounced. "'I want you,' she said, "'to talk to me a little, if you will. We haven't been introduced, but I feel that we know one another. Mrs. Vince told me one or two things. You must not mind. I am sure that we shall be sympathetic.' I, too, have a great belief in the undeveloped faculties of man, Constance replied. I am afraid that Mrs. Vince is mistaken. I am a very ordinary person, and as to the subjects which interest her, I know hardly anything, beyond, perhaps, the immensity of my own ignorance. Intuition, said Phoebe, is greater than knowledge, and especially a woman's intuition, unhindered by the love of carnal things. Constance could see Andrew in the middle distance, moving to and fro with the awkward and desperate motions of a man resisting to the utmost his natural instinct for flight. He was so humbly human, so desperately real, that she almost expected house and tea party to dissolve and leave him incurably actual, poised in space. Muriel had retreated to the window, whence her gentle and earnest voice could be heard now and then. She was conversing with two clean-shaven and frock-coated youths, whose presence was obviously a tribute to the appearances rather than to the opinions of the assembled ladies. One of them kept a perpetual but unostentatious watch upon the movements of Miss Foster. The other looked at his hostess whilst he listened to a heavy, sallow woman with greasy black hair prominent eyes, and many Egyptian ornaments. The sallow woman, whose name was Mrs. Reed, was speaking in a voice of extraordinary power and sweetness. Salt, sulfur, and mercury, she said, are really, in their ultimate implications, the three Maries at the sepulchre of soul. When we have learned this, we are at the threshold of the grand arcanum, for complicity of myth merges in unity of experience, if we could but understand. "'What is the Arcanum?' asked the youth who was watching Miss Foster. The sallow lady looked at him severely. "'Osiris,' she said, "'died a sacrifice, and of Osiris Horus was reborn. Alchemical gold is the fruit of destroying fire. Does this tell you nothing?' The questioner was abashed and his companion muttered, Poor old Freddy, in an almost audible tone. Muriel broke in. We must not, she observed, attribute too much finality, even to pre-Christian myths, I think. Can they, after all, be more than methods of training the subconscious mind to an apprehension of truth? No, said Freddy, moving away with a dexterity which was clearly the result of long practice. It was at this point that the watcher, surging up to the encounter of this inner nest of illusion and the new existences that it contained exclaimed in her mind it is all unreal confused and hopeless 
Ah, why will they pervert and spoil this dream? She was off her guard. He was strong, and the words were audible. She heard her lips say them. They sounded strange and uncivil, and she wondered what would happen next. Fortunately, Phoebe understood them to be a reply to her last observation. She said approvingly, That is so true. Knowledge without insight leads us from the light instead of to it. I see that you are a mystic. All young people like to call themselves mystics nowadays, interrupted Mrs. Weatherby with a knowing air of kindly contempt. I often wonder whether they know what they mean by it. Surely, said Phoebe gently, a mystic is one who lives in reality instead of in appearance. Constance heard her own voice saying, Then there can be no mystics on the earth. Oh, I cannot agree with you there, replied Phoebe. Indeed, we know to the contrary, for the great mystics have left their records behind. Did we not know that ecstasy and meditation can shift the threshold of consciousness and open the soul's eyes upon the unseen, we should be miserable indeed. Constance, still at the mercy of her lodger, and possessed by that curious exultation and freedom from self-consciousness which society sometimes induces in those who live much alone, said, That is but one illusion the more. Just so, agreed Mrs. Weatherby, a mystic's experience is only valid for himself. All the books say so. He may not be mad, of course, but you can't prove it. Besides, these subjects make people cold and unsociable. In a married woman, they generally mean a husband who is either unsatisfied or unsatisfactory. Probably both in the end. The fact is, they aren't quite normal, and that is why nice women have always felt that they are not right. Muriel had joined them. A nice woman, dear Mrs. Weatherby, she said, is unfortunately so often called nice because she has not sufficient character to suggest any other adjective. She always has womanliness, replied Mrs. Weatherby. Oh, yes, I know, it's an old-fashioned word, and what's more, I don't care if it is. You may depend upon it, my dear, that the really womanly woman is the grandest figure in the world, and when you young people have got through with your mysticism, the men will make you come back to it. She is sublime as a mother, and often unacceptably clever in making love, observed Phoebe dispassionately. If you mean by womanly, the deep-bosomed, quiescent creature with steady nerves. For the rest, she is afraid of life, like priests and other people who are born to the perfect performance of a restricted job. Constance took fire at that. But she is life, she said. She has it. You who watch and classify, do you think that you live? You are only the wallflowers at the ball. You haven't joined the dance. You haven't earned your supper. I wonder whether you'll get it in the end. Phoebe looked at her in some surprise and then answered very placidly, You do not take into account the interior life of the soul or the spiritual children that it bears. No, you forget them observed the youth called Freddy, who had been waiting for an opportunity of agreeing with Miss Foster's remarks. Yes, said Muriel, that is the real existence, the higher consciousness, is it not? And it is all here, she tapped her chest mysteriously as she spoke. Of course, in the solar plexus, exclaimed another lady, a pretty, fluffy person, quaintly dressed in the early Victorian style. What a wonderful discovery, is it not? Once it has awakened, they say that even the most dyspeptic people may eat anything without endangering their inner peace. And pray, how does one awake it? asked Mrs. Weatherby. Phoebe replied, by the practice of meditation. Yes, of course, said the fluffy lady, rather plaintively. Meditation is the beginning of everything, is it not, at least in spiritual things, and now they say it leads to success in business as well, which would be so very delightful, through the will force, you know, and concentration. But it isn't as easy as it sounds, not by any means. The other day I shut myself up in my bedroom and tried hard to meditate on the mystic rose. 
They recommend that, you know, in some of the books, and it, it is a very sweet idea, but I must say it did not seem particularly helpful. Nothing happened, and after a little time I went to sleep. You should ask Miss Tyrell to advise you, said Muriel, anxious to show the positive aspects of her new acquisition. She is a student of the old occultists. You know they practiced all these things under different names in the Middle Ages, for magic has a great deal to do with the psychology of the subconscious mind. Constance looked at the fluffy lady, aware that in the eyes of the angels the faint and delightful tints of her complexion were more of importance than many higher thoughts. She also noticed that Mrs. Reed had drawn near and formed part of a little circle that seemed to wait upon her words, she said. But I don't quite know why you should want to do these things. When you have done them, life will never be the same again to you. All its proportions will have altered, and you may not like it so well. You have so many worlds of your own that you can hardly miss the real world, which is the one that you have not got. When you have got it, all the others must go, and it is so simple that I think at first you might be rather bored. As for me, I had very little that was worth having in my world, and so I was tempted to explore. But you, she looked at them, at the eager circle of small-souled egotists, at Muriel, who said appealingly, Isn't she wonderful? And at the other women, who agreed without enthusiasm. She saw the little struggling scraps of life within these curious and fragile envelopes, tiny flames disguised and differentiated by the variety of their enclosing lamps. They all, as it seemed, took the lamps very seriously, forgetting that these were matters of artifice built up from the atmospheric gases and the substance of the earth, and that their inhabitants were alike sparks from the same central fire. But Constance was not allowed to forget it. That hawk-eyed lodger of hers pierced through the pretense and saw the poor bewildered flame struggling for air within its elaborate prison. The odd thing was that the crowd of little souls, some nearly smothered by the cobwebs that they had gathered round themselves, took no interest in each other, but only in each other's lamps. The polite life of the drawing-room was just that, the myriad inextinguishable flames disdaining their own immortal heat and radiance, feeding hungrily upon the illusions which caused them to mistake colored glass for divine flame. Constance finished her sentence. You can live your life, your dream life, if you choose, in all its richness, down to the bottom and up to the heights. That is very close to reality and the only satisfying thing, I am afraid. If you explore, all that you will learn will be the necessity of getting back there, if you can. How interesting, said Muriel in a slightly disappointed tone. The fluffy lady looked displeased and bewildered. Her pretty mouth was drawn into the beginning of a pout. But presently her face cleared, and she said triumphantly, I think I know what you must mean, exactly. A friend of mine had a baby through Christian science last year, so you see, it does all fit in. Everything fits in, observed Mrs. Reed solemnly, for the many are comprehended in the one. When Miss Tyra left, Andrew followed her into the hall, found her umbrella, and with more than his usual obtuseness asked whether she wanted a cab. I was wondering, don't you know, he said slowly. His mind rambled to the bookshop and back again to his own home. He wished to realize Constance in both situations, and found the idea difficult to deal with. Finally, he said, we must keep this up, eh? Capital plan, so good for Muriel. Change of society. These women, don't you know, are all alike. Constance answered, they all seem very different to me. Quite a new world. That's it. They're a little lot all to themselves. Don't seem to catch on to ordinary life somehow. It's been made too soft for them, I fancy. And they're mostly clever. Not that one minds clever women, but they ought to be given a toughish time. They're like boys. They need it. She smiled. 
Don't give Mrs. Vince a hard time. She's delicious. He seemed pleased. She has nice colouring, he said. I thought you would admire her, but these women never think of that. They come here because she lets them talk. Waste of a pretty girl, isn't it, to give her up to that sort of thing? Constance, who had been pursued all the afternoon by a longing to enjoy Muriel in peace without the disturbing follies of persons who were not pretty, agreed cordially. He would have continued the conversation, but Mrs. Reed appeared at the foot of the staircase. Andrew shook hands hastily and said, Mind you, look us up again, and retreated. Mrs. Reed came to the door and allowed the parlor-maid to cover her dress with a shabby alpaca dust-coat. She looked almost ordinary once her scarabs were concealed. Oblivious of this abrupt relapse into undistinguished dowdiness, she fixed her large and solemn eyes on Miss Tyrell's face and said, "'Shall we go a little way together?' When the door was safely closed upon them, she continued, "'I have been wishing to talk with you all the afternoon. I think this is your first visit, is it not? A delightful house.' quite a refuge for those who long for a more spiritual environment than that provided by modern civilization. Mr. Vince, of course, is very male, but one doesn't mind that. But today people were not as receptive as usual. You, for instance, were not understood. I see so well what you were trying to express to them. These foolish young women know nothing of the vast and secret forces with which they play. That's it, said Constance eagerly. But you and I, who know, whom neither the flux of time nor the wreck of dogma can disturb, we can safely accept the extended life that is offered to those who have seen the metaphysical lover face to face. She turned down a narrow lane beneath the high wall of a church, stopped at a vivid red brick portico named 230 to 315, and added, here is my little Irie. Will you not come in for a moment? I feel sure that we have much in common. The long climb up cemented and uncarpeted stairs, past distempered corridors, speckled with innumerable front doors that seemed to have strayed out of doll's house land to relieve the hygienic severity of germ-proof walls and fireproof flooring, concentrated the attention of both ladies on material things. They clutched the fronts of their skirts, husbanded their breath, and spoke little until Mrs. Reed inserted her latch-key in a Yale lock on the top floor. Then Constance said politely, How nice and airy you must be up here! And the watcher within muttered, You certainly make the dream as inconvenient as you can. It was with an almost conventional courtesy that Mrs. Reed now led her visitor into the single sitting-room of that little flat. Constance was not surprised to find whitewashed, rush carpet, a small cast of Isis nursing at the infant Horace, and a complete absence of tablecloths and other textile amenities. But she was slightly astonished when she perceived a very old and red-faced gentleman dozing by the small fire. A large blue Persian cat was folded into a compact parcel on his knee. The completeness of Mrs. Reed's personality, the authoritative position which she had seemed to occupy in Muriel's circle, had suggested a detachment from the more ordinary human relations. It seemed hardly credible that the metaphysical lover could suffer a domestic rivalry. Yet Mrs. Reed now approached the old gentleman, looked at him with profound interest and tenderness, and said, Dear, have you had a good afternoon? Eh, what? You back, my love? said the old man. Been gallivanting with your young friends, eh? Had a pleasant party? That's right. I'd like you to enjoy yourself. Ra and I had a quiet hour together. Very comfortable. In fact, I fancy we have both had forty winks. You must have your milk now, replied Mrs. Reed, and you will have to entertain Miss Tyrell whilst I get it. She said to Constance in a lower tone, Will you talk to my husband a little? It would be kind. He's rather deaf, but it will be all right if you articulate distinctly. My wife, said Mr. Reed to Constance when they were alone, is a dear good girl, very intelligent, as I dare say, you know. I'm proud of her. I like to see her friends come here. 
it shows that she is appreciated. It is very providential that she should have these interests, for we never had any family, and that's a sad misfortune for any woman. As I sometimes say, I have to be father, husband, and baby all in one. He chuckled with immense and senile enjoyment of this well-digested pleasantry. Mrs. Reed returned with hot milk in a feeding cup, helped him to take it, and said, That's a good old dear, as the last drop was neatly disposed of. My little Nell makes me quite lazy, murmured Mr. Reed, when the meal was over and his mouth had been wiped. His big head settled down again upon the shoulders, the loose baggy cheeks almost touching the lapels of his velveteen coat. His lips fell apart, and one saw that a few dark yellow stumps still remained in the sunken gums. His eyelids closed. A very comforting drop of milk, very comforting indeed, he said sleepily. Then the watcher cried suddenly and silently in his nest, Vile, vile, why feed the foul and useless body when it is beginning to decay? Let it go, let it die. Nourish the beautiful things. Constance, in horror, exclaimed, No, no, he said, why not? This bit of the dream is finished and done with. Why clutch it? Where is its value? Let it pass away and join the real. Oddly enough, the only reply which came to her mind was the word which Helen Reed had spoken. The many are comprehended in the one. It seemed inappropriate, as well as absurd, for it suggested a vital connection between ineffable beauty and the old man who was huddled by the fire. Nevertheless, she said it. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of The Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter Eight Two Sorts of Solitude. The Bird, a Nest. The Spider, a Web. Man, Friendship. Blake, Proverbs of Hell. One morning in the beginning of July, Andrew asked Miss Tyrell to go with him to the play and the forces of Thysistia and Bohemia went to war in her mind. Muriel had been placed upon the committee of the Psychodeistic League, and its annual meeting was to take place at her house. On these occasions, Vince always took refuge in musical comedy. He went, as a rule, alone, laughed without restraint at the horseplay jokes and topical songs, luxuriated in the vague emotions which were evoked by the more amorous passages, observed with understanding the physical charms of the performers. But this year, in one of those spasms of philanthropy which are indistinguishable from self-indulgence, he had conceived the notion of giving Constance a treat. He spoke of it to Muriel, who was depressingly tolerant but hardly encouraging. Miss Tyrell, she said, will scarcely care for your kind of theatre, will she? I had been thinking that next time there was anything good at the stage, I would give her your ticket. She's really very cultivated, you know. Girton, in fact, and she reads all the right things. The popular drama exasperates that type of mind. But you might ask her. It will be a kindness. And I can't have her here that evening. The inner circle meets, and only members are admitted. Andrew was a little grieved. He had hoped for a jealousy, which he would certainly have discountenanced, and the excessive breadth of Muriel's mind, in which he could not help seeing something slightly unwomanly, discounted the joys of the undertaking. But his spirits were raised when he perceived that Constance, at any rate, felt her decision to be governed by considerations of propriety. No male creature likes to feel harmless. Andrew's self-respect was stimulated by the fact that he had to persuade Miss Tyrell that the civility he offered was neither unusual nor objectionable in such a friendship as theirs. That friendship, founded on Vince's refreshingly materialistic point of view, had been confirmed by the addition of a new element, the hopeless determination in both of them to admire in Muriel all those fascinations which were most at variance with her intellectual claims. 
They talked like rival lovers of her beauty and disputed the supremacy of each feature over the rest. She was the unending subject of their conversation. Andrew had come to recognize the bookshop as the one place in which he might speak freely and enthusiastically of his wife, and Constance looked for his coming because he brought with him some of the glamour which hung about the aggravating object of their adoration. To her this was but the renewal of an experience which had been constant in her girlhood, that feverish and bewildering period in which the sonorous rhythms of the classics that she wished to love had seldom succeeded in drowning the throb of life that exasperated her nerves and confused her brain had been characterized by the savage and shamefaced emotion which she poured out unasked at the feet of certain chosen women her attitude towards them always shy and always passionate was seldom appreciated and never understood some had taken advantage of it and made demands on her these she had served with an almost tiresome eagerness so that they soon became indifferent to her affection Others had never perceived the existence of the sentiment. These she preferred, for she was able, in their case, to preserve her illusions intact. She proposed, if possible, to keep Mrs. Vince in this fortunate ignorance, an undertaking which was made easier by the presence of a fellow victim upon whom one could inflict the enthusiasms that might otherwise have become tediously apparent to their object. To these circumstances Vince owed the secure and comfortable position which he now occupied in her life. Few things seem safer than a platonic friendship, which is founded upon a conspiracy to admire the wife of one of the parties concerned. Constance then accepted Andrew's invitation, and to the amazement of the watcher, devoted a Saturday afternoon to the renovation of her only evening dress. He wished to be out in the sun seeing beautiful shapes, for nature appeared to him now as the one enticing aspect of the dream. Compared with this exploration of beauty, these magical encounters with the real, all other occupations seemed but foolishness, and he hated the necessity which made his every movement dependent on his entertainer's whims. Hence, when she paid no attention to his reiterated hints, disgust grew on him and there was a note of irritation in his remonstrances surely he said you must see the extreme absurdity of your behaviour that even on your own interpretation of the facts your actions are entirely inconsistent you shut yourself in a space that has no beauty in order that you may concentrate on dress dress how came you i wonder to think of that insane device she was busy. His comments distracted her. We do it, she answered rather angry, because we, also, like to add to outer beauty, if we can. Add to beauty? How can you add to beauty by these masses of queer and colored rags, spun from the poor patient plants and animals, and chopped to inconvenient shapes? Why, it is but more dust in different patterns, rolled round you in order to conceal the mysterious body underneath. A curious mania when all that matters is the soul, which is already assured of secrecy, which no one in the body can ever see. One body, I had thought, were enough disguise for the shyest spirit. Yet you must all, it seems, have two at least, and elevate the fashioning of the second to a very solemn thing but the result of this fashioning can never add to beauty, for it is meant to hide, not to express the real. Constance was intent on the lady's own magazine, which assured its readers that a very French effect might be secured by the application of two yards of black crepe de chine, and some spangled fringe to an old white satin bodice an operation which it described as well within the powers of the home worker. She was a woman. She was preparing for a probably delightful evening with her only friend. She was determined that he should have no cause to be ashamed of her appearance. It is therefore hardly surprising that she found the phenomena beneath her fingers more interesting than the inner witness to their unreality. She went on with her work, 
keeping one eye upon Vera, who showed a disposition to begin illicit doll's dressmaking at the other end of the crêpe de chine, and resolutely turning her attention from the fretful voice which urged on her its ignorance, its annoyance, and her duty of conciliation and enlightenment. But he would not let her be. He said again, I suppose that you are compelled to believe in your body, and this distresses you? And so you cover it with pretenses in which even you can hardly believe. Then, exasperated, she cried aloud, No, I am proud of it, I love it. I, at any rate, have never been ashamed. Vera loosed her end of the crêpe de chine, dropped the scissors and said reproachfully, Tante! How queer you shouted! You shouldn't! It made me jump! Constance was abruptly recalled to the consideration of a body in which it was certainly very difficult to take pride, for even when freshly washed and dressed in the clean clothes which she detested, Vera always carried with her a curious suggestion of squalor. She had hands which defied the nail-brush, and looked as though even her white pinafores had come to her by mistake. They never remained white very long, for dirt of all kinds flew to her, as if detecting congenial company. Miss Tyrell heard a regular liquid sound, as of surreptitious sucking, looked up, and exclaimed sharply, "'Take that stuff out of your mouth at once!' The child unwillingly extracted a dark and glutinous mass, composed of a rag of black silk, which had met a half-dissolved piece of toffee and become inextricably entwined with it. The resulting compound was not pleasant to handle, but it was necessary to take it from Vera and ensure its destruction, a proceeding which the victim watched with a sullen scowl. She seldom cried and never failed to resent authority. Constance, of late, had begun to detest these episodes. It was a part, perhaps, of the growing influence of the watcher, whose homesickness betrayed itself in a passionate aestheticism. The lens through which she had looked for an instant on reality offered no renewal of that vision, but it persistently magnified the hideous properties of those illusions to which she was chained. Upon this stifling afternoon, with the usual summer smells of London coming through the open window, the crooked Venetian blind moving in the draught and making zebra patterns on the shabby wall, this moist, chewy, gummy rag which she must take between her fingers nauseated her. When she had disposed of it, she felt that Vera's neighborhood had become loathsome. She gathered her work, went into the little bedroom, and gave herself with an almost morbid pleasure to the contemplation and analysis of her own fury of disgust. She perceived that she hated her life. Standing aside and looking at it, it seemed to her weary and distorted vision, a mere travesty of existence, an uneventful sequence of sordid material acts. The watcher encouraged this attitude, crying out on his incarceration, casting himself with fury against the bars. Sometimes he was interested, but happy he never was. Urged, then, as by a double spur, there came to her mind a momentary longing to renew the active revolt of her youth, when, stung not by squalor but by the hopeless inertia of the comfortable class, she had cut her way out of the garden and bartered all privilege for a little actuality. The crushed primeval spirit of adventure rose and pricked her. This capable wage-earning woman of thirty-five or so, reminding her of those wild raptures and wonderful deeps of existence which form part of the great and confused heritage of the human soul. Then the recoil wave came, bringing a memory of the savage tooth that waits behind those soft lips of nature whose kiss she had once accepted with courage, even with delight. Thence a venom had come which still worked in her life. That experiment was not worth repeating. The old white evening bodice slipped from her knee, and her indifference was so great that she did not put out her hand to save it. One of the bones which had cut its way through the covering sheath caught in a flounce of her skirt, 
it made a little tear and anchored itself. She rescued her work then, and it reminded her of the brightening margin of her life, of Andrew, who wanted her companionship, and of Muriel, whom she wanted even more. She possessed, after all, the essentials of existence, a little place in the dance, and a little opportunity of service. At a quarter to nine, upon the following Monday evening, Constance arrived at the Tottenham Court Road tube station, and took her place in the lift. Her depression had passed away. She felt happy and dreamy. After her long and sordid solitude, the mere putting on of evening dress was an excitement. It gave to her a curious sensation of well-being, armed her, as it were, for the encounter with life. As the platform rose, taking her to the surface, she contemplated in a mood of slightly cynical amusement the advertisements which covered its walls, appeals every one of them to the supposed needs of man. You cannot afford to do your writing the old way. You want our shirts? We want you. The new note, decorative smartness combined with the comfort of the home. The watcher, too, always entertained by our odd habit of burrowing, our quaint conceits as to the reality of levels, the air of importance which characterizes the running to and fro of modern men. The watcher looked on these things with pleased surprise, saying, strange cries of one immortal spirit to another. But there was another advertisement, less conspicuous, in little red and black letters, without ornament. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. It wore so modest an air amidst all the heraldry of trade that it would hardly have held Constance's attention had he not exclaimed, What's that? That is different. That is real. How has it got into the dream? The long, absent note of fear had returned to his voice, and he said, I'm caught. We all are. How can we be other than deceived? It is we that are mocked, hoodwinked, and made helpless. We stand in great danger, with none to advise us, no power of right judgment, no means of escape, and beyond the eternal idea and eternal seeking within it. O oh, cruel, treacherous, and blinding dream! The words in their simple frame glared out as from another dimension, and drew the great ring of eternity about the small illusions, the childish conveniences, the little scrambles and self-seekings of twentieth-century London life. They followed Constance and her lodger, indeed not truly one, but truly two, to the doors of the theatre. They obliterated the spiling portrait of Miss Sybil Selby as Evenette, the little Breton bride. They shone fierce and accusative under the arc lights and passed with them through the violently swinging doors which seemed themselves infected with some exalted and dramatic emotion. Thus they came at last to the corner opposite the box office where Vince awaited his friend. He said to her, Here we are. All ready for a ripping evening, eh? Jolly places. Stalls, fourth row, the nicest bit of the house. See everything you want to see, and nothing that you don't. I hate to notice the wigs and the rouge. Plenty of them outside in the street. Awfully good piece, too. I've seen it three times, and by Jove, I don't mind if I see it a dozen more. Nice voice, that girl's got. Sybil Selby. Dance as well. Neat ankles. Come along, it's time we were in our seats. The curtain rose upon The Little Breton Bride, upon a set which ingeniously utilized the caves of Quimper with their many little bridges and a strolling crowd of chorus girls in coifs. The orchestra struck up an airy, worldly waltz, and the hero and his party made a realistic entrance in a Demler 16-horsepower motor, whilst the chorus girls sang an amorous and cheerfully unmeaning intuat appropriate to the business of the night. At once they were in the thick of it, of the swirling, dancing, softly sensuous world. Rhythm and sentiment, cloying melodies and pretty passions were poured out upon the audience, producing in them an agreeable anesthesia of forgetfulness of all they held for real. Soon their dreamy minds were enchained by the deliberate measure of the dance, 
the monotonous cadence of the songs. They were at the mercy of those whom they had hired to amuse them, the eternal paradox of the arts. Yet the drugs with which the thing was done were very simple, merely coordinated sounds and movements expressing a gay and incoherent love-tale in which light affections triumphed and the deeps of life were carefully ignored. At the end of the first act, Andrew, cheered by Miss Tyrell's evident enjoyment, said to her, "'Hope you are liking it. Awfully good of you to come, you know. Just to a thing like this, nothing out of the ordinary. Muriel was afraid you might be bored.' Constance looked at him and at the glittering house with its air of sleek smartness, and then at the box of chocolates in her lap, and her mouth trembled a little. She was, for the moment, in the position of a protected woman, back amongst the foolish comforts and dear easy habits of a class that she had deliberately left. She answered, It is about eight years since any man waited on me, considered my pleasure, gave me sweets, so is it likely that I should be bored? Vince was genuinely shocked and affected. By Jove, he said, by Jove, poor girl! He had not supposed that bookselling entailed such social ostracism as this. Then he thought, with a little comforting spasm of self-sufficiency, I expect she is jolly particular about whom she does go out with. That explained it. Fatty women always get left in the lurch. The watcher, meanwhile, clamored for some explanation of the proceedings of the night, the lurid and untruthful simulation of an existence that was itself untrue, the crowd of attentive spectators looking eagerly at a false, distorted picture of their own false, distorted lives. This paradox of the drama was far beyond the understanding of a poor, uneducated spirit for whom even space and time were still foolish and puzzling conventions. If you really like these curious ways, he said, to dance and to sing when you wish to express your feelings, and to kiss one another a great deal, after all, this is not much more foolish than the ordinary ugly, earthly ways, why not? Do it yourselves instead of watching other people pretend. If this be your standard of beauty, do you not waste time in merely watching? Should you not participate while you can? Rush together, embrace, be ecstatic. Why delegate these picturesque emotions to a race of slaves? Life has strange rules, but this is the strangest, that you should be impelled to enjoy watching in imitation, in a corner, when you might go out and live the real before you die. At the end of the second act, the high-born hero had lifted his peasant bride into his motor-car and held her with one hand against his breast, whilst the other feebly grasped the steering wheel. He leaned over her with a realistic gesture of protection, singing, Dear little bride, through the world wide, I'll carry my dove in her nest. They may offer us gold or riches untold, but we know that true love is the best. The chorus girls tossed confetti in the air until Miss Sybil Selby, resplendent in lace coif and brocaded apron, seemed another Denia beneath its significant showers, and the curtain fell as the car moved slowly away to the plaintive and haunting music of violins. Then... Andrew turned and saw with astonishment a woman whom he had never known before, a being with softened eyes, absurdly entranced. The magnetism of the play had affected Constance. Her strained vision followed the ridiculous lovers. Her strained ear extracted from the sentimental music the regretful cry of all that she had missed in life. There was a lump in her throat. It was as if some magic power had been mingled with the confetti, pollen from the divine flower which grows upon the walls of might have been. She was invaded by a gentle, sensuous melancholy, by an absurd longing to be kissed. The disdain of reality, the rhythm of the dancers, the mildly voluptuous music came like an overpowering perfume to enchain her mind, so that the crude emotion of the lovers the simple insistence on happiness, on the joy and paramount importance of the mating instinct, stung to life, 
something that had long slept. All about them, triumphant sentimentalism was having its way. People leaned forward with shining eyes and slightly foolish smiles. The few detached persons who were amongst the audience enjoyed the ironic spectacle of a house full of prosperous, civilized, and artificial beings, tightly strapped, every one of them, within the uniform of society, each hair assigned to its place by inexorable law, responding in spite of themselves to an irrational and primitive appeal. In every part of the theater, woman, at the moment, looked at man. How odd, said the watcher, in order to make people natural, you are obliged to resort to artifice, so that is why you make a dream about the dream. But Constance took no notice. The burden of reality had been shifted. She was swept away into a joyous, absurd, bespangled country where her starved heart was fed upon emotional meringues and her aching senses were lulled and warmed. She sat thus for a moment or two, holding tight this lovely, selfless sense of wonder, of vivid and exalted life. Then Andrew rose and put her cloak about her shoulders, and she realized with a stab of sorrow that her evening was at an end. In him also, the feast of sensuous melody and mild emotion had woke a certain wistfulness. As they came into the foyer, and stood a few moments to let the crowd pass by, he said anxiously, It has been rather jolly, hasn't it? Do it again, eh? Constance looked at him, but did not speak. He continued in an abrupt burst of confidence. We are both a bit out of it, you know, in some ways, so it's natural enough we should be friends. She exclaimed, You shouldn't feel out of it. You are not alone in the world as I am. You have so many things to care for in your life. She spoke impulsively and was astonished at herself, but his answer astonished her more, he said. Yes, in a way, I know I seem to have, but then, you see, the things aren't really mine. I can't catch on. Don't fit. I'm rather like that Johnny in the Arabian Nights who went out to dinner and kept on seeing imaginary food he couldn't eat. Nicely dished up, one admires it, but one's hungry all the same. There's Muriel, she's adorable, and she's my wife, of course, but her life's stuffed full of other things. Very natural, she's clever, and I'm not. But she's fenced round by him, I can't get near. She's so young, said Constance gently, and so pretty and enjoying it so much. It must be rather nice to watch her being happy, and after all she is yours. Oh, it's not that. I don't mind her having a good time, lots of friends running about and so on. I'm not that sort of beast, harem type. Girls must play round, don't you know? One likes it. They all do it, not peculiar in any way, so where's the harm? Very different from what it was in my poor old father's time. But these women... They've got her into a shell of fads. One can't get past. And there she is all the time, attractive as ever, and just out of reach. It's a bit maddening. His voice had the growl in it now, and he spoke as if to himself, deliberately and without self-consciousness. There was no knowledge between them of the outrageous quality of their conversation. It had grown, as it were, out of the events of the night, his speech did not strike her as a complaint, a sin against the code of married men. It seemed rather an explanation which he was making to himself. She saw something, the essential man in him, the creature of ideals, struggling like a dumb animal against the circumstances of his life. The sight moved her to an almost maternal pity, so that she felt with him as well as for him when he said, One's growing older all the while, too, losing chances, getting fixed, and the whole thing is dreary and jangled up. There she is, as I say, pretty, fetching. People envy one. But we live in watertight compartments in our house. My fault. It's a silly mistake. Wish now I'd push things a bit at the start. Then there's the boy. 
bound to keep an eye on him, protect him a bit from the woman. And she doesn't like it, of course, so he's between us as well as the culture and things. That's the damnation of children, responsible for em, must do it. You wait till you have one. Constance blushed furiously, and Andrew, instantly contrite, apologized for the violence of his language and returned to his normal state of clumsy shyness. She said, Oh, don't be unhappy. Just be fond of them both. You might enjoy it all so very much. He replied, I am awfully fond, really. If I wasn't, don't you know, I shouldn't care. Fact is, I'm a bit lonely. It's just that. On my soul, I believe it always is that at the bottom. When we feel lonely, we're miserable, and when we don't feel lonely, we're not. Other things don't matter except when they make us notice that we're alone. Constance looked at him with moist eyes and answered, Yes, I believe it is just that. He would have driven her home, but she, with the prudence of intrepid and experienced people, refused it. Her landlady was a Puritan who slept in the basement and was easily disturbed. As they said good night, he asked anxiously, We're chums now, aren't we? She counter-questioned with, What do you want? Oh, just to come in and out, he said, with eagerness, talk a bit, you know, swap ideas. To be consigned, though it was of her own choice, to a green and yellow omnibus full of brisk and dingy people from the pit, to end the evening by a solitary return to her lodgings, where lights would be out and she must fumble for the chain of the front door. All this gave to Constance a foolish but poignant sense of isolation, of having missed fire in life. She saw from the window of the omnibus bareheaded women in exquisite cloaks leaning upon the arms of men who protected them and walking delicately beneath the great arcs of lights. There was something intimate in the relation of each couple. They carried with them a suggestion of romance. She was shut out from that aspect of existence, could only watch it with her own uncanny experience hugged tightly in her breast. At this moment she wanted it very badly, the prettiness, the protection, all the airy, fluffy way of taking things. The omnibus brought her to the tube station, and she sank into the burrow again, continuing automatically the cheap and undistinguished scurry to her cheap and undistinguished lair. But within the lift the real and dreadful words in their little frame awaited her. Be not deceived. The hard, inexorable quality of that eternity which is behind these illusory miseries and excitements struck her like a blow. She thought bitterly of Andrew's simple statement. One is growing older all the while. She ran forward along the years and came upon the final necessity of his death. Then she knew that even whilst she knelt at Muriel's shrine, she needed Andrew, and she hated that knowledge. Somewhere, somehow, even this, she supposed, had beauty and significance. But she was blinded, altogether overcome by her lassitude, by the reaction from the short and feverous evening. She, the brave lover of life, whispered with inward tears, I don't think I want to live any more. Then something within her exclaimed, Ah, do not be grieved. I cannot bear it. It is horrible. I think it gives me pain. Surely it were better to die than to be hurt by these little foolish things. Instantly and absurdly, the social instinct, the craving for sympathy, awoke. Constance turned on her inner companion and said, I'm alone, so dreadfully alone, I can't endure it. It was an astonished voice which answered, Alone? Is that what matters? Must you always, for your comfort, be linked up with other creatures? And is that why I do not understand? She was intent on her own wretchedness and did not reply, until presently, to her amazement, he said gently, Am I no use to you? Can I not help? Then she was conscious of a tiny inward revolution, and with it of the birth of some new thing. He said, I do not want you to be lonely. Ah, 
be happy again with the beautiful colors and shapes. Are these not sufficient for your joy? A strange pain has come between us. It pushes. Because of it, I want to help you if I can. Do not suffer. It is so horrible that you should have pain. She asked him with eagerness, Do you really care? He answered, Yes, I don't know why, but somehow I am sorry for your sadness. It hurts me, and I want you to be glad. And then, as in the glorious moment when he saw the shining tree, he added, I think that I begin to understand. Grateful for this strange and unexpected sympathy, companioned by it, she came home, crept up the dingy staircase to her room. She took off the evening dress slowly and wearily. Already the black crepe de chine looked crushed and sad. The blind was up. The window opened wide for coolness' sake. As she raised her eyes from a careful folding of the satin skirt, which might have to do duty many other times, she saw far up the mighty and eternal stars that peered through the summer haze. Again she had the sensation of a white and changeless ring set about her. Again she remembered the hateful incisive words that were set on the wall of the lift. Then both were obliterated by Andrew's figure, solid and imperturbable, fixed upon the margin of her life. The watcher had exclaimed in his bitterness, It is we that are mocked, hoodwinked, and made helpless. But now there was a grieving and strangely humanized voice which murmured, I am sorry for the sorrow of my friend. End of chapter 8Chapter 9 of The Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Chapter 9 The Road to Penrith and Other Places. Nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things, and though the last lights from the black west went, O oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs. Gerard Manley Hopkins As she fled through the colored counties under the steady radiance of an August sun, Constance had within her the astonished and friendly voice of the watcher, saying, See how the splendid trees stand up in the field. Ah, look at the curves, the lines, the incredible shapes. Open your eyes, look, look. Do not let so much of the beauty escape you. Your poor vague senses are letting it slip by. It is far too wonderful for that. Seize it. Feed on it. Use the best of your body whilst you can. She let him have his way with her, for she was bewildered and tired, and he, since his sudden awakening to the wonderful experience of pity, had cast off something of the arrogant inquisitiveness which had led him to drive her senses so remorselessly and exclusively in the interests of his own investigations. Now he offered her a share in his adventures. There had been a reversal of their positions, so that she was mainly conscious of looking through his nature at the world, and not as before of lending her eyes and her brain to his purposes. Her summer holiday had come, and she was out with a sense of wild freedom that hardly felt the body's weight scurrying through an incredible world. With a release from the monotony of work, there had come also a release from the craving for humanity. She threw it behind her, Andrew and Muriel, Helen Reed, who had lately made advances toward intimacy, and all the anodynes which she had clutched in her loneliness to lull the appetite for natural joy. She was eager to take up the heritage of sun and air, nestled in a corner of the third-class carriage, and let the pageant of England slip by her. As for the watcher, he saw for the first time with human eyes the most divine treasure of humanity, an earth not wholly smeared with toil, a fresh and flowery country of waving grasses set with solemn elms, of ripening harvest, rose-set hedges, and cropped downs. 
he and his friend cuddled together, looked joyously and dreamily into the sacred heart of living things. The black blur of leaves that takes from its neighboring fields the very color of hope, the entangled world of the west riding where Hellmouth seems to have broken out in a singularly inappropriate place, these moved them only to a gentle interest. He was invaded by a new spirit of tolerance, and she, very tired, felt something of that agreeable light-headedness which comes with a certain quality of fatigue. In the early afternoon they came to the frontiers of the north, the austere and stony country of Ribblesdale. The sun lingered south of them, in the more fertile and responsive midlands, and here there was a little cloud spread very thinly over the sky. In that cold, strong light, the rocks cropping here and there from the tight earth looked blue, pale, and curious. They forced themselves up from the grass with a menacing air which reminded man's body of its softness and instability. They seemed to be saying, Verily we are the people, remembering that when it came to the battle of the dust, St. Stephen was crushed back to primal earth, but the stones of martyrdom remained. Vera, head out of the window, said, I think those rocks are ghosts which growl at me. The watcher whispered, They are your mother and your father. From that womb you came out, and to that womb you will return, for dust is the foundation of the dream. The scamper of the train brought them through the land of stone and into the country of the pine woods, and Constance, looking with her friend at the shapes of dark trees against the brightening sky, found them charged with a terrible significance. They seemed the proper guardians of some immemorial secret, of an ancient land, a land of earth sorcery which the scumbling brush of man had hardly touched. Already London was far distant, already sanity, clear visions, and the healthy exultation of the hills began. She looked forward with great eagerness, having now obtained that sense of a door eternally ajar, which prepares the soul for romance, mystery, and all unreasonable truth. When at last the train stopped at their small and wind-swept station, she leapt out with a clear apprehension that some mighty and definitive destination had been reached. The place to which they had been brought was perched at the very margin of the fells. Those nude angels of the north dominated the little village, faint and wonderful shapes, lifted up from the business of earth, and running day by day the whole gamut of prophetic emotions, from the regal gloom of lamentations to the radiant expectation of Isaiah. Driven, perhaps, to opposition by their splendors, the sowing and reaping world which crept to their feet had a sharpness of detail that had put the most meticulous pre-Raphaelite to shame. The middle distance stood as distinct as some print by Dürer, with black woods and the stripe and check of fields and hedges. Each tree in the setting sun was a sharp, dark, insistent shape, one out of many scattered sentinels that seemed to guard the transfigured fells from the profane investigation of field-glass, camera, and exploring feet. Constance, her luggage safely bestowed and early supper ordered, walked along the high road which ran with prosaic straightness to Penrith, and saw this mighty panorama unrolled in its infinite detail. A weary London woman, tossed suddenly into this, may well feel a certain flutter of the heart, confronted by the stupendous sacrament of natural beauty, that spotless and ineffable host which earth, the Virgin Mother, eternally brings forth and offers an oblation on the altar of life. An ecstasy that was not wholly joy invaded her spirit, something she knew was being offered, something which her heart and work-worn hands could scarcely grasp, the watcher was hushed, and asked no questions, for curiosity cannot survive in the presence of awe. There was a hayrick in the neighboring field, its patient shape responsive to the play of slanting light. 
in the hedge by which they walked the sharp and eager fingers of a hawthorn were stretched out against the greenish sky its clean crisp edges were instinct with vitality and with beauty which is the spiritual aspect of intense life these leaves and behind them the teeming earth with all its children cried out for recognition to this sister of theirs this impassioned amateur of experience constance was glad with a vicarious vanity to think her mother so beautiful proud that she who was of the family might show to her visitor one of the lovelier moments of the dear earth as she lingered the sun first left the valley then crept from the summit of the hills at once the angels wrapped their blue veils around them being dazzled by the radiant sky where the game of green and rose color had already begun then the changeful play of the celestial opal immortally bright was offered for a moment as if to exhibit the true and natural darkness of the earth gazing at the magic funeral of the sun and caring little where she stepped constance's foot came sharply on some soft uneven thing that gave beneath it she moved quickly and vera forced by the gathering dusk who abandoned the quest for wild raspberries pounced and held up a few pitiful feathers kept together by that which had once been the wonder of flesh look she said what fun a dead bird you trod on it constance looked and felt bitterly grieved ashamed sickened by her own action absorbed in a selfish feeding upon beauty she had insulted that poor little memorial of a radiant life out of its corruption it rebuked her she turned from the sunset and the imperial hills that were putting on the purple mantle in which they greet the night clouds were coming to them now tall violet-gray battalions leaning towards their goal and observing a steady and unhurried march from the southwest they came and rested on the summit of the fell sank into the valleys and cast fleecy folds about the pikes behind them the purple angels muttered angrily they were preparing to pour forth cleansing waters on an unwilling world she walked back to the village and having her face set towards it where it spread itself with a northern amplitude and independence about its central green she saw it in its unity one or two lights appeared in the windows creating an instant opposition between the dark and eternal hills and this little transitory superficial patch of human habitation human dreams the hills the darkening fields were the more alive the more insistent they pressed on her attention the watcher whispered how they crowd about one at this hour she said what do you mean he answered those who came first it was she now who said i do not understand he replied but surely you know them surely you are with them if one must not be alone and if one must love it cannot be that you have only the soul still entangled in their bodies from whom to choose your friends she repeated i do not understand nevertheless fear outran comprehension he went on i see them on the hills how wild they are and how surprised at life their stones are there the little dusty marks that they erected and so they cannot get away your friends have made no mark they have not rubbed out the life that came before it mingles with them yet do you mean that they do not know do not see it just because the dusty covering is not here she asked are you talking of the dead she shivered a little for triumphant vitality hates to meet a ghost he answered why yes the liberated ones in your busy gobbling up of one another do you take no notice of the part you cannot slay to-night the liberated hosts are in the hills i see them at strange rites behind the hedges i hear their patter on the road oh the little antique spirits of slain children the mothers of the people the keepers of the herds they are here nothing is changed you have chased them from the cities or smothered them perhaps it may be that i am not sure 
because of this they are all the thicker about the immemorial valleys. They come down to drink at the changeless rivers they have always known. Here are battlefields. Here in these wide valleys they surge to and fro and rehearse the great drama of life. Troops of victorious souls that escaped from bleeding bodies under these hills and deep in the bracken which their hands tore up to staunch the cruel wounds. She answered, Yes, yes, of course, in a way the past is always with us. Not past, he said. The dead have no past. They live in the eternal now. It is progress. They are nearer to the real. These I knew first, before I had eyes to see the poor souls still imprisoned in their dust. They have gone on. They are the leaders of your army. Surely you acknowledge their presence. Surely you owe them your homage and your help. She was hastening towards the friendly houses now, for the twilight deepened and the conversation was little to her taste. They came past the low wall of the churchyard. A slab of new white marble peeped over the coping stone. She did not like it. It seemed a pale hand stretched out from the other side but he would not let her by. He broke his exhortation and asked her, What is that? she said. It is the graveyard, I suppose. He asked again, Is that where the worn-out bodies are put away? Then it occurred to her that the watcher had never seen a place of burial before, for London, the polite center of a secular civilization, is remarkable for its tactful concealment of the dead. The mind that is bred in the hills knows no such artifice. It is of the opinion of the ciliarist that it were ill to be unkind to a Jonathan, though in dust, and therefore holds fast to this the most intimate and pathetic keepsake of its emigrated friends. This church and its quiet company stood, as is their usual, at the entrance to the village, a gentle, uninsistent link between two worlds. With another step or two, they were at the lynch gate and saw the dim path which approached a plain doorway, then branched and skirted the wall of the nave. There had been here no artificial leveling of earth from its small eminences and dimpling hollows. The plain old gravestones peered with a gracious and natural effect, as if they were indeed at one with the land. Beyond the church, this land rose suddenly in a slope of rough grass unbroken as yet by the making of little homes. Clearly an upland field had lately been added to the graveyard in the interests of a generation yet to come. At its highest point a monolith shot up against the skyline, a strange, great, formless thing, growing as it were from the ground and bearing no resemblance to the civil futilities of the monumental mason and his art. Night was upon them, and already the grass was gray, the little village church vague in the dusk. Earth now seemed built of some primal stuff that existed in chaos before there was light. Constance, unnerved by the evening's conversation, would have hastened to sanctuary, but she felt the spur of her guest, who could not leave so great a matter unexplored. He quelled her natural desire for the neighborhood of houses and living things. And under his direction she scrambled and slipped in the twilight up the steep, dry, grassy slope. Coming to its summit, she saw a wider sky, where brightness lingered on the horizon line. Beneath it she divined the folded hills, knew that the deeper blackness hid the woods. She peered at the battered standstone pillar which had beckoned her to this solitary place, and saw that it was an armless cross, once covered, no doubt, with the plated patterns and lost symbols of the Celtic church, now only retaining upon its roughened surface a memory of the artifice of man. It stood upon a new pedestal, and in the step of the pedestal there was an inscription cut, although now the light was very nearly gone. She stooped, and with eye and finger traced the words. This runic cross, work of the first Christians of our land, was discovered in the foundations of the church. It is now again set up by the village which it once protected as a memorial of the nameless dead. 
the watcher remarked, I knew that you were mistaken. You see, they are remembered after all, or given a gathering place. The night breeze had sprung up and blew from the hills upon the churchyard. It seemed to Constance's fancy that the wind was full of life, antique, barbaric life, the life of those old Christians of the hills, that they were coming to a trysting place, and that the watcher already discerned them. There were more words upon the pedestal, and though her instinct was all for the village and humanity, she made haste to decipher them that she might the sooner be gone. They seemed lacking in flavor after that which went before, and she deplored the uncertainty of clerical taste, even when it is combined with a passion for archaeology. By thy precious death and burial, good Lord, deliver us. It was only a fragment from the litany. She could not be impressed, but the watcher's comment on those words struck her as peculiar. He said, so the idea did once break through, and yet you do not understand. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 How Those Who Lose Themselves Often Find Something More Valuable That light did lead me on, more surely than the shining of noontide, where well I knew that one did for my coming bide, where he abode, might none but he abide. St. John of the Cross, The Dark Night of the Soul Nothing would do but they must go, all three of them, into the heart of the fells and qualify the distant glamour of the familiar touch. The village produced a rough cart and a short thick pony of the kind that embarks willingly upon cross-country exploration, and they were off in the vivid afternoon, through the tangle of dark woods and bright cornfields which lay between them and the road that runs along the hills. There was a little stirring breeze, and the pale green barley danced in the wind with a delicate airy ecstasy as they passed, so that the watcher, in his nest, reached out to this new loveliness with a gesture that was almost adoration. The oats faintly blue with aquamarines, seemed of a more sober habit, they made minuet steps with tiny tossings of the head. The deeper blue of the turnip fields brought inappropriate hints of the wild ocean to the least idyllic processes of agriculture. Behind, the stately hills marched with them, on one hand the sharp lake mountains, on the other the fells. Presently they plunged to the lowest point of the valley, a little breathless, I think, because of their apprehension of the beauty that they might find. For this was a wonderful day on which anything might happen and the least credible of discoveries might be made. They swung through space on a jeweled planet, and it was for them that the caskets were flung open and the secret gems disclosed. They crossed the beck where it ran through deep hayfields to the river beyond, a little eager splashing thing called all other children to join in its play. There was a heavenly inflorescence at its margin, all made up of those very simple plants which are too dignified and too beautiful to compel the casual eye. It was the watcher who called his friend's attention to the dear golden fluff of yellow bedstraw and to the woundwort and betony standing up like purple spears in the soft grass. Then, because her eyes were directed to that marvellous and incomparable population, she saw with his delight to help her vision the dyer's greenwood, disowned plantagenet, and the towering wild angelica whose mighty branches hint of old forests made of flowering things. And since respectability is no more the norm of hedges than of human life, she saw also the ivory crown of the meadow-sweet that fascinating child of joy whose daintiness in the eyes of the marigolds is very certainly the measure of her sin. There they were, in their essential reality, their unsullied radiance, matter for the exploration of many eons tossed into the pageant of one sunny afternoon. Because he was unaffected by man's arrogant standard of size, 
the watcher was at once satisfied and subjugated by this luxuriant outpouring of beauty. It woke the slumbering virtue of humility and washed his eyes so that he caught, as it were, a sidelong glimpse of God. It was a definitive hour for both of them, this first sight of the flowered meadows of the north. There, life clothes herself in haste and rushes out to meet the sun in her short moment of fertility. And hence the significant personalities of the plants assert themselves as nowhere else in the full splendor of their triumphant individuality. They blaze forth and hit the heart which opens itself to receive that holy wound. They climbed from the valley to dusty roads that ran between stone walls. There they saw the Lady of the Hills, the great wild Cranesbill, lifting her blue pattern to the sky. Constance began to wonder why she had so long neglected the easy and perfect friendship of the flowers. It raised the heart to some lucent and gentle plane of being, beyond the fevers and anxieties of human intercourse. So dreaming, she allowed the pony to ramble at loose, rain among the tangled roads. Life seemed divine. The future mattered little. She was invaded by the consciousness of heavenly peace. Vera had left the cart to make dashes into hedge, ditch, and by-path, clutching vainly at scuttling beetles and nimble flies. She was at her best under these circumstances of action. There the animal aspect seemed in place, and nature justified the coarse and tireless frame. They came presently to a gap in the stone wall and a wheel-track that went, as it seemed, directly to the fells. Constance, who had the Londoner's shadowy belief that all roads lead, somehow, to the right way, divined in this byway the shortcut which her landlord had described to her as going back toward the village by way of the hills. She turned the cart into the short rough grass, and they trundled slowly in and out of ruts, and through gates, and by deep dark bracken that stretched clawing fingers up the side of the sage-coloured hill. Soon they were a long way from all roads and other memories of civilization, being, indeed, upon an outpost of the fells. The sun sloped, twilight began to come, but there was no hint in their vague and wandering path of a return to human habitations. The pony lost his eager and exploratory manner. He lingered and stopped doubtfully. The sun went, and a chill came to the air. Then Vera, a little way ahead, stopped to cry, Tanta, make the pony come quicker. He's going dreadful slow. It's dark and nasty, and I want my tea. Constance answered, I'm afraid he is getting tired and wants a rest. Vera said with petulance, Horrid little horse. He shan't be tired. He's ours. He got to go. I want my tea. Then Constance, dragged back to the unlovely cares of common sense, halted, looked round, and noticed for the first time their solitary position, the woman and child and the weary little animal, with the great and pathless earth stretching from them on every side, rough, billowy, and very desolate. She forgot that they had come but a few miles from the road. She had no knowledge of the quarter in which the destination lay. She did not mind, for they had achieved the object of their expedition hidden in the hills. Already ancient mysteries peeped from the stunted bushes, whispering fragments of the primeval ritual of the wild. Anything might stir and rise suddenly in the break, for if conscious life were concealed there, it was a life, she felt sure, far removed from the human plane. The watcher said, It is well to be here. One discerns again the music of the stars. Her peaceful heart repeated, It is well. She was brought to a new place, immersed in a new experience, and that contented her. But Vera was not content. She flung herself into the cart, crying querulously, Do let us go home. I'm tired. I want my tea. I think it is a very nasty drive. Then Constance suggested to the pony, that his respite was at an end, but the encouraging rain and very gentle lash had no effect on his tired limbs and stubborn mind. 
he hung his head and planted his feet more firmly on the ground. She said, I am afraid we must let him rest a little more. Vera stamped her foot and cried, I won't! I shan't! I hate him! I want to go home, to my tea! She dashed from the cart and into the bracken, snatched a loose stick which lay there, and hit the wearied pony with all her angry strength across its ears. It leapt forward, and Vera jumped into the rocking cart, crying gaily, There! He only wanted hitting. I knew I'd make him go. The pony went indeed, a poor, bothered, fevered thing, blindly and without sense of direction. It ran with a sort of convulsive strength, with miserable shudderings and settings back of ears. So they were flung into hollows and up little hills, jerked this way and that. Constance had the reins, but her strength was no match for a frightened moorland pony who sensed the neighborhood of the fell. She put her arm firmly about Vera and resigned herself to the event. During a period that seemed infinite, the cart raced through the twilight, tilting, leaping, twisting, but by some miracle never overturned. They fled past a swift dissolving vista of immense gray fields, looming trees and shadowy corners, and past a sudden black pine wood, a thing of terror in the dusk. Far off they saw white roads that rushed from an invisible highway into the heart of a dim, failed land. Far up they saw the fell, but they were caught in the debatable land between the two, and in this situation there seemed for them no hope. Then one of the great limestone boulders that push out from the earth on the lower slope stood suddenly in their path, and the dazed and worried pony could not elude it. Almost before the peril reached their minds, one wheel met the obstacle with a crash. The cart tried to mount it, failed, tottered, and was overturned. Constance and the child half leapt, half tumbled from the low seat to the ground. There they lay, huddled in a bewilderment that excluded the more natural sensations of despair. Amidst a litter of broken shafts, a wheel torn from its axle, and a pony which was kicking its way to freedom as quickly as it might. Constance rose, shook herself, and examined Vera. Routine took charge of her, and she acted without thought and therefore with decision. The child was sobbing with fear, anger, and fatigue, but she was unhurt. Constance, suddenly alert to the realities of the situation, said to her, Stop crying, get up quickly. It's nearly dark, and we have got to find our way home. She went to the crestfallen and panting pony, extricated his limbs from the entangled harness, took a handful of bracken, and rubbed him down. She said to Vera, I'm going to put you on the pony. Don't be frightened. Hold tight, and let him go the pace he likes. You will have a lovely ride, just like a grown-up lady, and we shall soon find a cottage to get tea. She dared not to ask herself yet in which direction she should go to find it, or what were her chances of success, for their course had been a twisted one with doubling to and fro and the tracing of wild circles, and she had no knowledge of the sky to help her. At this instant the voice of the watcher said urgently, The light! We must go to the light. Then she looked up and saw with deep thankfulness a little sharp star that had flashed into being and shone low down in the hills. Unquestionably it called to them, offering at least a certainty of human life, it was no great matter to quiet the pony, and place Vera upon his back. She did it, and set out to wander up the pathless fell without any sensation of anxiety. She was still sustained by the mystic's delightful conviction that nothing really matters in the least. "'What funny little things happen to us,' said the watcher, "'and what infinite shades of experience you have packed within the limits of this dream.' I like these dark and lonely places where the foolish, bustling people never come. She might have agreed with him, for indeed the wild and darkling earth about them cried messages of wonder to the eager mind. But the vague and crescent miseries of a cross-country walk, unwillingly undertaken in the dusk, quelled her thirst for adventure. She was hardly in training, and sooner than she had thought it possible she grew breathless, Breathlessness brought in its train indifference, fatigue, at last, exasperation. 
the approach to the light was very long. As they went, it seemed to retreat from them into the bosom of the hills. It led them upwards with many miserable slippings and scramblings on the dried heather, sudden sinkings into bracken and clambering up harsh and disconcerting stones to a saucer-like valley scooped out from a spur of the fell. There its presence seemed to create a greater darkness, a terrible and mysterious gloom. There were two little hillocks at the entrance, guarding perhaps the citadel of some primeval and inhuman life. The watcher whispered, Press on, press on, we are drawing very near. He was like a hound upon the scent, eager, excited, but she could not respond. She stood dissociated from him at this moment, and felt the lonelier for his evident air of being at home. She was invaded, too, by a panic terror for there was nothing in her past experience which could help her in dealing with the circumstances of this hour. A hare sat sentinel on one of the little hillocks. It moved as they came up to it, and Vera screamed. That scream made their condition seem unsafe, but they plodded on. When they were come a little farther, they saw beyond the saucer-like valley a narrower crevice in the hill, and within it the dark shape of a building and the slit of radiant window which had been their guiding light. It was the child, sharp-eyed, who exclaimed with a sob of rage and hunger, Oh, Tanta, how perfectly hateful! It's only a church, after all! Constance, then, was aware of a certain sinking of the heart and a sense of helplessness, a distrust of her situation, which the unpeopled hills had been powerless to induce. The fears of the traveller faded before the fears of the lost. Man had been there and left his mark, and was a hieroglyphic that she had no skill to read. But the watcher still cried, Go to the light, it is real, it calls us. You cannot, you must not retreat. That drove her on, and she led the pony up the last slopes of heather to the little limestone chapel which stood solitary on its knoll. There was a sudden uprising of shadowy grey forms from under the wall as they came to it, and a hoarse cry and a scuttering in the dusk which jarred her weary nerves, and brought strange choking sensations to her throat. Then the frightened sheep ran toward the hills, and they were again alone. The door of the place was shut, and through the keyhole that mysterious light looked out on them. She was past further adventure and when her first casual exploration failed to discover the latch of the door, she abandoned it. The watcher murmured, This is a place of safety, all is well. But her heart did not echo his words. Because there seemed nothing else to do, she lifted Vera from the depressed and weary pony. It rambled a yard or so away, stopped and began to crop at the short grass. Presently it turned the corner of the church and disappeared. A man came out from the lean-to cottage which was concealed at the little church's eastern end. When he saw the bridled pony, he was surprised. He went quickly towards the entrance, with such rising feelings of anger and distress as might possess a lover whose secret lair was suddenly unmasked. When he was come round the northwest angle, he saw a figure that sat upon the threshold of the chapel and leaned against the door. He perceived it to be the form of a very weary woman and a remark about damned tourists died stillborn. Instead, he approached and said to her very gently, That is Lancelot's attitude, but won't you come inside? The watcher took Constance's lips for his own purposes and whispered, Yes. Vera exclaimed with petulant relief, Oh, here's a man, how lovely! Tante, do ask him if we can't come in and have some tea. The man said, Poor child, of course you shall be fed. And then he put his hand to an inconspicuous boss, pressed it, and opened the church door. He held it and allowed Constance to pass him, followed her, and knelt upon the ground, an act which at once made Miss Tyrell feel awkward and obtrusive. But before she had time to digest these unpleasant emotions, an amazing thing happened. A force stronger than herself brought her, too, to her knees and to an act of profound though involuntary adoration. She knew not what she worshipped, but knew that worship she must. The hushed voice of the watcher whispered within her, 
it is the idea. She could not rise. She forgot to be self-conscious. She knew only that her weariness was strangely healed. When she had knelt with bowed head for a few moments, feeling the unseen waves beating upon her brow, she looked up and saw that she was in a plain and oblong chamber, built of rough stones and floored with beaten earth. There were in it no pews, no place for priest and choir, none of the customary conveniences of piety. Hence the attention, undistracted, ran straight to the essential point, to the one object which lifted the sanctuary from a squalid desolation to an ordered austerity. There was at the eastern end a little table, and on it a red brocaded cloth, heavy like a pole, and touching the ground. This table bore no crucifix, no flowers, no candles, so that Constance said to herself, if this place is Church of England, it must be very low. But on the simple altar there was a curious metal case, a silver inlaid with plated patterns, angels, and mysterious animals, whose wings were made of enamels, gems, and gold. The doors of it stood open, so that one looked within as into a little shrine. Inside there was a rough glass cup without a base, and with one clumsy handle. A kitchen teacup might have provided its model, but not the strange sheen of purple, black, and gold which ran through the glass. With sudden and inappropriate memories of South Kensington, she said to herself, Phoenician, I am sure of it. But what is it doing here? Then she perceived that this antique vessel was the thing to which she knelt, the link with eternity which her lodger adored. Even whilst she fought its influence and speculated upon its meaning, it cast its spells upon her soul. There was nothing else within the chapel, unless it were the lighted wick in its clay saucer which had guided them to this place. Centuries slid from her, and she found herself united to the primitive worship of the hills. Outside in the dusk, those hills and their inhabitants were gathering, brooding above the chapel, as if they would guard its enigmatic treasure from the peering vision of the modern world. Within, she, a daughter of that world, little suited to such company and such rites, knelt with a man and a spirit who had been caught into some ecstatic and unheard-of communion by a symbol which only invoked in her the vague sensations of wonder, of desire, and of unrest. She glanced at the man, he still knelt at her side and had clearly forgotten that she was there, a circumstance which contradicted all that she knew of human life. He gazed at the glass cup with an ardent love, which was without a taint of fatuousness. His glance pierced through it to something beyond, clearly seen and intimately known. He was young, spare, vivid, superbly alive. There was a sudden shriek from the doorway behind them, and Vera cried in panic, Oh, get up and speak to me quick! Tanta, it's lonely, it's queer! There's dreadful boogies in the hills! I, I hate your nasty prayers! I want my tea! He instantly rose to his feet and said, Come, we are forgetting. There's the child to be fed. She followed him from the chapel with an unwillingness that she could not understand. When they were in the two-roomed cottage and he was cutting bread and setting milk to boil, he said to her, You are the first that has come. She replied, We lost our way and wrecked the cart, and then we saw your light upon the hill. He said, That may have been the manner of it, but it could not be the cause. And because she looked at him strangely, he added, Surely you know what it is you have seen tonight? She answered, No but I think it was real and mattered very much. Real, he said? I should think so. In the last resort, it is our earnest of the only thing that matters, the transcendent link with reality. You, no less than Parsifal, have looked upon the Holy Grail. She gazed at him in amazement, and the feeble voice of common sense muttered that he must certainly be mad, or at least a hysteric of the religious type. He caught her eye, laughed at her, and said, Oh, yes, of course all-knowing people would think I was insane, but you cannot, because you knelt down. I didn't do it on purpose. All the better. That counts one to us. To us? 
Yes, to the angel's side, she said tentatively, for of course it might be desirable to humor him. Oh, but it can't be, you know, at least not really. It's absurd, incredible, and besides, how could you possibly be sure? There was an alarming note of obstinacy in his reply. No one can doubt who has experienced the power of great relics, and this is the mightiest relic of them all. And besides, there is tradition, and I am those who hold that tradition may be misread, but cannot lie. Here, you know, in the Westmoreland hills, was the last stronghold of the Celtic church. Here my predecessors in her priesthood lingered with their treasures and their rites, long after Italian bishops came to the north, and the Isle of Saints was saintless, and the great monastic hives had been dispersed. With them was hid, adored, kept safe, the lost key of the Middle Ages, that grail which was sought by all the chivalry of God, sought mystically, and also sought actually, because of the undying tradition of its loss. But now? But now, he exclaimed, it was given to me, me, the meanest of its lovers, to find, hold, and cherish. Never mind how. Grace did it, and that is enough. Has any man of our generation a dearer destiny, do you think? I am permitted to stand sentinel between it and a world that would not understand. We must keep our realities safe where we are able, from moth and rust, from thieves that break in and steal, worse, from possible museums. There are certain things spread up and down the world, you know, which enshrine the only secret and keep it safe. These are the most sacred of all trusts, and all who have eyes to see them are born to their guardianship. Some are in good hands. Others are of such a nature that they cannot be perceived by those who do not love, and therefore they will never be profaned. But some are known only at their own peril. I have brought one such here to hide it. It is safe in the bosom of our hills, in the nest which has hid it so long. He went to a cupboard, brought cups and plates, and gave them warm milk, bread and butter, and oat cake. Miss Tyrell looked at the little neat commonplace cottage, and then at this eager man with hot blue eyes who spoke the language of fairyland with fervor and conviction. Side by side with her rebellious reason, the spirit of the watcher looked out on this new slice of experience, and he, she perceived, had left his perennial aspect of astonishment. He seemed as one who, sojourning in barbarous lands where all is bizarre and difficult to accept, suddenly hears the dear accents of home. More, hears something, someone, whose presence in that home had long been desired, long needed, but never attained. They were within the field of some mighty and spiritual magnet whose powers transcended time and space. She had always eluded dogma with an agility which she doubtless owed to her excellent education. But here, in this crevice of the hills, was something which she could not elude. The watcher cried in ecstasy, The real, the real! She raised her head with the gesture of a trapped and frightened thing, and again the man laughed. Tiresome, is it not, he said, but inevitable, I assure you, you had better acquiesce. The finger of God is not to be escaped. It pursues, it caresses, it touches where it will. It was the old and hateful message, God is not mocked. He was not. He had met her in the city. He had chased her to the hills. He waited, inexorable, behind the veil. Here there was a rent in that veil, and through it a hand was stretched forth, which offered her a gift. She was too far away to see the wound upon that generous hand, and as for the gift, a woman of her superior intelligence could only look upon it as the fruit of a fantastic, even perverse, imagination. It was merely a cup of rough glass, curiously iridescent and stained with the colors of an imperial grief. End of chapter 10
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. How those who lose themselves often find something more valuable. That light did lead me on, more surely than the shining of noontide, where well I knew that one did for my coming bide, where he abode might none but he abide. St. John of the Cross, The Dark Night of the Soul Nothing would do but they must go, all three of them, into the heart of the fells and qualify the distant glamour of the familiar touch. The village produced a rough cart and a short thick pony of the kind that embarks willingly upon cross-country exploration, and they were off in the vivid afternoon through the tangle of dark woods and bright cornfields which lay between them and the road that runs along the hills. There was a little stirring breeze, and the pale green barley danced in the wind with a delicate airy ecstasy as they passed, so that the watcher in his nest reached out to this new loveliness with a gesture that was almost adoration. The oats faintly blue with aquamarines, seemed of a more sober habit, they made minuet steps with tiny tossings of the head. The deeper blue of the turnip fields brought inappropriate hints of the wild ocean to the least idyllic processes of agriculture. Behind, the stately hills marched with them, on one hand the sharp lake mountains, on the other the fells. Presently they plunged to the lowest point of the valley, a little breathless, I think, because of their apprehension of the beauty that they might find. For this was a wonderful day, on which anything might happen, and the least credible of discoveries might be made. They swung through space on a jewelled planet, and it was for them that the caskets were flung open, and the secret gems disclosed. They crossed the beck, where it ran through deep hayfields to the river beyond, a little eager splashing thing that called all other children to join in its play. There was a heavenly inflorescence at its margin, all made up of those very simple plants which are too dignified and too beautiful to compel the casual eye. It was the watcher who called his friend's attention to the dear golden fluff of yellow bedstraw and to the woundwort and betony standing up like purple spears in the soft grass. Then, because her eyes were directed to that marvellous and incomparable population, she saw with his delight to help her vision the dyer's greenwood, disowned plantagenet, and the towering wild angelica whose mighty branches hint of old forests made of flowering things. And since respectability is no more the norm of hedges than of human life, she saw also the ivory crown of the meadowsweet, that fascinating child of joy whose daintiness in the eyes of the marigolds is very certainly the measure of her sin. There they were, in their essential reality, their unsullied radiance, matter for the exploration of many eons, tossed into the pageant of one sunny afternoon. Because he was unaffected by man's arrogant standard of size, the watcher was at once satisfied and subjugated by this luxuriant outpouring of beauty. It woke the slumbering virtue of humility, and washed his eyes so that he caught, as it were, a sidelong glimpse of God. It was a definitive hour for both of them, this first sight of the flowered meadows of the north. There, life clothes herself in haste and rushes out to meet the sun in her short moment of fertility. And hence the significant personalities of the plants assert themselves as nowhere else in the full splendor of their triumphant individuality. They blaze forth and hit the heart which opens itself to receive that holy wound. They climbed from the valley to dusty roads that ran between stone walls. There they saw the Lady of the Hills, the great wild Cranesbill, lifting her blue pattern to the sky. Constance began to wonder why she had so long neglected the easy and perfect friendship of the flowers. It raised the heart to some lucent and gentle plane of being, beyond the fevers and anxieties of human intercourse. So dreaming, she allowed the pony to ramble at loose, rain among the tangled roads, 
life seemed divine the future mattered little she was invaded by the consciousness of heavenly peace vera had left the cart to make dashes into hedge ditch and by-path clutching vainly at scuttling beetles and nimble flies she was at her best under these circumstances of action there the animal aspect seemed in place and nature justified the coarse and tireless frame they came presently to a gap in the stone wall and a wheel-track that went as it seemed directly to the fells constance who had the londoner's shadowy belief that all roads lead somehow to the right way divined in this byway the short cut which her landlord had described to her as going back toward the village by way of the hills she turned the cart into the short rough grass and they trundled slowly in and out of ruts and through gates and by deep dark bracken that stretched clawing fingers up the side of the sage-coloured hill soon they were a long way from all roads and other memories of civilization being indeed upon an outpost of the fells the sun sloped twilight began to come but there was no hint in their vague and wandering path of a return to human habitations the pony lost his eager and exploratory manner he lingered and stopped doubtfully the sun went and a chill came to the air then vera a little way ahead stopped to cry tante make the pony come quicker he's going dreadful slow it's dark and nasty and i want my tea constance answered i'm afraid he is getting tired and wants a rest vera said with petulance horrid little horse he shan't be tired he's ours he got to go i want my tea then constance dragged back to the unlovely cares of common sense halted looked round and noticed for the first time their solitary position the woman and child and the weary little animal with the great and pathless earth stretching from them on every side rough billowy and very desolate she forgot that they had come but a few miles from the road she had no knowledge of the quarter in which the destination lay she did not mind for they had achieved the object of their expedition hidden in the hills already ancient mysteries peeped from the stunted bushes whispering fragments of the primeval ritual of the wild anything might stir and rise suddenly in the break for if conscious life were concealed there it was a life, she felt sure, far removed from the human plane. The watcher said, It is well to be here. One discerns again the music of the stars. Her peaceful heart repeated, It is well. She was brought to a new place, immersed in a new experience, and that contented her. But Vera was not content. She flung herself into the cart, crying querulously, do let us go home i'm tired i want my tea i think it is a very nasty drive then constance suggested to the pony that his respite was at an end but the encouraging rain and very gentle lash had no effect on his tired limbs and stubborn mind he hung his head and planted his feet more firmly on the ground she said i am afraid we must let him rest a little more Vera stamped her foot and cried, I won't, I shan't, I hate him, I want to go home to my tea. She dashed from the cart and into the bracken, snatched a loose stick which lay there, and hit the wearied pony with all her angry strength across its ears. It leapt forward, and Vera jumped into the rocking cart, crying gaily, There, he only wanted hitting, I knew I'd make him go. The pony went indeed, a poor, bothered, fevered thing, blindly and without sense of direction. It ran with a sort of convulsive strength, with miserable shudderings and settings back of ears. So they were flung into hollows and up little hills, jerked this way and that. Constance had the reins, but her strength was no match for a frightened moorland pony who sensed the neighborhood of the fell. She put her arm firmly about Vera and resigned herself to the event. During a period that seemed infinite, the cart raced through the twilight, tilting, leaping, twisting, but by some miracle never overturned. They fled past a swift dissolving vista of immense gray fields, 
looming trees and shadowy corners, and past a sudden black pine wood, a thing of terror in the dusk. Far off they saw white roads that rushed from an invisible highway into the heart of a dim, failed land. Far up they saw the fell, but they were caught in the debatable land between the two, and in this situation there seemed for them no hope. Then one of the great limestone boulders that push out from the earth on the lower slope stood suddenly in their path, and the dazed and worried pony could not elude it. Almost before the peril reached their minds, one wheel met the obstacle with a crash. The cart tried to mount it, failed, tottered, and was overturned. Constance and the child half leapt, half tumbled from the low seat to the ground. There they lay, huddled in a bewilderment that excluded the more natural sensations of despair. Amidst a litter of broken shafts, a wheel torn from its axle, and a pony which was kicking its way to freedom as quickly as it might. Constance rose, shook herself, and examined Vera. Routine took charge of her, and she acted without thought and therefore with decision. The child was sobbing with fear, anger, and fatigue, but she was unhurt. Constance, suddenly alert to the realities of the situation, said to her, Stop crying, get up quickly, it's nearly dark and we have got to find our way home. She went to the crestfallen and panting pony, extricated his limbs from the entangled harness, took a handful of bracken, and rubbed him down. She said to Vera, I'm going to put you on the pony. Don't be frightened, hold tight, and let him go the pace he likes. You will have a lovely ride, just like a grown-up lady, and we shall soon find a cottage to get tea. She dared not to ask herself yet in which direction she should go to find it, or what were her chances of success, for their course had been a twisted one with doubling to and fro and the tracing of wild circles, and she had no knowledge of the sky to help her. At this instant the voice of the watcher said urgently, The light! We must go to the light! Then she looked up and saw with deep thankfulness a little sharp star that had flashed into being and shone low down in the hills. Unquestionably it called to them, offering at least a certainty of human life, it was no great matter to quiet the pony, and place Vera upon his back. She did it, and set out to wander up the pathless fell without any sensation of anxiety. She was still sustained by the mystic's delightful conviction that nothing really matters in the least. "'What funny little things happen to us,' said the watcher, "'and what infinite shades of experience you have packed within the limits of this dream.' I like these dark and lonely places where the foolish, bustling people never come. She might have agreed with him, for indeed the wild and darkling earth about them cried messages of wonder to the eager mind. But the vague and crescent miseries of a cross-country walk, unwillingly undertaken in the dusk, quelled her thirst for adventure. She was hardly in training, and sooner than she had thought it possible she grew breathless, Breathlessness brought in its train indifference, fatigue, at last, exasperation. The approach to the light was very long. As they went, it seemed to retreat from them into the bosom of the hills. It led them upwards with many miserable slippings and scramblings on the dried heather, sudden sinkings into bracken and clamoring up harsh and disconcerting stones to a saucer-like valley scooped out from a spur of the fell. There its presence seemed to create a greater darkness, a terrible and mysterious gloom. There were two little hillocks at the entrance, guarding perhaps the citadel of some primeval and inhuman life. The watcher whispered, "'Press on, press on, we are drawing very near.' He was like a hound upon the scent, eager, excited, but she could not respond. She stood dissociated from him at this moment and felt the lonelier for his evident air of being at home. She was invaded, too, by a panic terror, for there was nothing in her past experience which could help her in dealing with the circumstances of this hour. A hare sat sentinel on one of the little hillocks. It moved as they came up to it, and Vera screamed. That scream made their condition seem unsafe, but they plodded on. When they were come a little farther, they saw beyond the saucer-like valley a narrower crevice in the hill, 
and within it the dark shape of a building, and the slit of radiant window which had been their guiding light. It was the child, sharp-eyed, who exclaimed with a sob of rage and hunger, "'Oh, Tanta, how perfectly hateful! It's only a church, after all!' Constance, then, was aware of a certain sinking of the heart, and a sense of helplessness, a distrust of her situation, which the unpeopled hills had been powerless to induce. The fears of the traveller faded before the fears of the lost. Man had been there, and left his mark, and was a hieroglyphic that she had no skill to read. But the watcher still cried, Go to the light, it is real, it calls us. You cannot, you must not retreat. That drove her on, and she led the pony up the last slopes of heather to the little limestone chapel which stood solitary on its knoll. There was a sudden uprising of shadowy grey forms from under the wall as they came to it, and a hoarse cry and a scuttering in the dusk which jarred her weary nerves, and brought strange choking sensations to her throat. Then the frightened sheep ran toward the hills, and they were again alone. The door of the place was shut, and through the keyhole that mysterious light looked out on them. She was past further adventure, and when her first casual exploration failed to discover the latch of the door, she abandoned it. The watcher murmured, This is a place of safety, all is well. But her heart did not echo his words. Because there seemed nothing else to do, she lifted Vera from the depressed and weary pony, it rambled a yard or so away, stopped and began to crop at the short grass. Presently it turned the corner of the church and disappeared. A man came out from the lean-to cottage which was concealed at the little church's eastern end. When he saw the bridled pony, he was surprised. He went quickly towards the entrance, with such rising feelings of anger and distress as might possess a lover whose secret lair was suddenly unmasked. When he was come round the northwest angle, he saw a figure that sat upon the threshold of the chapel and leaned against the door. He perceived it to be the form of a very weary woman, and a remark about damned tourists died stillborn. Instead, he approached and said to her very gently, That is Lancelot's attitude, but won't you come inside? The watcher took Constance's lips for his own purposes and whispered, Yes. Vera exclaimed with petulant relief, "'Oh, here's a man! How lovely! Tante, do ask him if we can't come in and have some tea.' The man said, "'Poor child, of course you shall be fed.' And then he put his hand to an inconspicuous boss, pressed it, and opened the church door. He held it and allowed Constance to pass him, followed her, and knelt upon the ground, an act which at once made Miss Tyrell feel awkward and obtrusive. But before she had time to digest these unpleasant emotions, an amazing thing happened. A force stronger than herself brought her, too, to her knees, and to an act of profound, though involuntary, adoration. She knew not what she worshipped, but knew that worship she must. The hushed voice of the watcher whispered within her, It is the idea. She could not rise. She forgot to be self-conscious. She knew only that her weariness was strangely healed. When she had knelt with bowed head for a few moments, feeling the unseen waves beating upon her brow, she looked up and saw that she was in a plain and oblong chamber, built of rough stones and floored with beaten earth. There were in it no pews, no place for priest and choir, none of the customary conveniences of piety. Hence the attention, undistracted, ran straight to the essential point, to the one object which lifted the sanctuary from a squalid desolation to an ordered austerity. There was at the eastern end a little table, and on it a red brocaded cloth, heavy like a pole, and touching the ground. This table bore no crucifix, no flowers, no candles, so that Constance said to herself, If this place is Church of England, it must be very low. But on the simple altar there was a curious metal case, a silver inlaid with plated patterns, angels, and mysterious animals, whose wings were made of enamels, gems, and gold. The doors of it stood open, so that one looked within as into a little shrine, 
Inside there was a rough glass cup without a base and with one clumsy handle. A kitchen teacup might have provided its model, but not the strange sheen of purple, black, and gold which ran through the glass. With sudden and inappropriate memories of South Kensington, she said to herself, Phoenician, I am sure of it. But what is it doing here? Then she perceived that this antique vessel was the thing to which she knelt, the link with eternity which her lodger adored. Even whilst she fought its influence and speculated upon its meaning, it cast its spells upon her soul. There was nothing else within the chapel, unless it were the lighted wick in its clay saucer which had guided them to this place. Centuries slid from her, and she found herself united to the primitive worship of the hills. Outside in the dusk, those hills and their inhabitants were gathering, brooding above the chapel, as if they would guard its enigmatic treasure from the peering vision of the modern world. Within, she, a daughter of that world, little suited to such company and such rites, knelt with a man and a spirit who had been caught into some ecstatic and unheard-of communion by a symbol which only invoked in her the vague sensations of wonder, of desire, and of unrest. She glanced at the man, he still knelt at her side and had clearly forgotten that she was there, a circumstance which contradicted all that she knew of human life. He gazed at the glass cup with an ardent love, which was without a taint of fatuousness. His glance pierced through it to something beyond, clearly seen and intimately known. He was young, spare, vivid, superbly alive. There was a sudden shriek from the doorway behind them, and Vera cried in panic, Oh, get up and speak to me quick! Tanta, it's lonely, it's queer! There's dreadful boogies in the hills. I, I hate your nasty prayers. I want my tea. He instantly rose to his feet and said, Come, we are forgetting. There's the child to be fed. She followed him from the chapel with an unwillingness that she could not understand. When they were in the two-roomed cottage and he was cutting bread and setting milk to boil, he said to her, You are the first that has come. She replied, We lost our way and wrecked the cart, and then we saw your light upon the hill. He said, That may have been the manner of it, but it could not be the cause. And because she looked at him strangely, he added, Surely you know what it is you have seen tonight? She answered, No but I think it was real and mattered very much. Real, he said? I should think so. In the last resort, it is our earnest of the only thing that matters, the transcendent link with reality. You, no less than Parsifal, have looked upon the Holy Grail. She gazed at him in amazement, and the feeble voice of common sense muttered that he must certainly be mad, or at least a hysteric of the religious type. He caught her eye, laughed at her, and said, Oh, yes, of course all-knowing people would think I was insane, but you cannot, because you knelt down. I didn't do it on purpose. All the better. That counts one to us. To us? Yes, to the angel's side. She said tentatively, for of course it might be desirable to humor him. Oh, but it can't be, you know, at least not really. It's absurd, incredible, and besides, how could you possibly be sure? There was an alarming note of obstinacy in his reply. No one can doubt who has experienced the power of great relics, and this is the mightiest relic of them all. And besides, there is tradition, and I am those who hold that tradition may be misread, but cannot lie. Here, you know, in the Westmoreland hills, was the last stronghold of the Celtic church. Here my predecessors in her priesthood lingered with their treasures and their rites, long after Italian bishops came to the north, and the Isle of Saints was saintless, and the great monastic hives had been dispersed. With them was hid, adored, kept safe, the lost key of the Middle Ages, that grail which was sought by all the chivalry of God sought mystically, and also sought actually because of the undying tradition of its loss. But now? But now, he exclaimed, it was given to me, 
me the meanest of its lovers to find hold and cherish never mind how grace did it and that is enough has any man of our generation a dearer destiny do you think i am permitted to stand sentinel between it and a world that would not understand we must keep our realities safe where we are able from moth and rust from thieves that break in and steal worse from possible museums there are certain things spread up and down the world you know which enshrine the only secret and keep it safe these are the most sacred of all trusts and all who have eyes to see them are born to their guardianship some are in good hands others are of such a nature that they cannot be perceived by those who do not love and therefore they will never be profaned but some are known only at their own peril i have brought one such here to hide it it is safe in the bosom of our hills in the nest which has hid it so long he went to a cupboard brought cups and plates and gave them warm milk bread and butter and oat cake miss tyrell looked at the little neat commonplace cottage and then at this eager man with hot blue eyes who spoke the language of fairyland with fervor and conviction side by side with her rebellious reason the spirit of the watcher looked out on this new slice of experience and he she perceived had left his perennial aspect of astonishment he seemed as one who sojourning in barbarous lands where all is bizarre and difficult to accept suddenly hears the dear accents of home more hears something someone whose presence in that home had long been desired long needed but never attained they were within the field of some mighty and spiritual magnet whose powers transcended time and space she had always eluded dogma with an agility which she doubtless owed to her excellent education but here in this crevice of the hills was something which she could not elude the watcher cried in ecstasy the real the real she raised her head with the gesture of a trapped and frightened thing and again the man laughed tiresome is it not he said but inevitable i assure you you had better acquiesce the finger of god is not to be escaped it pursues it caresses it touches where it will it was the old and hateful message god is not mocked he was not he had met her in the city he had chased her to the hills he waited inexorable behind the veil here there was a rent in that veil and through it a hand was stretched forth which offered her a gift she was too far away to see the wound upon that generous hand and as for the gift a woman of her superior intelligence could only look upon it as the fruit of a fantastic even perverse imagination it was merely a cup of rough glass curiously iridescent and stained with the colors of an imperial grief end of chapter ten chapter eleven of the column of dust by evelyn underhill this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by josh Middledorf. Chapter 11. Martin upon Reality. En cette jonction et en cette joie advient souvent de grand bonheur à l'homme, et ment mystérieux et secrète merveille des trésors de vin sont manifestés et découvertes. Rose Breck, l'admirable, l'ornement des noces spirituelles from this disposition from this joy man's great good fortune so often derives many mysteries many secret marvels are manifested and divine secrets uncovered jean van roysbroek was a flemish mystic of the fourteenth century he brought them late at night by an invisible path to the point at which they could see their village close beneath them he wrapped the sleepy vera in his old and faded plaid and carried her down the fell saying though my name is martin we will not divide the cloak to-night at the first hint of field and road he parted from them and turned again toward his friendly hills and the watchful lamp which was before the shrine 
It was during this last solitary stage of their descent that the watcher, returning to his long-abandoned mood of mockery, almost as if he, too, were overtired, had whispered within Miss Tyrell's mind certain bitter, surprising, and contemptuous words. So, he said, it appears that you know too much to be deceived by reality when at last you meet it. It is well indeed that they have fed you with illusion since this is all that you are able to digest, the killing, eating, earning, quarreling, the meaningless wriggles of life. That is acceptable, it seems, but not the idea. It is offered to you. It is present. It penetrates your very modes of being. Even in the adventures of your body you may meet it face to face. But you prefer the more rational illusions, fashion, and morality, and the intellectual life. I have laughed tonight, real laughter, which is another thing than your disordered mirth. One of you, I suppose, once knew of it, the one who spoke about the laughter of the gods. You have cherished the phrase, and the man. You thought it clever, did you not? Is it clever to perceive one's own humiliation in perspective? She, made meek by the experiences of the day, said, Oh, I know that I am blind and limited, but why were you able to apprehend something wonderful there? Then he replied more gently, Because I have dwelt always within it, although till I had sunk into life I did not notice, did not understand, seen against the darkness one can hardly fail to recognize the light. This was but an ill preparation for the return to practical matters, to their lodging, and to an agitated landlady in whom abruptly relieved anxiety effervesced as wrath of a quality difficult to appease. Constance's assurance as to the safety of the pony was received with distrust, and her apparent inability to describe its present whereabouts did but exacerbate the situation. As a fact, it had been left in Martin's care, with an undertaking that she should go herself the next day to retrieve it. Martin had said, I dare not risk discovery by your village. It is full of summer visitors who go to and fro seeking what secret beauty they may destroy. They call it an object for a walk. They would think that my hidden treasure house was very quaint, and the more cultured and pestilent amongst them would write descriptions of it and publish them in the Spectator and the Westminster Gazette. As it is, the place is well concealed. I have passed many summers in safety. Do not betray me. That were a treachery to two worlds. She, seeing in vision with a housewife's eye the necessary general shop, the soap and soda, pepper, sugar, rice, and also the flour mill and the weekly butcher's cart, which certainly could never climb the fell, said to him, How do you manage if you never come? He replied, I have another route, over the hills and far away to a little, lonely, uncommunicative place. There the people accept my existence and wish to know no more. Hill folk have so little curiosity, their own concerns suffice them. I go down amongst them, lend a hand if there is need, buy what I require, and back again by the sheep tracks. No one thinks it worth while to follow and question me. A taste for solitude is no novelty in the North. They are well accustomed to dour folk, ill-tempered anchorites and people stowed away in odd nooks. Likely enough, I am catalogued as daft, but were I sick and asked help, they would give it. You see, they have wintered me and summered me many a time, and I am part of their landscape now. Part of hers, too, he was destined to become, though the fitting of him was a matter of hard pushing and urgent faith. When she woke upon the following morning and looked round her attic bedroom, where relics of medieval discomfort were mitigated by an aggressive wallpaper and chromoliths of the Good Shepherd, Mother's Sweetheart, and the coronation of Edward the Seventh, she seemed far indeed from the austere chapel in the fells. How could a sensible and industrious woman, whose investigations of philosophy had ranged from Aristotle to Schopenhauer, find room in her consciousness for that incredible cup, its fantastic guardian? True, she found room there for the more impossible watcher, but the camel, as usual, had left little place for the gnat. 
The Watcher, after all, came from another universe where anything might happen and anything be true. But Martin's claim involved the readjustment of a dimension as to which she had already made up her mind. Although she would have repudiated scholasticism with a violence which was proper to her education, she was still a dualist at heart. Vera slept hard after her adventure, and Constance left her in bed, dressed, and descended to the presence of a landlord whose low opinion of Londoners had been confirmed by yesterday's performance. She breakfasted in haste and discomfort, being one of those who can ill endure the disapproval of their inferiors. But there was an encouraging voice within which said to her, Dear friend, why let yourself be troubled? Are we not going back to the real? As she came out in her short skirt and tam o' shanter, she met the postman and received from him a fat letter in a hand that she did not know. She took it with her to read upon the way, and at the first halt after the sharp hot scramble which put a patch of heather between her and the cultivated land, she sat upon a boulder and spread it on her knee. The letter was from Mrs. Reed, one of those lengthy and intimate letters which are produced not by overpowering affection, but by long periods of leisure enjoyed in an uncongenial spot. It was dated from the Villa Medici boarding establishment, Sand Hill on Sea, a place which, as Mrs. Reed observed in her opening paragraphs, had no soul and not even a desirable body, being but the dreary evolutionary product of golf, gasworks, and red brick. Of course, she said, it is all Maya illusion, nevertheless. I own that an inexpressible disgust makes me sad when I see nature playing the Piccadilly harlot by the sea with the added horror of a deliberate winsomeness. Here one perceives the educative influence of phenomena in its negative aspect, the materialistic qualities of the modern seaside resort producing its appropriate population. I see young men and young women who have no thought beyond the sphere of Malkuth, in whom the universal medicine has never worked. They rush to and fro without hats, and did they but know it, also without hope. All their dreams, all their ideals, are concerned with physical things, the movement of muscles and the touching of lips. Fortunately, the air is very good, and my husband benefits. He spends many hours daily in a bath chair upon the promenade. You, I hope, are climbing happily the letter of dream in the lovely arena of the north, for I am sure that you were born with a vision that can look upon the stars. Are they not the eyes of Isis, the maternal one? And are not our illusions a progress to her arms? There is no one here to whom one can talk, and I spend much time in preparing the lectures for my autumn class, the Egyptian underworld, as an English overbelief. Mr. and Mrs. Vince passed through the town in their motor the other day, en route for the South Downs and Arundel, I think, but they only remained a few hours with us. He was very healthy and wore mud-colored clothes marked with grease. Is it a sin against the light to say that this seemed appropriate? He spoke of carburetors and appeared to be happy. As for Muriel, she wore her dear look of detachment, but such a holiday, I think, can mean little to her within this sublime heart of things. All must, of course, be unity, one knows it, but it is hard to realize the absolute at Sandhill. Constance put the letter in her pocket, and from the height upon which she was poised dipped dreamily into that other life. She had been conscious of an egoistic pang when she came upon the image of Andrew so far away, enjoying himself so completely, she had no point of contact with that prosperous and modern life which he took for granted, with hotels and motor-cars, all the imperative claims of petrol tanks, maps, lunch basket, the delightful intricacies of cylinders and speeds. Hence these things seemed to lift him far from her sphere, to constitute a slur upon their friendship. Muriel, tied up in soft veils and whisked through the air, his hands upon the steering wheel, the one barrier between her exquisite body and death, could hardly fail to be warmed to something like womanhood by such a contact with the simple elements of life. Each drawn closer to the other was probably drawn farther from her. 
a gloomy idea indeed for the woman outside their life who had learned to depend on them. Andrew, between his carburetor and his darling, with outlets for every energy, holding life by each hand, must be far from the mood in which he had said to her, I'm lonely, it's just that. And awakened by this cruel appeal, a sympathy that he did not really need. She looked sorrowfully at the hills, which were grey, cold, and sad, and at the close roof of trees lying tufty beneath her. She got up with a sigh, for existence had again become arduous. She had ceased to acquiesce. Then she turned to the ascent, and the watcher once more raised his head, plumed himself as it were. He understood now the dignity and joy of energy, of earth, moving on earth, spirit driving it, mental concepts and determinations realized, if only in the dust. But the odd entanglements of humanity were still beyond him, as we, whilst we feed, exercise, and cherish our pet animals, hardly extend our sympathy to their friendships, love affairs, and hidden griefs. Hence his friend, when she turned to her fellow creatures, still turned from him, and whilst he was grieved by her troubles, he offered his condolences at a threshold which he might not cross. The sheep track which she followed took her around the village of the hill and behind a knoll that hid the village from her sight. Then she stepped quickly from the credible to the actual, being hemmed in by the barren and majestic earth, roofed by a very gentle morning sky, beckoned on by the first glimpse of a tiny gable peering above the heathered slope. She knew that in another instant she would see the little window and the faint glimmer of its ritual light. She felt like a traveller whose feet have come to the brink of a fairy ring, who, remembering the magic which invests it in the dusk, hesitates even in the daylight to cross a frontier which may delimitate that country from which no wanderer returns unchanged. She completed the ascent of the last little hillock, and saw beneath her the chapel in its dell. Martin was feeding his chickens. He wore tweed knickerbockers and looked fresh, brisk, and British. The pony stood near, comfortably tethered upon a patch of appetizing ground. It was as simple, as ordinary, and yet as unfamiliar, as Snow White's housekeeping might have seemed to a casual tourist happening upon the cottage in the wood. Martin glanced upward, he evidently possessed the hermit's instinct for those delicate noises which herald the approach of new life. When he saw her standing on the hill, he smiled at her and cried, Wait, I am coming to show you the easy way down. She watched him as he came up the steep and invisible track with that effortless stride of a being whose powers are perfectly adjusted to his needs. When he was at her side, he said, Well, in the morning light, I wondered whether I had dreamed you. You, I suppose, were quite sure that you had dreamed me. Acknowledge that you are difficult. That remark connotes rather a severe self-criticism, doesn't it? Oh, no, she said. I am justified. Consider, all your circumstances are so strange. You have so long been parted from the world that you forget. This chapel, for instance, serving no village, no farm even, all by itself in the pathless hills, who could have conceived of its existence? It is unreasonable, and yet appropriate, like Mallory, perhaps, but not like life. He replied, it is like unspoiled life, the life of the West and the North, and the wild and ardent hearts which they have bred. These secret little chapels that they build, desolate places alone in the wilds far from any habitation, are they unreasonable? To say so were cynicism indeed. They were meant to serve God, not man, to offer, not to ask. Tis the Celtic spirit, I think, the austere sentiment of lonely adoration. One sees the same thing in Brittany, you know. Cornwall has yet the wrecks of one or two, but she does not use them, of course. Her Methodism finds a nicer nook between the grocer's shop and the police station. As for this place, I found it one day in my wanderings, a forgotten ruin so miserable that it was not even picturesque. 
The door was broken down, and sheep came in for shelter. I bring them here still in the winter, when the snow is very deep. Into the church? exclaimed Constance. She had considerable reverence for the externals of religion in which she did not believe. Yes, into the church. Why not? I cannot think that the lamb would refuse a roof to his poor relations in their need. He who was born in a stable must be very patient with the habits of the beasts. Of course, I clean up after them. One likes the work. It brings Bethlehem to the English hills. Once a little lamb was born here, right before the altar. That was a wonderful night, nature at work renewing the eternal symbols. The snow was so deep that everything was very silent, but I heard the Gloria in the air. She stared at him in growing discomfort. Her doubt as to his sanity had returned. He said, Oh, yes, of course it seems mad. I know that. But do not be afraid. My manias are quite harmless. There was no other way for me, nor will there be for you, I think, once you have grasped. The world has come to that point in its perversion of reality at which one can hardly be natural unless one is insane. I am not the first person, after all, who has tried to domicile the truths of one plane in the symbols of another. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountain green? And was the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pasture seen? Do you remember that? Blake knew as he knew all things. He who touched the sky with his finger would not have been surprised. She said, I don't understand one bit. It is like hearing the Middle Ages through a gramophone. The watcher asked her anxiously, Is that a patch of time when men were near the real? She answered in confusion, Perhaps. I do not know. They descended to the chapel, and again with shaking heart she entered the door and knelt down. Then her lodger, as if friendship itself must give way before this mighty opportunity, seized her mind, her powers, in his old passionate spirit of domination. He threw himself, as it were, and these with him, humble, eager, and full of joy, at the feet of that power which had been brought to a point in this place. By her side another spirit rose beyond him, transfigured, made ardent, by that same vivid and penetrating love. When they were come out, she said to Martin, Ah, what is it? What is it? There is more here than any mere relic, any dead symbol, I think. He answered in the voice of one who tells his dearest secret, Yes, you are in a lover's lair. And what is it, this elusive thing you love? The watcher whispered, Why, the idea! What else could one love? Martin, to her surprise, corroborated him, saying, Your mind is still clouded by practical things. The breath of the world has tarnished it. If it were not so, you could hardly help but see, for the elusive thing which you have such difficulty in accepting is just the one thing that truly exists. As for loving it, am I not a priest? And are not all priests in their essence just lovers, deeply in love, but only with ideas? And she, thinking of the ministers of many denominations which she had met in the course of her work, could not agree with him. Oh, yes, they are, he said, at least the real ones, and the others do not count. I'll tell you the life of a priest. He watches and waits and serves the beloved thing and steals his heart against the misery of seeing it despised and rejected of men, and after a time it happens that he cannot bear the waiting and the watching any more, and so he runs away with his darling to a desert and a secret place, there to enter into possession of his joy. That is the story of the hermits, and of many and many a person who is supposed to have a morbid hatred of his kind. Humanity is insulted and says bitter things of them, just as many a mother is insulted when her son first casts his eyes upon a woman and wants to leave his home and make a nest for her somewhere in the world. 
he feels the impulse, he knows he has got to go, and so do we. It is the next stage to leave the mother of all of us and turn from her to the one and only love for whose possession she has raised us up. And is that what brought you here? Yes. Even before I found the cup, I think that I was destined to come. Sometimes down there, I dreamed I was a poet, and then suddenly I woke and knew that I was a parson. One couldn't combine them. So I aped St. Francis, stripped off my clerical clothes, and went wandering. Because I was detached, my destiny came. The love token was put into my hand, and I was forced to find a nook where I might hide it. He broke off, and looked at her with authority. You are judging me, he said. But why shouldn't I act thus? I defy you to say why I should not have done it. You, she retorted, are judging me, and through me the race, and why, pray, should not I have done it? How can I say? You have not unveiled your idol. She answered, her name is life. But unbelievers have another word for that aspect to which I made my oblation. Was it a happy love? She glanced back and then said, No, not really. Only exciting. Since I have seen you and because you are sharp-edged and simple, I know that my worship fell short. It was ugly and had no shape. Oh, no, he said with great gentleness. If it was worship, it could not have been ugly. You may have seen it in ugly terms, of course. Wasn't that it? Real worship is always beautiful. The eternal object of it sees to that. But we, when we would judge what we are doing, will mix ourselves up with the picture. We do not stand far enough away, she interrupted him. But there is no standing far away when it's life. That is the terrible part. One lives up to that religion. It is no mere academic creed. One must plunge in, bathe in it. It is like the initiation of Mithra. Every adept must be baptized in the hot, horrible torrent of blood. Endure it to the dregs. Sometimes, you know, that leaves a stain, an unexpected stain, which cannot be effaced. The sharp blue eyes looked at her. And then he answered quietly, I know, it is horribly painful, but not in the least criminal, of course. My initiation, she said, and stopped. Then she began a different subject. Did you notice the child who was with me last night? Yes, an animal thing, that's all right. There are many such up here. They are left over, they linger in the corner. Sometimes they are fresh created by mistake. She was. Ah, well, you must not be fastidious. Your goddess is not always in her best bib and tucker. Cannot be always on her knees. She must work and sometimes soil her hands in the process. As for me, because I have lived close to the breeding earth for many years, I have been taught to abandon that delicacy which demands a constant crop of lilies but cannot tolerate manure. It is all so splendid, so holy. Oh, it really is, even one's own experience. The true lover, I fancy, can afford to see his mistress at the dustbin and love her none the less. And so it is with life, with God. That's different. No, not really. Right through existence, from beginning to end, and in every relation, one always, as a matter of fact, loves in the same way. Thinking of the foolish enthusiasms of the past, she said, No. Uh, I hope not. Oh, yes. But we do, he answered. Why, isn't that just our job, to get the little loves right, so that the big love may be in order too? Ordina questa more. O tu che mami. Friend, lover, toy, ambition, and sacramental divinity, we really turn the same face to them all. Watch a woman with her sweetheart, and you may guess pretty accurately her attitude to her God, don't you know? 
Some love in gusts of overpowering devotion, and some steadily and quietly, like a well-trimmed flame. Some give, give, give all the while, and never ask back. These, I think, are already divine. Some cry, love me, only show that you love me. Just that, every minute of the day. Some love sternly, sulkily, but unquenchably. They turn the arrows of Eros upon themselves, and wound themselves cruelly drawing the barbs through their flesh with a strange, fierce joy. And that which each does in the human relation will govern his action toward the absolute, too. She looked at him, rather puzzled. I never thought of it that way, she said. The watcher stirred within her and muttered, Of course! It is a training ground, a school. What else could it possibly be? The idea must be there, underneath, why did I not perceive that before? This, then, is the meaning of the foolish and deluded human loves. Martin went on. You see, all that, the joining up of things, the matching of the outside with the inner meaning, one learns in these quiet places as nowhere else. In the cities it is difficult and confusing, but here the silence helps it, and the meek determination of the earth when one is quite alone, one hears it say so many beautiful things. This is the secret of that contempt of the bustling, practical world which comes with such great simplicity to the saints. I think I shall never quite forget the cleansing of my own eyes on the day that I brought the cup to its home. It was a grey morning and misty. The sky was soft, and behind its softness one divined a gleam. All the world seemed a little different, I thought. I was so warmed towards it by that which I held to my breast. I wondered to myself, what was its place in that love, and how near the dutiful and patient plants, the little simple beasts, were drawn to him. Then I looked up and knew for I saw across the meadows and the forests the majestic figure of a priest, who passed to and fro with unhurried steps, and fed his creatures, some with bitter bread and some with sweet. All the flowers spread their corollas at his coming, all the little creatures raised soft faces and opened trustful mouths for the receiving of this host. And it was of their substance and of his now I see this God, this priest, in all his aspects. I see him laughing in the riot of Dionysus did. I find him passionate as a lover in the oratory, austere as a judge in the confessional, gentle as a mother at the grave. Shall I not attribute to him the same range of emotions as I find in his creation? Why limit his imminence and his effect? Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, as surely he shares our conquests and our joys. Oh, no, she said, not that. Think they are so childish, so absurd? You have no right, exclaimed Martin, thus to stigmatize the pleasures of your God. How arrogant we are, turning back upon our parents, imposing our little creeds upon their source. Remember, if omnipotence enjoyed a game of marbles, he would not be less, but the game of marbles would be more. Is it not the Holy Ghost who looks through our eyes at earthly beauty and guides the hand of the artist, the bridge-builder, yes, and of the cricketer, too? Does he not exult in the tempest and taste rapture in the dance? Have you ever thought that as we can only know him in moments of ecstasy, like knowing like, so the divine life must be one long ecstasy of being, marked by the spinning of the words, and are we ever so godlike as in the moments where we abandon ourselves without condition to those rhythms of the universe? A dangerous doctrine, she said. Sometimes that abandonment breeds what the world calls sin. Yes, because the world generally judges sin backwards, by its bodily seeming, as if one could sin with the body alone. Absurd! You might as well say that your clothes could sin of themselves. 
The body is nothing, after all, only a little heap of dust wrapped round to hide the soul. And then, because his last words roused in her vivid and overwhelming memories, and in her lodger the ecstatic recognition of a fellow exile who really understood, she said to him suddenly, I think that I am going to tell you something. He replied, I thought you would have to when I saw you come. I know that about the body, about the dust, truly know it, I mean, and it has made everything seem unreal and useless except the times when I managed to forget. The watcher corrected her, saying, But has it not disclosed the real? Such knowledge anticipates death, said Martin gravely. She answered, Yes, and it comes of meddling with the fringe of things. Life was so dull, so flat, so lonely. I thought that I must have adventure, must anticipate. I could not be quiet. I longed to know. I did not think it would be real, could be. And now I am possessed by a reality from which I can never escape. If you loved it, surely you wouldn't wish to escape. I don't love it, Martin said. The things one does not love are better left alone. But I did not think that it was really there. How could I, on our sane and normal earth, where everything fits and every crevice is concealed, how could I conceive that the dust would break down at a word, a ceremony, a wish, a song, and another universe intrude. Really, he said, if your materialism was so narrow and so arrogant as that, one cannot be very sorry about its fall. I know that little knot of case-hardened and well-educated rejectors of experience from which you have come. They are like a party of old ladies sitting in the drapery department of the stores, who sees a man rush hastily through bearing a pile of tin saucepans, when he is gone, they rub their eyes and decide that he must be an hallucination, because tin saucepans have nothing to do with drapery. They forget that the universe, too, may have other departments. I can't, for my tin saucepan is always there, he said very gently. Will you not tell me? And she, drowning the clamorous voice of the watcher, who was insulted by this too sudden dip into homely metaphor, told him. The sun had broken from its morning mists and poured radiance upon a singularly definite earth, and there, sitting in the narrow line of shade beneath the north wall of the chapel, with the delicious roughness of the heather caressing her bare hand, and in her ears the soft noise of the pony's steady munching, she related the history of her evocation and its answer of the column of dust and its wild-eyed inhabitant, of her horror and her wavering will, of the invasion of the watcher and her bewildering dual life. As she told it, the tale assumed for her a shape that she had not perceived in it before. She apprehended a thread within it, the history of a progress for both of them, which, had she been a Darwinian, she might have explained to herself as the natural result of a changed environment. She saw clearly for the first time the slow humanizing of the watcher, which had turned him from an intruder to a friend, warm interest replacing his chill curiosity, sympathy modifying his supersensual contempt. In herself also she saw a change, the liberation within her of some thing, some power, which could dispute his dominion, could meet him on his own plane. At the ending of the tale, Martin said to her, Well, you have found a destiny. Little cause for discontent with that goddess of yours. She has treated you handsomely enough, giving you no casual help from her stockpot, but served you a special plat. You know, I suppose, what you are in for. The saving of souls has always been looked upon as a fairly big business, but you have got something less usual than a soul to save. Do you think so? She stared at him. Think? It is obvious. But how to do it? How? Oh, don't worry about that. Just live. 
Your goddess has a way of solving these problems as she comes up to them. Sometimes she cuts her way, but she always does something, always goes on, always arrives. Constance replied rather sadly, It is easy to be optimistic here. Oh no, not easy. The horizon, even here, is over wide, and one sees many grievous and difficult things. But hope is one of my three duties, and without it the other two could hardly be performed. She exclaimed involuntarily, How sure you are! And this lodger of mine, he apprehends your secret. He loves it too, although I cannot find the link and understand. He replied, There is nothing odd in that, really. It belongs to his world, of course. It came to the spirits in prison as well as to the seed grounds of earth. The curious thing, the interesting aspect, is that he was forced to come here to find and recognize the liberating hand. Behind those terrible myths, how could he find it there, in symbols that deal with nothing but the most hideous animal accidents of our nature, dying, torment, and blood? Surely the real, the divine, what one longs for, what one needs, is a reading of reality that shall be radiant, permanent, serene, that shall offer a promise of deathless and beautiful things. He took her by the shoulders. Poor squeamish child, he said, go back to nature. Watch her at the eternal game of death and birth. Life, you say, is your idol? Listen to her, then, as she expounds existence. She is a difficult mistress. She offers no self-evident syllogism to the pupils that she loves. She has but one formula, and that a paradox. It is the paradox of creation, the folly of the cross. In the afternoon, as she led the pony down the hill, she knew herself, too, to be led in a new spirit of acceptance, back again from the heights to life, to work, to the constant struggle for beauty, shape, and significance. Behind her in the mountain, the light burned, and the cup reigned on its little altar, remote, magical, and serene. A ray of that light went with her, illuminating certain recesses of her spirit which had lurked in the twilight till this day. As Martin bade her good-bye, he had said to her, in a low and diffident tone, yet almost with an accent of entreaty, Oh, learn to love, do please learn to love. It's such a terrible waste if you don't. You are made of the stuff that does things thoroughly, and this is the one thing which is worth doing well. These words had moved Constance strangely, making her feel humble, cowed, and ineffectual. They had even brought unwilling tears to her eyes. Somehow they reminded her of the shining tree and the more actual image of creative pain which had crossed it. They addressed themselves to that sleepy inhabitant which had roused itself at that moment to struggle for the possession of her will. That inhabitant took little interest in her personal wants and failures. It was eager to endure all that might be before it, eager to cooperate with life. Vera met her in the garden, joyous and muddy. Tanta, she cried, I drowned a chicken. And the mother did squeak. End of chapter 11Remember, man, from dust thou comest, and to dust thou must return. Mrs. Reed, munched on a biscuit and thought of transcendental things, the resulting sense of beatitude might be attributed in part to the exquisite crispness of a cream cracker, which had come from a newly opened tin, in part to the serenity of spirit which is natural to any woman who is sure that she knows what she means by a categorical imperative. 
Ra lifted a slate-blue nose from the protective ambush of his tail and snuffed the air, preserving a judicious mean between appetite and dignity. Helen broke off a small piece of biscuit, offered it to him, and carefully removed the inevitable crumbs from the recesses of his fur frill. Mr. Reed, watching these attentions with the slight sensations of jealousy which they always provoked, said, "'You will spoil that cat, my love. If he were a baby, you could not fuss over him more than you do.' Helen, who was completing Ra's toilette with a brush and a comb, stopped and answered, "'He has all Egypt in his eyes. What British baby brings such credentials as that? Also, he may come into the room during the lecture, and I prefer that he should look his best. Mr. Reed moved uneasily in his chair and fumbled for the stick at his side. His wife went to him, took each hand firmly in her own, and helped him to his feet with the unemotional precision of a hospital nurse. Twenty past eleven, he said. Your young friends will soon be here. I think I'll be going. The woman who supported him waited patiently until the stick was adjusted to his liking. Then she put one arm about his shoulders, caught up a cushion with her other hand, and led him across the room. There was upon her face the guardian look of a creeping anxiety, an apprehension which has not yet been allowed to attain full consciousness. Poor old dear, she said, it seems a shame to turn you out like this, but you will really be more comfortable in the other room. I lit the gas stove and the rug and hot water bottle are all ready. You will feel quite cosy, and as soon as the class is over I shall come and get you ready for lunch. Very good arrangement, very good arrangement indeed, said the old man slowly. I take my morning nap while you and young people have your class. What is it? The state of the dead, eh? Ah, oh, very interesting, very interesting indeed. I should have enjoyed it if I hadn't been quite so deaf. Never do to deprive you of your pleasures, you know. You would mope, shut up all day with an old fellow like me. As it is, we shall both be satisfied, just as it should be. Helen was by no means sure that she was wholly satisfied. Her husband seemed, she thought, more somnolent, less alert than usual and she regretted the necessity of immuring him in a gas-warmed room for the rest of the morning. She said to herself that it would certainly lower his vitality, and he must have a little stimulant with his lunch. Also, Mrs. Weatherby had taken a ticket for her lectures, and whilst the growing expenses of beef essence, Benger's food, and new-laid eggs forbade her to refuse the two guineas, she feared that they would prove to be hardly earned. Between these diverse anxieties the mood of serenity departed, and the material world surged in upon her with peculiar obstinacy. She was depressed by this exhibition of the power of circumstances, and set about the arranging of chairs, the placing of the ritual glass of water on the table, in a state of mind which, in an inferior woman, might almost have become fussy. Mrs. Weatherby arrived first. She carried a large new notebook and a fat stylographic pen of the kind known as Teddy Bear. Her demeanor struck Mrs. Reed as excessively inappropriate. Well, she said as she entered, now I am going to improve my mind and find out what you clever people really mean by it all. I was determined to come this autumn, last winter, when one went out to tea, one never knew what the women were talking about. Besides, I always like a lecture. The questions afterward are such fun. Muriel is coming. I saw her motor trying to run into an omnibus as I arrived. She has got Felix with her. Quite the old-fashioned Calvinistic idea to teach children about hell before they've heard anything about heaven. It is about hell, isn't it? No? Well, it sounds like it. I hope you're not going to show any pictures of those peculiar gods. As it is, I expect the poor child won't sleep for nights. Oh, here they are. Muriel came in, holding Felix firmly by the hand. She said to Helen, You do not mind my bringing him, do you? He has promised to be quite good. Being Saturday, he does not go to kindergarten today. He will not understand. One does not wish it. But 
I should like him to breathe the atmosphere for a little while. Atmosphere is so important in its influence on the developing mentality of the child. Felix removed his gloves, coat, and cap very carefully, revealing a thin little body clad in a pale green jersey and short serge knickerbockers to match. He cast a searching glance into the corners of the room, peeked under the table, and then said, "'Where is Ra?' Mrs. Reed answered, "'I am afraid that he is asleep just now, in my husband's room,' Felix observed. "'When I am a bigger boy, I shall do like that and sleep in another room when ladies talk. Father does, and I have quite decided that I am going to be a man, too.' Muriel said hastily, "'He's a little fractious and disappointed today. Andrew wished to take him to see the royal procession this afternoon, but I preferred that he should stay with me. Children are so easily impressed by mere military display and acquire false standards of greatness. I tell him that when he is bigger he will understand the unimportance of these things. Then he will see more essential beauty in the curves of Darwin's forehead than in a whole regiment of lifeguards. Felix murmured, regretfully, Yes, but not lovely prancy horses and bands and things. I expect Andrew was disappointed too, said Mrs. Weatherby. He enjoys taking the child about him so much. Oh, no, answered Muriel. He gave the ticket to Miss Tyrell. He likes to take her out on Saturday afternoons when he can. She's so very good-natured, and appears to appreciate almost any little expedition of that kind. It's a change for her, of course, after being shut up in that shop all the week. "'You are very unconventional, my dear,' said Mrs. Weatherby. "'I try to be,' replied Muriel, simply. The presence of other people prevented Mrs. Weatherby from making the observation which she considered adequate. She therefore contented herself with an inarticulate sound which the more worldly persons present had little difficulty in translating. "'Miss Tyrell,' said Phoebe quickly, "'is also unconventional, I think, though not perhaps in quite the same way. She is one of those strange and always interesting persons who appear to have no attachments to existence. She wanders in a desert of her own.' "'The truth is,' answered Mrs. Weatherby, that none of us knows where she wanders, or, for that matter, where she comes from. It may be a desert, or it may be something very much the reverse. That is the worst of London. In the country such a state of things would be impossible. The vicar would call and find it all out. I've been to her shop once or twice. Pure curiosity, I'm not ashamed of it. There she is, very sensible and businesslike, in an extremely becoming overall. Always on the spot, always attentive, no silly air of, don't forget that I'm a lady. I asked her to tea last week, and she came, talked pleasantly for an hour and a half, and gave me an excellent pattern for a pinafore, economical to cut out, easy to wash, which, I own, surprised me, and when she left, I knew nothing about her, nothing at all. By no means the usual thing with reduced gentle women. It was Phoebe who said, One hardly conceives of her as that. Circumstances do not seem to belong to her, nor she to circumstances. She is wholly detached, wholly alone, unless indeed she has links to life of which we know nothing. Well, that is what I am sometimes afraid of, replied Mrs. Weatherby. Not that I have any good reason for saying it, but when you find a good-looking woman of that age entirely unattached... It proves, said Muriel, a certain wonderful aloofness from existence. Not always, my dear. Aloofness of that kind may come from cussedness in the young, but it is generally the result of compulsion where it exists in the mature. Phoebe observed very gently, I feel so sorry for her. One divines that she is not really happy in her solitude. Probably she has never made her peace between the spirit and the flesh. Mrs. Reed, at last seeing an opportunity, remarked in her sweetest and most penetrating tone, At best that is but an armistice between irreconcilable foes. Oh, no, I think not, replied Phoebe firmly. 
That is a mistake which the contemplation of materialism is so apt to induce. But I see more and more of late that spirit in its purest manifestations is bound to express itself by means of the carnal veil. I had not supposed, said Mrs. Weatherby, that Freddie Burroughs possessed such educational genius. There was a general sensation of surprise when it was observed that these words had caused Miss Foster to exhibit a quite commonplace embarrassment. Her pretty face grew pink, and she looked almost maidenly. Muriel, whose rather disintegrated nature contained several kindly patches, said instantly, I think it is so kind of you to go about with him as you do. After all, an uncongenial friendship is bound to tax one's tolerance, exhaust one's spiritual strength. I wonder sometimes whether Miss Tyrell experiences anything of that kind with Andrew. One can hardly suppose that they have much in common. If a woman is lonely enough, observed Mrs. Weatherby, she has something in common with the crossing sweeper, but she would be rather surprised if she were told what that something was. Mrs. Reed was glad when the rest of her pupils assembled and the lecture at last began. She had prepared it carefully, and it combined mummies, metaphysics, alchemy, and the Book of the Dead in a very impressive way. Some of the ladies present were puzzled, but all were interested. The Egyptian underworld, said the lecturer in hieratic accents, calls to us for recognition across the chasm of five thousand years, and now, when dogma crumbles under our touch, the eternal realities of the immortal soul's progress and transmutations, the gates through which it passes to the central fire, the crucible whence it emerges to be united with soul its source, appear to us as the most rational of all over-beliefs. Do they, said Mrs. Weatherby as she made her first note, the birth of Horus is for us the birth of the defied soul, for this is the mysterium magnum of existence, the sanction of the great work that Osiris and Horus are truly one. Death is the coming forth of the philosopher's stone from the crucible of life. How joyous a moment when the emancipated soul, purged from its baser elements, breaks forth from its envelope and is delivered into the hands of Toth. The illuminated mind can but hail the deaths of those who it loves with triumph and delight, for there is a sense in which every living being wrapped in matter is but a mummy till death comes to undo the swaddling bands of carnal things. Then will be the beneficent action of salt, sulphur, and mercury, those loving attendants about the fiery sepulchre of the grosser nature. Permit the artist to pour forth the tincture of eternity, and draw out from the furnace the golden Osiris soul, which shall return in its splendor and purity to the ineffable Osiris source. <sighs> How beautiful, said Muriel. The other ladies sat for the most part with their mouths slightly open. Even Mrs. Weatherby was silenced, for Helen, exalted by her own eloquence, spoke with a dreamy and solemn fervor which her astonishing symbolism did little to impair. When the lecture was at an end and the last of her pupils had departed, Helen fetched a small can of hot water from the bathroom and went down the passage to the little bedchamber in which her husband sat. She heard a faint scratching sound from within, and then a mew. As she opened the door, Ra rushed out and fled to the darkest corner of the corridor, she said in astonishment. Why, what have you done to Ra? He seems quite frightened. Mr. Reed did not reply and the hiss of the gas-stove made the room seem curiously quiet. He sat huddled in his chair, stooping forward a little. His eyes were half open, and his heavy head rested on one shoulder. When she was close to him, his wife saw with horror that his tongue lolled from between his lips. She dropped the little can, and felt the soft warm touch of the water as it poured over her ankles, and soaked the thin thread stockings that she wore, she thought vaguely, how stupid of me! I shall have to fetch a duster, I suppose. But she did not move, she could not, and presently the water spread upon the varnished floor, forming a shining pool which stretched from her feet to those of the corpse. It lay between them like a barrier. 
she knew that the barrier was an illusion, but it represented a Rubicon which she could not cross. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of The Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Sightseeing. I spoke as I saw. I report as a man may of God's work. All's love, yet all's law. What, my soul? See thus far and no farther? When doors great and small, nine and ninety flew ope at one touch. Should the hundredth appall? Browning. Saul. The idea of friendship, as also the idea of fatherhood, was vaguely connected in Andrew's simple mind with the necessity of giving treats. Hence, when he was disappointed of his first intention and forbidden to take Felix to see the return of the Polish emperor from his luncheon at the guild hall, he naturally and immediately conceived the notion of offering to Constance the pleasure which he might not give his son. The result had been odd and unexpected for both of them. Constance, hitherto, had left these pageants on one side, as events hardly affecting even the fringe of her consciousness. But Andrew's solid acceptance of the thing as a pleasant and important, as something which counted in the Londoner's life, had stirred her to interest, and the watcher's inevitable questions concerning the necessity of running in crowds to see the ever-decaying bodies of other little creatures carried by, had even urged her to a justification of the performance. In spite of her extended experience, she was still bound by the emotional limitations of the citizen. The return from the hills to the hive had not been wholly destitute of joy. When she could forget the cold ring set about her, the adorable and uncomprehensible truth which had somewhere, somehow, pierced the dream to tease her vision and elude her grasp, she resumed that vicarious arrogance which is the birthright of the London child, and her new-found adoration of beauty gave a touch of poetry to her pride. Westminster Abbey, the Whitechapel Road, the river, the shops, the streaming traffic, the blue and golden lamps in the magic dusk, each seemed to her now significant and delightful things, fully charged with the spirit of life. Even the joyous clatter of Smithfield Market, the sixpenny rabbits and ninepenny pines, the shops devoted to instruments of murder, the magnificent offices of the London Offal Company, she had held worthy of exhibition to the watcher whose nascent perceptions they confused. He said, The chemical side of life the building up of all your fragile tissues to make them last until you have to go away, all this seems to give great pleasure. You seem to think that the manner of it matters a great deal. It is surprising, but I am glad I think it is in the ecstasy of eating that many of you come nearest the idea. But having been so kind to your bodies and cherished them, you must find it very hard at the finish to put them on one side. I suppose, however, that there are also many places where you may purchase food for the upbuilding of the soul. At that, in a dutiful spirit, she had shown him a church. Of course it was empty, for there was no service in progress, and she felt that he was becoming unreasonable when he drew her attention to this fact. The place was well kept, though naturally enough it seemed a little dingy when one contrasted it with the bright life of the theatre the drawing-room, and the street. But there was a thick, expensive sanctuary carpet and an extremely handsome riridos behind the altar, carved and painted in a small archaic style with early Italian seraphim bearing a long curled scroll. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name said the scroll in golden gothic letters. It flung this superb declaration down the chill and desolate church, which seemed to laugh cynically in reply. Outside in the sun, the spirit of praise might be active, and with it the angels. 
that web of ministering love which men call natural forces, there played without hindrance about all living things, inviting the crescent soul to adoration. Here the stiff, militant rows of red hassocks, like vigilant constables ready to check the results of a possible spiritual enthusiasm, reminded intending devotion that an established religion looks to comfort and decorum, even in the affairs of the soul. So people in general do know that we exist, said the watcher. Really no, have even gone so far as to give us names and talk about us as if we were true. I'm surprised, and here they say that they unite with us. Unite in what? Nothing seems to be happening. There's no aspect of reality here. If there were, surely some of you would feel it and care about it, as he did, whom we found in the hills. But you do not truly wish us to be with you. You would only be frightened and astonished if we came. You crowded peoples who build such dismal places as this, out of respect for a reality that someone once told you about, it were better to go back to your eating and growing and begetting. Then he had whispered rather sadly, To laud and magnify, how great a destiny, helping the idea, loving it and increasing it, strange, mad little people, to find so great a concept and write it up and leave it all alone. Such experiences as these had not encouraged Constance to hope that the royal procession could make any pleasing impression upon so critical a creature who displayed, despite the varied opportunities that she had offered him, such astounding tardiness in the acquirement of common sense. As for her, she looked as a child might for some glittering regal thing, for an exhibition part splendid, part amusing, and for the presence of a crowd which always delighted her. When she stood by Andrew at the window in Oxford Street, where two admirable seats had been reserved, and looked down on the wide graveled road and the thicket of heads on either side of it, peering anxiously for the first sweep of the soldiers, she caught their infection and became in her turn absurdly eager over this trivial passage of a doubtless trivial personality from one end to the other of the town. Andrew was pleased, and encouraged her, saying, Nearly time now. I think I hear him cheering. Hope he will get a good reception. These foreigners think a lot of that. By Jove, there are the guards already. Here he comes. The crowd bristled as if a breeze had passed over it, and down the centre of the wide pale street the solemn lifeguards came trotting, with the steady, unhurried air of dramatic things. And in the midst of the pageant, its very eye, guarded and carried as a sacred relic through the streets, there was a little old and wearied man whom all Europe knew to be diseased, and whom some pitied, some despised, but none ever reverenced. The flashing and murderous swords of his bodyguard went before and behind him as a warning to the people that this one ebbing and imperfect life should be protected, even at the sacrifice of other growing lives. The little grey man was almost swallowed up by his huge carriage and by the imperial richness of the cloak that propped him in his place. He raised a claw-like hand to return the salutations of the people. Now here, as it seemed, was a manifest sham and absurdity. Here was something, an inconsistent wreck for the savage ages, which pure and emancipated spirit could never understand. Where indeed could it touch eternal matters, this temporary erection of impotent dolls? Once it had passed and the cheering had died, Constance herself thought it but foolishness, pathetic, perhaps, but evidently ripe for the destroying hand of that progress which talks so much about the trowel, but always seems more ready with the sword. Therefore it was with amazement that she perceived the watcher to abase himself with an eager comprehension, as if here again he recognized something which had immediate relations with reality. He, it was plain, did not see the little huddled invalid, 
the remnant of a too adventurous youth who had set out upon his progress supported by stimulants and bore it by reason of a careful disposition of hot water bottles as the vision of the initiate passes unheeding beyond the bread and wine and sees unveiled the object of all love so he saw sovereignty the ruling and governing idea behind its poor image and hardly perceived the shabbiness of the symbol through which he gazed andrew at her elbow had whispered by jove the poor chap does look rocky they say he can't last very long within her mind the watcher said but this will last for ever and for ever it is eternal it is true it is a showing of the will she answered no you are mistaken the tendency of social evolution is against it we are eliminating these things from the modern state he said you cannot eliminate the idea though apparently you find it very easy to forget oh no of course not but monarchy has lost touch with the real it is just a survival now a picturesque sham it is all one all part of it he exclaimed and that is why in spite of all your talking you cannot never will shake off its spell love law authority they all belong they are the thinking the living the loving of the will do you not see the great rules the huge lines of it the meshes of the eternal web love and the grail law and the king if you do not what is the use of being here and what is the instinct that brings you all to look upon this sight she had a glimpse of it then was moved by the mighty ideal of government and by this small insistent emblem of a stability which owed nothing to the individual but transcended persons asserting itself as an actual expression of life it was the aggregate reality of the state brought to a point and expressed in personality as the ideal truths which man is to assimilate must always be expressed they had an early tea together with the friendly and irresponsible sense of picnicking which is peculiar to london's saturday afternoons she already knew the exact amount of sugar that andrew liked and he was astonished that she should so easily remember a fact which muriel had never learned then because it was one of those soft october days when languid pleasures seemed the best they walked into the park and sat there the gentle greyness of the landscape pleased constance lulled her mind london when she dons her veil of citizenship is always very friendly to the soul the sky she noticed had that hint of coral pink in it which only great cities seem able to impart and against it the shrouded forms of the houses the great mass of st george's hospital stood up with a mild but invulnerable dignity the motors and carriages as they passed were grey too and had grey people inside them for this hour the illusion of colour was taken away from the world and she obtained a new sight of it freed from the chains at least of one tyrannous sense this she thought might indeed be a part of that dreamy universe that projection of omnipotent will held in a ceaseless state of flux by the thought that informed it which the watcher's vague statements seemed to describe even such traffic as there was went dimly and silently she gazed at it with sleepy eyes when suddenly a rider brought his shadowy horse to the railings and disclosed him as being brown after all there was a touch of fairy in the transformation and she said gently and vaguely isn't it strange and colourless this afternoon when that horse came up and disturbed things i was beginning to think that all the world was grey andrew replied afraid we shall have a foggy night anticyclonic weather it is beautiful i love it yes pretty effect said vince but these early autumn fogs are nasty things for people who are weak about the chest she returned automatically to the plane which her friend called actual and said half to herself i suppose they are 
I must be careful of Vera at the beginning of the winter she so easily picks up a cold. Ah, well, my little niece, you know, who lives with me. I didn't know, said Andrew, astonished. Awfully sorry, no notion of it. Poor little kid. Why didn't you tell me? She might have come with us to see the show. She has gone to the zoo with some other children. They were her landlady's sons, but Constance did not think this detail essential. I'm awfully glad, observed Andrew presently, that you've got a little girl to look after. It's an interest. A woman all alone, no ties, no future, nothing to pet. One doesn't like the idea of it. Against nature. But children are ripping companions, even when they're not your own. She had never looked upon Vera in this light. She felt that she had been corrected, and, to her ears, there was a new note of humility in her assent. "'Can't be bored by kids,' continued Andrew, happily. "'They're a sort of everlasting interest, coming on all the while, developing, don't you know, and so on. Look at Felix, the boy in him just breaking out, a bit hard on Muriel after having him at her apron string for so long. I'm afraid she doesn't altogether like it. But life is life. It can't be helped. You must bring your little niece to tea one day. Good for Felix having other children to play with. Teaches them to give and take a bit, don't you know? I don't let her go to parties, said Constance hastily. You're quite right. It excites him. I don't mean a party, just a feed of bread and jam and a few games. The soft gray city was spoilt for her now, and the pleasant idle companionship. The watcher said, What is wrong, and why are you grieved? Is not this man your friend, and are you not together? And is this not what human beings always desire? You tire me. You are so full of confused witches and curious little griefs. I cannot help you, for I cannot find the thread. She rose, in spite of Andrew's expostulations, with the evident determination of saying good-bye. It had come into her mind that she might call on Mrs. Reed before returning home, and thus Vince would be unable to escort her to her lodgings and make the acquaintance of the child. She had wished, if she might, to preserve her simple relation with him as a solitary woman about whom there was nothing to be said. But Vera carried with her the note of squalor and confusion which wrecks platonic friendships and causes even the most cultivated and tolerant of hostesses to experience a certain searching of the heart. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of the Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter Fourteen Death and the Watcher. And I, fire, acceptor of sacrifices, ravishing away from them their darkness, give the light, not a natural light, but a supernatural, so that though in darkness they knew the truth. From the Divine Dialogue of St. Catherine of Siena. The door of Mrs. Reed's flat stood ajar, and Constance, having rung the bell and received no answer, pushed it open and went in. The sitting room was empty, and the chairs stood in disorder, as they had been left after the morning's class. She was surprised and uncertain as to her next action, for even were Helen absent, she had expected to find Mr. Reed dozing as usual before the fire with the blue Persian cat upon his knee. Whilst she stood considering the matter, Ra appeared from some recess of the establishment, and rubbed against her skirt with an excess of affection which suggested extreme loneliness, if not actual hunger and thirst. She stooped to stroke his head, and he raised himself on his hind legs to meet her hand an unprecedented act of condescension. Then he purred twice, mewed once, walked to the closet door of the bedroom, and sat down on the mat. Constance knocked, waited for a reply, and then opened the door a little way, but Ra would not enter alone. He rubbed against her skirts with increased vehemence, and looked at her with imploring golden eyes. She opened the door wider, and then saw Mrs. Reed, 
who knelt before the gas stove. Her beads and scarabs hung round her neck and jangled a little as she swayed to and fro. The air of the room was thick and hot, as if the stove had been alight for many hours. Constance, astonished, halted upon the threshold, and then perceived the huddled corpse in the chair. Sleeping persistently despite the swaying wretched woman at its feet, Death, it seemed, extended his right hand very gently and dealt a shrewd blow with his left, tearing away the tidy surface of existence and disclosing certain raw realities beneath. "'What is this?' said the watcher. Constance whispered, awestruck, "'I think that it is death.' She felt his movement of withdrawal, but resisted it, saying, "'No, that would be cruel.' We must not leave her alone. Mrs. Reed stopped swaying and looked at Constance without surprise. She said apologetically, I found the door ajar. Helen answered in a slow, monotonous, explanatory voice. Yes, it does not matter. You see, I am quite alone now. Yes, quite alone. I went out to see if I were really alone and there was nothing left, and then I thought, Perhaps, if he wanted to come back, you know. But that's a mistake, too. I made a great many mistakes today. Of course, he's here. Oh, yes, he's still here. He is waiting. He does not like to go alone. I must not forget that. Constance, made stiff and awkward by her sensations of horror and amazement, moved towards her. But she raised herself upon her knees and shuffled towards the chair, she took one of the dead man's hands between her own and began to stroke it. One must hold on to life by something, she explained, as long as one can, yes, as long as one possibly can. Even by death, whispered the watcher. You see, he is all mine, quite mine. I earned for him and arranged things. People think me intellectual, but that is only for odd times. I always washed his hands and brushed his hair. I did keep him nicely, didn't I? His hair is wonderful for his age, so thick and silky. She played with it for a little while and then dropped it and said wearily, But I have nothing to do now, nothing at all, so that nothing really matters any more. Then Constance found the voice of conventional consolation and said, but you will always have a beautiful memory of the years you were together, of the happiness you gave him, and all you were able to do. You have nothing to be sorry for, nothing to regret. You loved one another so very well. Helen stared at her. Did we? she answered. Perhaps we did. And it is so much better for him to go like this, to be saved from all the weariness and pain. Is it... I don't know. I can't see any farther, said Mrs. Reed. Then she exclaimed in a tone of horror, It has all gone black. Once I believed in such beautiful spiritual things, I seemed to see them. I thought I should rejoice when he died. I always taught people to do just that. But now, don't you understand? It's this that is real. This, this. She clutched the dead man's arm and the corpse nodded towards her and then fell back in the chair with a soft thud. And it's going to decay. I can't believe it, but it will. I shall sit here alone, and somewhere in the ground this will dissolve, and terrible things will happen under the earth, and it will go, and the bones that I have never seen will be left. I shall not recognize them, and they will be him, and the thing I know will have gone. The greedy earth will eat it. I can see that going on. As long as I live, I shall never see anything else. She spoke with passion, and Constance found no words in which to reply. The sight of Helen's neat universe abruptly ruined, appalled her. It seemed fatuous to offer hints of reconstruction in the face of so utter a wreck. She wondered whether life were full of such events of mistaken creeds crushed by the first contact with actuality, of ordinary people who did not seem to matter, rising at the touch of death to a sudden dominion 
and ruling the living from under the poppy crown. She looked at the quiet body, which resisted with patience the onslaught of rebellious grief. Its invincible serenity in that feverish room was an earnest of its remoteness. Her vision was clarified so that she passed by its animal aspect and saw it in its truer relation, as a poor and battered house, ennobled by the memory that it once held one who afterwards became a king. She passed in imagination from this heated and cupboard-like place, where opposition to the idea had quickened to agony. She saw this dead body under the simple and eternal categories against the amphitheater of the sky, where no artifice cloaks the august and rhythmic processes of nascent, crescent, and cadent life. Then she perceived how very beautiful, how very intimate it was, as if earth, in claiming her handiwork, had blessed it. She was lifted again into the peaceful dimension where the spirits of death and of life subsist side by side in perfect unison. She and the watcher together rested, as it were, in this loosened place, aloof from the tormenting illusions of mortality. They accepted the vicissitudes of the body, detecting therein certain majestic harmonies which drowned the sharp cry of those from whom this music was wrung. They were at one in this wide and calm vision of things. But there were odd and irreconcilable differences in the reaction to which it urged them. The watcher, it seemed, endured the situation unwillingly. He was stirred and grieved by the incurable torment that he witnessed, and, alarmed by his own sadness, wished to be away. But Constance, though she felt herself to be raised with him beyond the mortal dread of death, felt also a deep dissatisfaction a miserable shame at being so lifted and fenced from her sisters, who were yet immersed in the agonizing sea of separation. She felt a sudden divine desire to be down amongst them, to renounce in their favor her strange inheritance, to share their mistakes. Her goddess lifted that obstinate veil of hers and looked her between the eyes. It was a glance of peculiar penetration and carried with it a peremptory command. She was infected by a sense of homeliness, by a longing to stay, to stoop, to help. She was in the ranks, and there was an obligation upon her to raise the fallen as well as to prosecute her own advance. Orders were on her, and that mysterious inhabitant of hers started to attention at its call. She must cast down the barriers that she had loved, and merge her experience with this life and this death. Oh. Do learn to love, said Martin. She wanted to now. She was willing, even in this unattractive school, where a shabby, sallow woman muttered crazily over the death of a tedious old man. Suddenly she lost herself and found instead the mighty battle. She was on her knees beside her fellow soldier. Her arm was about the shoulders that carried themselves usually with so important an air and she was whispering scattered, senseless fragments of that immemorial language which all men speak in the presence of death. Helen turned and clutched her spasmodically. Oh, it's black, it's black, she said, and I'm angry, so angry with death. I've been a textbook for other people all my life, and now I'm done for, and life has torn me up. Constance answered, dear. You were dazed and bewildered at the moment. Do not try to think. It has been a terrible shock. But presently you will see clearly again. I see now. I had never seen death before. This is final. This is the end. That is an illusion which will pass away. Oh, I know, said Helen wearily. I used to say those sorts of things. As they sat cuddled together on the floor, Ra climbed suddenly upon their knees and thrust a cold and importunate nose into his mistress's face. He was a true cat. The neighborhood of the dead induced in him a passionate appreciation of the society of the living. Constance said, Have you fed Ra? Helen replied indifferently. 
What does that matter? He will die, too. Shall I give him dinner? Mrs. Reed took no notice. She was again stroking the dead man's hand. Constance took the cat into the little kitchen, found his plate of cold fish, filled his milk bowl, and went back again to Mrs. Reed. The watcher whispered, How it hurts! Poor, poor little men and women! How horribly you suffer in your blindness! Always the same thing, the everlasting want of one another. So this is the terrible cry that comes from the spinning earth, the wailing of the souls who are left behind. Oh, what can I do for her? Tell her to let go. She is clutching as well as loving. She is fighting with the will. After all, she will die too. She has forgotten that. That is one of the things which no one can remember when they want to. It is all blurred for her now. How strange! Does death cover the eyes of the living when he steals the souls of the slain? Well, look at her. She thought she had the light. But it is still there, he said, and the idea within it. Death cannot kill the real. It changes nothing. All is well. Can't you tell her? He answered, no. This pain comes of humanity, and its healing must come by way of its humanity, too. You are immersed in it. You are bound to it. You know it. You must see to your own affairs. I know, I see, that this must be the great matter. It is a cruel illusion, yet many great things are born of it. It is your touchstone of truth, but here you must help one another. It is not for the deathless to interfere. She, humbled by a knowledge of her own ineffectuality, of the uselessness in this primary situation, of all her theories of life, could only hold the hands of the half-stupefied woman, keeping her, as it were, by mere physical contact in touch with the human side of things. They sat in the dusk, listening to the hiss of the gas stove, clinging to one another, weighed down by a sense of finality, but without any conscious thoughts. There was nothing to say, nothing to do. Constance felt all about her a world of miserable women, sitting helplessly beside the dead bodies of those in whom they had rooted their lives. Her little heaven seemed stagnant beside the vivid torment of these sisters in purgatory. She longed to join hands with them and share their pain. Sacrifices were going forward, and she stood before the altar of life without an offering. She saw now, faced by this most ordinary of events, that her quest of life should have been not a curious seeking out of adventure, but rather a deliberate nurture, a devout acceptance of the parents of all being, love and pain. She saw them as they stretched through the height and breadth of creation, the sheltering arm and the cleaving sword. Together they made that cross whose divine folly she had resisted with such a petulant contempt. Helen, with her silly creeds and her black despair, had them, she justified herself by their presence, she and a thousand other writhing and tormented souls who little understood the divine quality of their anguish, the destination of that mourning procession into which they had been pressed. They walked a rough road which wounded their feet. They cried under the pain, not recognizing in these ugly scars the birthmark of the royal line. As for Constance, she knew that the measure of her serenity was the measure of her failure in the way, and, sitting between the living and the dead, she wept tears of a genuine contrition because she could not weep more. The clang of a bell aroused her. The neighboring church was ringing to evensong. Then she perceived the gathering duskness, woke to practical affairs, and said to Helen, "'You will want some help, won't you, and arrangements made?' I must go, I think, before it is too late, and send someone to you. Do you mind being left alone for a little while? Helen answered, No, no, I shall be quite busy. There are things, plenty of things, that I must do. She looked at her husband. My old dear shan't be neglected, she said brightly. I'm beginning to remember a little. He must not feel lonely, you know. 
She heard Constance go and the door click behind her. Then she rose and rambled heavily into the kitchen. Ra was asleep in his basket. She looked at him for a moment with pleasure, for he was a living thing, warm, soft, and exquisitely groomed, the only remaining creature that she loved, the only helpless thing dependent on her care. As if even in his sleep he divined her presence, he cocked one ear and raised his nose a little way that she might rub it. She was very glad of his existence. He had always been adorable at this moment. He was important, too. But for him she would be alone with the dead. Then she remembered that this good fortune of hers put the dead man at a disadvantage. It was he who was solitary now in the midst of the living. That was unendurable. That she should yet be surrounded by visible and homely things whilst he, who had always needed them so much, went out from amongst these domestic consolations, she owed him, at the very least, a parting gift. She stooped and seized on the cat with firm and merciless hands. My dear old dear, shan't be lonely, she muttered. It is so terrible to be alone, to be altogether alone. Ra only cried once, a long, thin cry, and then lay quite still. End of chapter 14《ラブの歌を歌うことはできない》です。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの歌を歌うことはできない。ラブの
I got into the sitting room, and the first thing I saw was the dead body of the cat. It seemed it had died the same evening, quite suddenly. Extraordinary thing that it and the old man should go off together like that. I wonder if she is quite sure of her milkman. I don't know which of them the poor thing is more upset about. She couldn't look at it, and she wouldn't talk. I told her that she could have a grave for it in my garden if she liked. These horrible modern flats have no provision for that sort of thing, and you can't expect a woman to put her last link with life into a sanitary dustbin. Constance felt sick when she heard this story. She had little doubt as to either the manner of Ra's death or his place of burial. Evidently, it had not entered Helen's mind that one could refuse even the least appropriate of sacrifices to the beloved dead. She had put her creed into practice, a circumstance which always fills the creedless with amazement and unwilling awe. Miss Tyrell faced the thing in dull bewilderment. She writhed also under the weight of a profound mortification, for this, which seemed to her so morbid, so insane, so unreal an act, was accepted by the watcher with a sympathy which he seldom extended to the normal proceedings of a civilized society. He saw here a plain and natural manifestation of that friendship for the dead upon which he had insisted so unpleasantly when she sat with him in the graveyard amongst the fells. And the absurdity of sacrificing a pet animal instead of an expensive wreath of flowers, did not strike his limited imagination. She had held herself his teacher, but here, as in the adventure of the cup, she was baffled, where he divined a guiding thread. She groped for it, and, stretching wild hands in the dark, came on strange forms, amazing living things, which defied her mania for classification. There was worse behind it. She might endure the superiority of the watcher, for he was a supernatural being with whom she could hardly compete. But in this dim, strange tract of a country on which she had stumbled, in which the most ordinary objects and events seemed charged with menace for those who dared to walk alone, she had been forced to learn from persons whom she had scarcely thought it worth while to teach. Helen and Andrew, the one earthly, the other absurd, and taken her hands and brought them into sudden contact with certain unnoticed realities, aspects of that experience, that life, which she had so loudly demanded and so utterly missed. Even now her touch upon these things was vague and clumsy, she was encased in the plate armor of her own personality, fretted within by her rebellious will, but curbed and held safe by her well-educated egotism. These other people, these foolish givers and lovers, were unfettered. They rushed out to the encounter of dreary responsibilities, childish sacrifices, and hideous griefs. They had much to endure, and little to show, but they lived— were at one with life. It was the only grace she had asked of her goddess, and now she knew that it had been refused. When the day's work was over and Vera had been put to bed, the imperative inner voice, which paid little attention to her tastes, urged her to return to Helen, to serve her if she might. Constance went unwillingly, for an attempt to gain admittance on Sunday had failed, and this rebuff had wounded her young, self-conscious sympathy, even induced a certain bitterness. She had felt that her difficult attempts at consolation had their importance. It was amazing that Mrs. Reed should not desire them. Now she forgot this righteous anger, and something that was almost diffidence took its place. She was going to school in a new spirit of humility, she even bought a large bunch of white chrysanthemums on her way to the flat that there might be some visible excuse for her visit. She was surprised when the door was opened quickly, more when Mrs. Reed said to her, I am glad to see that you have come again. 
She glanced hastily about her as she answered, not knowing what she might see, but the little sitting-room looked much as usual. There was no evidence of death. Mr. Reed's spectacle-case and Ra's brush and comb had not yet been put away. Helen said, When you knocked at the door, I was afraid that perhaps it might be Mrs. Vince. Has she not been? No, but she will come. She is sure to come, isn't she? said Helen, wistfully. And then it will be difficult. I must be so very careful what I say. Why? Well, she believes in me. She thinks I am spiritual, you know. I must never let her see it's all gone black. Then she would lose it, too, just as I have. She would never believe in mysteries again. I must prevent that from happening if I can. I have been thinking and thinking. I know that I have got to pretend. It will be something to do, and I must, because I am responsible, you see. Death, the magnum opus of the divine. Oh, one should never see it if one wants to think of it like that. It's all emptiness. The symbols just melted away, and there was nothing, nothing behind. The watcher murmured. I suppose this must always happen when death touches the teachers of your creeds, and yet they go on. Helen continued, almost as if she would reply to him. But I taught it, and now I have got to stand up to it. It sounded so splendid. I felt so sure that it was true. One seemed to see it, and now I see emptiness. But they mustn't. They are young and hopeful. It helps them, and perhaps for them it may go on being true. Perhaps. You never believed in it, said Helen. You always seemed to have a secret of your own. That is why I wanted you now so much. You are solid, just yourself, just alive and warm. And I can say what I like, foolish, dreadful, hopeless things. But with the others, what am I to do? They fed on me. They had no experience. They were convinced by the rhythms of the words. To tell them the truth would be cruel, and I don't think being cruel can be right. It would not be right to teach them your new lie. Is it a lie? Why can she not see it? exclaimed the watcher. Are blindness and suffering also of the essence of the idea? Is it a lie? asked Helen again. Oh, I hope it is. Only there's nothing else. She approached Constance, held her arm, looked into her eyes. You know something, don't you? You are different, she said. Oh, tell me if you know it. If only he is all right, if he lives and is not lonely. I don't think that I mind being hurt, having nothing to do. Constance answered, I know so very little. I too am blinded, but somehow I am sure that we are all together in one friendship, the living and the dead. You have only got to wait a little while. Presently the light will come back, and you will know it too. No, it will never come back for me any more. But that does not really matter if my old dear is all right, and if I am able to pretend... The bell rang sharply, and Mrs. Reed went almost with alacrity towards the door. Her mood had changed, and she looked expectant. I knew, she said, that Mrs. Vince would come. Constance heard a heavy footstep and the sound of an umbrella placed with decision in the stand. Then Mrs. Reed came back, and Andrew followed her into the room. I came, he said, for Muriel bad headache, awfully sorry, not fit to go out, wanted to know if there was anything we could do. He sat down awkwardly and eyed Constance. Rather expected, he remarked, to find you here. Helen looked crestfallen. In the midst of her misery, one corner of her mind had remained aware of her importance, both as a teacher and as a widow. She had supposed that she would be an object of interest as well as of sympathy to her followers. Having yet to learn that popularity seldom survives in the presence of grief, 
Moreover, Muriel's avoidance of her in the hour of desolation wounded her heart as well as her pride. She was fond of her, and had thought of Mrs. Vince's delicate personality as one may think in moments of weariness, of soft cushions, and unattainable sense. The mere fact of her prettiness would have made her visit comforting, would have restored to Helen's darkened universe something of the light of life. But Muriel had a headache, and the other woman understood. She rejected Andrew's advances very gently, wanted nothing, would tell him nothing. The arrangements, she said, were made. No, not cremation. The other was not so bad. She looked appealingly at Constance, who interpreted the message as a request to remove Mr. Vince as quickly as she might. He rose, as she had expected, when she did, shook hands warmly with Helen, and muttered hastily, "'Awfully grieved, don't you know? Dear old Reed, man I always respected. One of the best.' He opened the door, and Constance would have preceded him, but Helen clutched her hand, held her for a moment, and Vince went out into the little hall. "'Come back,' she said. "'You will come back, won't you? Promise that you will come back. You see, the others are no good.' Constance replied humbly, I'm no good either, but I want to help you if I can. She was reminded, curiously, of Vince's first overtures of friendship. She seemed destined to take Muriel's leavings, to console them for their idol's indifference. It was hardly the part she would have chosen, but life thrust it into her hand, and she knew that she must not reject it. I rather fancy, said the watcher, reflectively, as they went down that long flight of stairs, that you make it worse for yourselves by being so obstinate about it, do you not? I see the will plating you together, forcing you to interpenetrate each other's lives, to pass through, to let go, to move amongst experience, perpetually to lose life and to find. And you will not. You make yourselves rigid, you resist. You clutch at one another, crying, Mine, mine, and then you must be torn apart. But don't you see, she answered, that they care for one another? If I only could learn to care like that. That is foolish. Do you wish to suffer? Stupid little creatures, swept so quickly through the dream, and feeling your chance encounters to be important and making such a fuss. Does no one amongst you love that which dies not, that which is before instead of that which is behind? Vince replied for her, saying, Shocking thing, that poor woman left all alone, nothing to look forward to, only her death. He looked at her with concern. It has evidently upset you a bit, he said, not like you to have these morbid ideas. Shouldn't think about death. Might as well think about the dentist. Trying things, these visits. Muriel funked it, poor girl, when it came to the point, said it left such a mark on the subconscious mind, so she sent me along in her place. I fancy she was afraid Mrs. Reed might show her the old chap's body. These people have such queer ideas. One thing, her views and so on, will be a comfort to her now, not like a woman without any religion. She's very wretched. Bound to be, replied Andrew. Bound to be, poor thing. After all, he was her husband. Do you think that makes any difference? Why, of course, said Vince, astonished. A man, don't you know, who marries a woman, sticks to her and so on. She's bound to repay that with affection. Husbands and children. One takes care of you, and you take care of the other. And so decent women, even if they're clever, always love them at the bottom, and it is just at times like this that they find that out. Constance brooded a little and then said, It is because she took care of him that Mrs. Reed is so desolate now. Being his wife does not come in, really. Always counts. Must do. After all, she had the protection of his name. Do you think one would mourn for that? It counts. Counts more than you think, said Andrew, again. Of course, poor creature, 
It's all the worse for her because she has no family. Pity she didn't adopt the child as you did. Most sensible thing I ever heard. Admire you for it. Muriel is most interested, anxious to talk to you about education, character building, and so on. I know nothing about that. Just as well, just as well. Bad for boys, all this modern drivel, and worse for girls, in all the probability. Give her plenty of dolls and teach her plain sewing, and she'll never miss the myths and nature study and all that other rot. I should like for her to turn out satisfactorily. Of course you would. Main object of your existence. Bound to be. Something to leave behind you. Just my feeling about the boy. Must keep an eye on him. See that he gets a proper chance in spite of the women. Easy enough for you. Got it all your own way. She is rather a difficult child. I like them to have spirit. Shows they're healthy. Namby-pamby children are no good. Well, she isn't that. I'm awfully keen to see that youngster, said Andrew. I believe she's a ripping kid. When can I come? It was only nine o'clock. Vera looked her best when she was asleep. Constance, swiftly reviewing many dangers, chose the least. Come now, she said. We are nearly there, and you can have a peep at her in bed. So they climbed the shabby stairs, came to her sitting room, and Andrew helped her to light the duplex lamp. Its smell did not seem to annoy him, but he looked with pity and surprise at the poor and dingy room, at the worn carpet, at the paralyzed Venetian blinds. He wished all women to be comfortable, and was shocked by this glaring testimony to the poverty of his friend. It came suddenly to Miss Tyrell's mind that Vince was the first guest to be admitted to her lodging since the April night on which she had brought the watcher home. He sat by the fireplace in the chair whence that wild-eyed thing had first gazed with fear and amazement on the life in which it was entrapped. He too came as an inquisitor, demanding admittance. But for him there were no paradoxes, no difficulties, above all, no mysteries. Only the plain, straightforward, natural things. How comfortable a destiny, she thought, to see life single-eyed and see it wrong. She crept to the bedroom, assured herself that Vera slept, and called Vince softly to her side. They stood together, looking in silence at the head sunk deep in its soft pillow, at the scattered locks of black hair, so like Miss Tyrell's own, and at the little cruel face that they framed, which seemed to have come from some alien strata of life. When Andrew turned to his friend, there were tears in his eyes. He took her hand and squeezed it. Thank you, he said, for allowing me to come. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of The Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter Sixteen Two Lovers. Mortis vel vite, brevis est vox, ite venite, aspera vox ite, vox ex jocunda venite. Fourteenth Century Epigram. It was mid-December, cold and snowy, and the Christmas season was in full swing. Lamptons overflowed with children's books, color books, day books, anthologies, works of vague piety and pretty covers, and reprints of the many classics which all give and none which to receive. There was Law's Serious Call in pink brocade with pigskin labels, a new and dainty style as Congreve's plays, looking so respectable in pale grey buckram that old-fashioned mothers often bought the volume for their elder girls. The shelf of illustrated fairy tales for grown-up people was emptied daily, and that containing more solid books for the children's use was nearly as popular. Miss Tyrell and her assistants lived at high pressure, struggling to anticipate the unformulated wants of peevish customers, 
leading on the more generously disposed from shelf to shelf, probing and, where possible, changing the minds of the many ladies who knew the book they wanted but could remember neither its author nor its name. The more bookish side of the business was now in abeyance, its frankly popular aspect triumphed, and the rows of old county histories, the early printed classics, the fathers, and the excellent collection of rare and curious memoirs of the old French court were hidden by piles of cheap Ruskins, the new sixpenny Ibsen, for which a great sale was expected, by airship to Dante's Inferno, the latest romance of the religio-scientific school, and the baby Shakespeare, illustrated in autolithography by members of the International Society. There was an incessant crackling of brown paper as the parcels were folded, tied, and heaped upon the floor to await the delivery van. Exercise, mental and physical, hardly ceased, save for the slack interval at lunchtime from ten in the morning until an hour or so after the shutters were put up for the night. Helen Reed, who had been engaged at Constance's suggestion as an extra assistant during the busy weeks, found that she had little time in which to brood upon the destinies of the individual soul. She was continually at the orders of persons who seemed unaware of her intellectual importance and utterly ignored her point of view. Their acceptance of her as an ordinary shop assistant was insulting. The impervious ear which they turned to her advice disappointed her, but the resultant irritation restored her interest in life, and Constance felt that this first step in philanthropy was not to be wholly unsuccessful. It had its disadvantages. She was compelled to act as a buffer between Helen and Mr. John, who detected in Mrs. Reed an unbusinesslike inclination to direct the public attention to those thoughtful works which are always published at net prices and therefore represent a small profit hardly earned. Your friend, he said, has a very superior, indeed a clever, appearance, which is, of course, a great point in a business of this kind. It is a pity that she is so irresponsible. She seems unable to grasp the importance of pressing the Christmas stock on the public as much as one can. She is inexperienced at present. It isn't inexperience, it is idiosyncrasy, replied Lambton. I watched her with an old lady yesterday. I should have made her buy The Gracious Gardens of Our Land, a book that ought to be going very well. Instead of that, Mrs. Reed actually allowed her to order Danby's Development of the Spirit of Man, single copy, small publisher, net book, hardly pay us for the trouble of supplying it. I'm sure, said Constance, meekly, that she tries to get people the books they really want. One doesn't run a house of this kind on the people who know what they want. One runs it on the people who are persuaded to want what they see. Still, she takes an intelligent interest in literature, and that does encourage the customer. Not the right sort of customer, said Mr. John, crossly. Only the cultured misers who buy cheap copies of good stuff. I hate intelligent assistants. They always try to sell what they like. He walked away, and the watcher asked her, Is there any reason why you should try to sell anything else? She was reminded of Martin's rule, The things one does not love are better left alone. But even he, she supposed, had hardly intended this austere maxim to apply to commercial affairs. In these hasty, busy days, with their constant scrimmage between customer, cash-box, and order-book, it was easy to forget Martin and the impracticable things for which he stood. Even for her lodger and his whims she had little attention to spare. The active interests of the moment overpowered his influence. His demands upon her senses were easily repelled. His anxious questions seldom touched her mind. Few women can realize the riddle of the universe when confronted by the more pressing problem of how to serve four impatient customers at one and the same time, without rousing their tempers or making mistakes in their bills. Miss Tyrell's consciousness was monopolized by the practical, and had no time for the real. It danced upon the surface, seized by a myriad things, but seldom resting long on any one. 
Sometimes as she crept wearily to her lodging, she wondered, why did she do it? But the answer to this question awaited her within. The imprisoned watcher, who had begun to suspect in life some constant factor which spirit might attain to understand, was bewildered anew by the baby turmoil, the outrageous insincerities of trade. Peeping through her eyes, when she could spare them from the duties of poring over the ledger or hunting through the disordered shelves, he saw this shop, this scrap of seething world, at its uttermost point of self-realization. It was become a little throbbing center of those absorbing and scattering forces, that systole and diastole, movement, credit, and debt, which is the expression of life in the body, the business and the love of man, perhaps too in that of God. The shop collected and distributed, it gave, it took, it was fed, it brought forth. It reminded him that all the puzzling knots of infinity had been theatres where this one play was ceaselessly performed. Day after day, carts came to the door and deposited great packages of Christmas stock, repeat orders of the best-selling lines. Then cords were cut, the outer cover, the inner padding of old newspapers removed, and out came the potted thoughts, the little diagrams by which men try to register ideas. There, for a few hours, they lay upon the tables, meek victims of the lust of men, waiting till one out of the thronging purchasers should snatch their bodies or dare to pry into their souls. It was an omnivorous public, and parcels that began with the Red Rose of Eros often included Ghosts, the Bab Ballads, and Alice in Wonderland, and ended with a copy of Holy Living, or The Little Flowers of St. Francis, which was very popular in limp brown suede tied with a triple knotted string. Thus the books went out into new lives to form new concepts, new combinations, or at least new ornaments of the more cultured kind, and others poured in, a constant stream, to take their place. The watcher longed for some equilibrium to be struck, for some moment when the ceaseless flux of things should hesitate, if only for an instant, that he might recapture the lost knowledge of that reality which is at rest. But it never ceased. It was life. Suddenly he realized the need, the joy of death, and desired it greatly for these tired people whom he had accepted as his friends. They had, as he noticed, odd consolations, quaint hints of reality thrust in upon them as they hastened to and fro. In the least expected points the veil was lifted, and suddenly the light broke through, a strong and shining beam in which the dust danced gaily. The watcher was greatly interested in the case of Phoebe Foster, who came often to the bookshop since Helen had been added to the staff. Mrs. Reed's friends vaguely supposed that in enriching her employer they were somehow helping her, a course which offered all the advantages of a bazaar and none of the disagreeables of unremunerative charity. Phoebe, then, frequented Lambton's at this season, most often in that slack interval about 2 p.m., when the luncheon table competes successfully with the shop. She seemed of late to be the seat of subtle changes. There was a shifting of values, as if certain forces long suppressed and half forgotten were rising slowly but irresistibly to a domination of her personality. In this conflict, her self-assurance, her intelligent freedom of speech were worsted, her acquaintances saw with astonishment a new and inarticulate Phoebe emerge, a gentle, shamefaced, and primitive thing who was no longer able to speak of the unspeakable with the scientific indifference which is proper to her type. Muriel, who was distressed by her friend's condition, attributed it to some obscure psychic disease, to the sudden uprush into conscious life of unfortunate ancestral traits latent in the subliminal field. It is, she said, a case of pernicious atavism, all the more acute because her education has held it in check so long. Expert opinion is not always correct. About a week before Christmas, 
Phoebe came to the bookshop, there was upon her face a bashful radiance which seemed to mark a new stage in her infirmity. It was like the humble yet fiery joy which might invest the newly inspired apostle of some singularly ecstatic faith. She kissed Constance and Helen with fervor, in spite of the disapproving presence of Mr. John. "'How splendid it is,' she said, "'to be a woman!' Helen replied with a touch of her old solemnity. "'I cannot attribute great importance to the accident of sex.' "'Oh, can't you?' exclaimed Phoebe. "'I can. An enormous importance. It is more than important, really. It is deeply and wonderfully significant. Mysterious, almost.' Constance said, "'Yes, that's true. Horribly mysterious. Full of splendor.' and full of evil, too. Phoebe looked at her with soft eyes that were full of a slightly patronizing sympathy, and spoke in the quiet, authoritative tone of a person who is quite sure of her ground. No, she said, not evil. That's a mistake. In itself it is wholly beautiful, because it's a vital, unchangeable thing, much too noble and beautiful to be evil as well. I hope, said Mrs. Reed, that you are not going to be led away by merely sentimental views of life. Some sentiments count, replied Phoebe obstinately. They arise in the soul and show one the meaning of things, and there is a strange enhancement of life that comes from them, from realizing one's essential womanhood. She looked at the other woman appealingly. You don't know, she said, or you would have to agree with me. I wish I could describe it to you. It is extraordinarily interesting. I mean, of course, from the psychological point of view. Helen observed, These transitory ecstasies are seldom important to the soul. Oh, not transitory, answered Phoebe. I knew you did not understand. This is true. One can always tell the difference. At least I can. Nothing else matters. It changes the values of life, makes everything perfectly plain. She thought that she saw signs of amusement on Constance's face, blushed, and added hastily, as one penetrates below appearance. It is in the simple and elementary things that one finds the deepest metaphysical meaning, I think. And then, Miss Tyrell did not hear the end of the sentence, the shop door had been pushed open, the bell rang, and she turned automatically to attend to the incoming customer. He stood for a moment with the pale light behind him, staring into the shop. She stared back at him, vaguely conscious of the arrival of some familiar, unexpected thing, whilst he continued his keen peering into the dimness, as if his coming had some finer objective than the mere spending of money and garnering up of books. The watcher, too, moved eagerly in her mind, as to the encounter of a friend, and, before she had time to sift these sensations, Martin had discovered her and taken her hand. She said, "'You? Here, in a city? It's incredible,' he answered. "'I, in a city? Well, why not? There's a hiding place for everything here. But why have you come?' he said in a lower tone, because I dared not wait longer. She looked at him then. Her first thought was that he was curiously alive with a white and ardent life which made the spirits of her companions seem but smoldering flames, or next, that he was very near to death. He met her eyes. I see, he observed, that you have guessed it. I am going. Is it not splendid so quickly? It came on me suddenly, and I knew that there was no mistake. She saw the unpeopled hills, the deserted shrine, the extinguished light, the cup, unguarded and alone, and exclaimed, No, you, you cannot go, you must not. Needs must, when marching orders come. But you, with a guardianship that cannot be forsaken, that you should be snatched. I, too. How cruel it is! We are all slaves to this. 
Slaves, he said, slaves to death? What a strange idea. Why, it is our one earnest of liberty. Without that, how could we be more than self-conscious mildew, cumbering the wholesome surfaces of things? And it is actively beneficent, too, the way, the truth, the life, the real life, not the dream. It was through death that the cup came. It is the true discipline of the secret. But not for all. For all, he answered. Each of us lives toward that initiation. Every instant of our day it is going on. We cannot be deprived of it. We cannot miss it. However stupid and cowardly, however evil we may be. And you are glad to go? You with your wonderful life? Why, yes. There was a wise physician once who said, The misery of immortality in the flesh he undertook not that was immortal. So how could we want it? How awful a fate to wait the home-going ship even in the fortunate isles and never sight it. The wandering Jew is really the only denizen of the only hell. But you, so soon, why is it? I always knew that it would not be long, and this winter the snows have been heavy. It has been an arctic business there these many weeks, an everlasting fight with the drifts and plenty of rescue work among the flocks and evil nights of the storm. I've come near to anticipating my burial many a time, and it has put on the clock rather quickly. That is all. Is it inevitable? Are you sure? He answered mockingly. Do you wish to hear the name that is given to this particular method of crumbling? Then she saw with dismay the purest spot in her world shine out, adorable, only to be snatched from her. The watcher exclaimed, What? Will you now clutch at the dying and risk the blackness and the pain? She turned from him and considered anew the radiant face of Martin, that thin and eager face, smiling into the very eyes of corruption. She looked with him and saw death, the faithful servant of true lovers, preparing the bridal chamber of the soul. Martin leaned forward with a gesture of gratitude and ecstasy to the fruition of his long desire. He was glancing about him now, full of the zest for little things which is peculiar to the utterly detached. He said, So, this is the place. I have often thought of it, and of you since the day on which you came. Helen and Phoebe were looking at him with a very human curiosity, for this was the first time that they had detected Miss Tyrell in the possession of a friend outside the limits of their own set. Phoebe said to Mrs. Reed, Do you think? I wonder. She has never mentioned him, but they seem to be great friends. It would be so nice. I am sure that her life is not a very happy one. Helen replied, No, but no life is really happy. Oh, it may be, it can be, exclaimed Phoebe quickly and clumsily. If you give yourself, give yourself altogether, I mean, and join in, then you find your place and are at peace. Mrs. Reed received these words in silence. They were delivered with an accent of authority, which she disliked. But Martin, who had heard them, turned and smiled. Phoebe smiled back. There seemed instantly some link established between them, as if they had common possession of a secret which the others sought in vain. Yes, he said, that is it. It seems such a simple recipe, doesn't it, when once one has tried it? It's wonderful. It transforms the world. Yes, it really does fulfill the whole claim of the philosopher's stone. It confers eternal youth, transmutes dull matter, turns the dust to gold. Mrs. Reed said with eagerness, You are evidently interested in alchemy. Martin, who was considering Phoebe's gentle and radiant face with approval, answered indifferently, sometimes its language is useful and approximates to the truth. Phoebe interrupted him. 
But truth isn't words. It's not definite and discoverable. It is just a new way of seeing the ordinary things. Martin said, yes. The way of love, that's all. Phoebe, the word once mentioned, seemed to experience a certain relief. She looked at Constance, as if there too she might expect a measure of comprehension. I came to tell you something, Phoebe said, only you wouldn't understand me. I'm going to be married. The watcher muttered, another link to be torn apart, another pain. How mad you are. Of course, continued Phoebe hastily, you understand I would not do it in the ordinary, conventional way. That would be disgusting. It is because we feel the inner, personal link so strongly, because I have become convinced that we complete each other's lives. If we fell out of love, we should separate. I told Freddy that a mere material prolongation of a tie whose reality is gone would become blasphemous, the sin against Eros. I suppose, observed Martin, that by falling out of love you really mean falling out of passion, don't you? How can one fall out of love any more than one can fall out of heaven? It may be very tiresome, very onerous generally is, I think, in the end. But it clings tight. You carry it with you, even to the deeps, and it flames up when it is wanted. Flama eterne caritatis. Yes, I think, I mean, I'm sure, it is like that, really, replied Phoebe, addressing him directly and in a very low voice. The shop bell rang again, and she became alert. I expect that must be Freddy, she said. He promised to call for me at half-past two. Mr. Burroughs entered. He bore himself with a new possessive air, at once absurd, charming, and pathetic. The ladies congratulated him, and he answered with conviction that he was a lucky fellow. I've got a taxi at the door, he said, and I thought, Phoebe, that we might run down to the palace and hear the new singing girl She's got a matinee today, and then tea at the Carlton and stroll home in the dusk. That is, of course, if you are quite sure you'd like it. Helen, who knew Miss Foster's tastes, waited with interest for her reply. But Phoebe agreed with enthusiasm. She was radiant, plainly eager to be gone. Freddy waited upon her with great care and gentleness, hooked her fur coat, adjusted her muff chain comfortably beneath the collar. She accepted his ministrations with obvious pride. Martin nodded at their departing figures and observed, That's all right, the simple but most excellent way. Later on it will hurt, and then her chance will come. She will emerge, a completed animal or a transfigured saint. Constance said in a low tone, Oh, why did I miss it? That's the way in, to give up one's will, to be touched like that, with respect by someone who cares. He answered, It is very agreeable, but for some there is a better and a harder way. End of chapter 16